Malik Shari enjoyed killing Americans. Killing smug Britishers and those arrogant French brought some degree of satisfaction. Killing Israelis, the bitter enemies of his people, was always a treat. But when he killed an American, it was as if he inflicted a wound on Satan himself. After all, wasn't America the great devil? The nation through which the evil one was trying to gain mastery of the world? Unfortunately, Sharik hadn't been able to indulge his passion as often as he liked. His tally stood at four British, three French, 21 Israelis, and only two Americans. But all that was about to change. He was about to help kill several more, and he couldn't be happier. Twilight was falling on Islamabad, Pakistan. From the roof of an apartment building that overlooked the opulent home of the finance minister, a river of humanity flowed before Sharik, as far as the eye could see. He checked his wristwatch. It was a little past six. The banquet was slated to begin at seven, so he could expect the guests to start arriving soon. Reaching down, he tweaked the volume control on the audionic walkie-talkie clip to his belt. The latest model, it had a squelch feature that completely eliminated background noise and a transceiver that automatically switched between the send and receive modes. The Al Jabbar's deep pockets had its benefits. Report. Pack one ready. Malik knew Hakim was in position at the rear of the walled grounds. No guards visible. Tank two ready. Two guards visible on the patio. Another at a second floor window. Looking due south, Sharik could see Tabit the young Egyptian prone on the balcony, a blanket pulled over him and the Vector R4 assault rifle he was armed with. He could also see Bahira off to his right. She was dressed in traditional attire, in a burqa complete with a veil and headpiece, and had set up a fig display across from the front gate. Tack three, ready. Four guards at the gate, two more along the drive. They aren't paying attention to me. To all intents and purposes, she was a typical street vendor. No one would suspect that in one barrel of figs was a Beretta AR-1790. Sharik had given her the post of honor, as it was called. It was her job to kill the American ambassador. Finally, Sharik was north of the minister's home. They had all four points of the compass covered. In the unlikely event Pahira failed, he and Tabit both had clear lines of fire and could finish what she started. Sharik would much rather have placed a bomb in one of the fig barrels or in the house itself, but he had his orders. It wouldn't be wise to defy the will of Aban Abbas, not if he wanted to stay alive. Strange, Sharik thought, how he could both admire and fear a man at the same time. He had the highest respect for the founder of the Al Jabbar. Abbas was a great man. His vision of a world ruled by Islam, a world without infidels, was dear to Sharik's heart. He hated the false religion of the Western nations as much as Abbas did. They were brothers of the spirit. Yet kindred spirits or no, Sharik was under no delusions. If he inadvertently angered Abbas, the consequences would be dire. He was always careful of what he said and did. Their leader didn't tolerate incompetence, laziness or failure, or anything that smacked of heresy or blasphemy. He remembered all too well the fate of the Syrian, Haji, whose fondness for nightclubs and women did not sit well with the great leader. Sharik had tried to warn Haji, discreetly, of course, that he had to be more diligent in his prayers and devotions. Haji couldn't be bothered. One night, the Syrian had the supreme stupidity to return to the compound well after midnight with a loose woman in tow. Aban Abbas was furious. He forcibly removed the woman, then called Haji into his office. Sharik had been there along with the other lieutenants. They had no idea what was going to occur, but Sharik did. He had been with Abbas the longest. Without warning, Abbas drew a dagger from his sleeve and slit Haji's throat from ear to ear. It had taken them half the next day to clean the blood. No, Sharik would sooner leap into a blazing furnace than anger Aban Abbas. If the master insisted on a personal touch, as he so often phrased it, rather than use bombs or chemical weapons, who was Sharik to argue? Raising his head above the coping, he saw the first limousine approach the gate. It bore the flag of the Spanish ambassador. This isn't the one, Bahira. Do you think I don't know that? Malik had never understood why Abbas permitted women in the organization. Their place was in the home, raising the children and tending to their husbands. But Abbas insisted that anyone willing to martyr themselves was welcome. Male or female, young or old, and any nationality under the sun. Bahira was Afghan. 
Her brother, a member of the Taliban, had been killed along with a dozen others when an American cruise missile struck their headquarters. Ever since, Bahira's sole purpose in life was to destroy as many Americans as she could. She had asked Abbas for the honor of eliminating the ambassador, and he had consented. Sharik wouldn't have. Not that she couldn't do the job. Bahira had proven herself willing and capable. Six months ago in Bombay, she sprayed a nightclub with auto fire, killing nine American servicemen. Prior to that, she had been involved in the assassinations of several prominent American businessmen in Saudi Arabia. Sharik had no problem with her commitment. It was her personality. Bahira grated on him like sandpaper on flesh. She was always carping, criticizing, arguing. Other members of the Al-Jabbar believed her bitterness was the result of her brother's death. Sharik thought it was her natural disposition. She had been born a shrew and would always be one. Another limousine arrived, bringing the British ambassador. Sharik shifted his legs to relieve a cramp. He had been sitting cross-legged for almost an hour, his Amelie machine gun hidden under a blanket beside him. It would stay covered until their target arrived. Otherwise, someone might spot it and call the authorities. The apartment building was eight stories high, tall by Islamabad standards. A few blocks to the north was another building, twenty stories high. To the northeast sat a mosque, and to the southeast reared a hill covered with the homes of the lower class. A third limo rounded an intersection several blocks away. From the antenna fluttered a small American flag. Here he comes. God be with us. Lifting the blanket so he could slide under it, he adjusted the Amelie's bipod. Of Spanish manufacture, it had the reputation of being one of the best light machine guns on the market. He'd used it several times during the past year, and it had never let him down. With a cyclic rate of 20 rounds a second, low recoil and accurate inbuilt sights, it was ideal for tactical situations. I have our quarry spotted. Rising from her stool, she bent over the barrel containing the auto rifle, pretending to rummage through the figs. Sharik thought of the headlines that would blare across the globe the following day. American ambassador slain by terrorists. And grinned. It was yet another blow against the great devil that defiled every Arab nation through its ceaseless manipulation of governments and events. Yet another clear message to the despots who would rule the earth. The holy warriors of Islam would oppose them at every turn. The American ambassador's limo was only two blocks off. Bahira plunged her hand into the barrel. Her back was to the gate and the guards didn't notice. Sharik centered the Ameli on the men at the gate. They were his responsibility. Bahira's was the ambassador and whoever was in the limo with him. Tabit was backup. As for Hakim, as soon as he heard shots, he was to get to their vehicle and race to the airport the instant they joined him. At the gate, the limo driver's window started to lower, no doubt so he could show the appropriate credentials. Sharik was tingling from head to toe, as he always did, so close to a kill. Another few seconds, and all their careful planning would pay off. The people on the street had no inkling of what was about to unfold. Men, women, and children were going about their mundane routines, oblivious to the angel of death hovering over them. Malik knew innocent bystanders might be slain in the crossfire, but their lives were of no consequence, balanced against the goals of the Al-Jabbar. Bahira pulled the Beretta AR-1790 from the fig barrel. The bipod and carrying handle had been removed and the stock shortened to make it compact and easier to use. Holding it close against her loose-fitting dress, she swiveled toward the limo and started briskly across the street. One of the guards had bent toward the limo's open window. It was the moment Bahira had been waiting for. Snapping the Beretta into firing position, she ran toward the vehicle. Or started to. She had barely taken two steps when the top of her head exploded in a shower of bone and gore. Bahira was swept off her feet by the impact of a heavy caliber slug. For Sharik, the next moments were a blur. Throwing off the blanket, he rolled to the left and scrambled toward the roof access door. Glancing back, he saw the blanket buck into the air as if plucked by invisible hands. He reached the door and rose to a crouch before the sniper could fire again. One thing was clear. Whoever killed Bahira and tried to shoot him was to the north, and higher up than he was. There was only one place the gunman could be, the twenty-story building due north. Sharik glanced to the south. Tabit had risen to his feet and aimed for the limousine. He stumbled against the wall as if he tripped. 
He looked around wildly, staggered back to the rail, and raised his assault rifle once more. A second slug rendered him stiff like a board. The vector fell from his limp fingers and clattered over the rail. Tabit's prone body toppled after it. Exercising extreme caution, he put his left eye to the edge of the door. He saw no sign of the sniper. Ducking back, he slid to the other side and tried again. For a fleeting moment, a figure was silhouetted on the roof of the twenty-story building. Sharik saw only that the sniper had dark hair and was wearing a long black coat. The man disappeared, and Sharik took his cue to do the same. Soon, the area would be swarming with police. Dashing to the blanket, Sharik wrapped the Ameli in it and turned to flee. A policeman was directing traffic past Bahira's body. As much as he disliked the shrew, Sharik never wanted anything like this to happen. Bahira and Tabit both. He shuddered to think how their leader would react. Aban Abbas didn't take bad news well. The last time it happened, when the Jordanians had the audacity to arrest an Al-Jabbar member implicated in the bombing of an American attaché, Abbas had the four men responsible liquidated. Sharik barreled down six of the eight flights, then abruptly slowed. An older man and woman were descending the stairs ahead of him, and he didn't care to arouse suspicion by barging past them. Chafing at the delay, he followed them to the lobby, then hurried past and out the front door. Moving left into an alley, Sharik broke into a run. There was still a chance. A sniper wouldn't want to draw attention to himself either, and it was possible the man hadn't reached the streets yet. The terrorist was still half a block away when he saw the tall man in the trench coat step from a side entrance, walk to a brown sedan, and climb in. In the sniper's right hand was a long green duffel bag. Again, Sharif caught only a glimpse, but this time it was enough to establish that the sniper was a big man with hard features, and from the looks of him, a foreigner. Sharif slid his cellular phone from his jacket and pressed send. There was no use in delaying, Abbas had to be told. Whoever the sniper was, he'd better be on his guard. The Al-Jabbar avenged its own. They wouldn't rest until they tracked the man down and repaid blood for blood. Graphic Audio presents Don Pendleton's Mac Bolan. Narrated by Grover Gardner, with performances by Terence Asel Ford, David Coyne, Richard Rowan, Nanette Savard, Casey Jones, Christopher Graybill, Ken Jackson, Karen Carbone, Kate Torrey, Thomas Penny, Christopher Walker, and Mort Shelby. Mac Bolan number ninety, Age of War. The executioner wasn't in the best of moods. Mac Boland didn't mind if the feds wanted to whisk him off to Greece on short notice. They'd had reliable intel on a hit on the American ambassador to Pakistan by the terrorist organization known as the Al-Jabbar, which Boland had been out to shut down for some time now. He was glad to have another crack at them. This time, he thwarted an attempt to kill the vice president during a trip to Greece. The attempt went down, and Bolin had killed two of the cell members and scattered the others. The VP was unscathed. But Bolin did mind when an operation was botched. Hal Brognola, director of the Covert Sensitive Operations Group, told him the Greek military would see to it that none of the terrorists escaped. Roadblocks were supposed to be thrown up and the villa cordoned off the moment Bolin told them to, which he did the instant he spotted the foursome coming over the hill south of the city. But the Greek liaison, the one who was to relay the word to nearby military units, claimed he never received the message. Bolin wasn't prone to show his anger, but he came awfully close when he heard the news. He'd been assured complete cooperation. The liaison, a colonel in the Greek army, had seemed sincere and competent. Colonel Haralambos met him at the Athens airport and drove him to the villa where they made plans to lay their trap. The president had already been in contact with the ambassador and instructed him and his entourage to vacate the premises until further notice. It was Colonel Haralambos who supplied Bolin with a handheld military radio to contact him at the appropriate moment. So what could have gone wrong? That was what Bolin wondered until he checked the officer's radio and discovered the batteries had gone dead. The colonel apologized profusely, but the harm had been done. Two of the terrorists had made their escape 
much to Boland's disappointment. Now the soldier was on his way back to his hotel, his fingers wrapped around the steering wheel and his mind trying to wrap itself around the problem of the Al Jabbar. The organization had been in existence only a decade and had a remarkable string of hits to its credit. As far as the feds could prove, the total stood at 41, with possibly a dozen unconfirmed. No one could say for sure because the Al Jabbar never took credit for their kills. They were a cautious group, their leader's identity unknown, their roster a complete mystery. Boland considered them the most dangerous terrorist group in existence. They weren't high profile, they didn't go in for publicity, and they had the distinction of never targeting civilians. But that only showed they were all professionals who went about their trade quietly and efficiently. U.S. officials downplayed the threat the Al Jabbar posed. In their eyes, since the group never attacked buildings or engaged in bioterror, they weren't to be taken quite as seriously. As an undersecretary at the Defense Department was quoted in a magazine as saying, These are second-rate gunmen. They go around shooting people. We shouldn't be losing sleep over them. In Boland's estimation, the undersecretary had it backward. It was precisely because they selectively targeted important individuals and never failed that they were a force to be reckoned with. At least they hadn't failed until Boland put himself on their scent. Twice now he had foiled them, but it wasn't enough. He wanted to track them home and put them out of business permanently. The stadium hotel overlooked the magnificent sports stadium Athens boasted. Boland's room was on the seventh floor. He threw his duffel on the bed, tossed his trench coat over a chair, and went into the bathroom. <sighs> he was unzipping his shaving kit when there was a knock on the door. Setting the kit into the sink, Boland drew his Beretta 93R from its holster under his left arm. From a slender pocket in his combat black suit, he slid a sound suppressor and quickly threaded it into the barrel. Catfooting over to the door, he leaned against the jam. Who is it? Mr. Blasco. Belasco was the cover name Bolin was using for this mission. He recognized the voice. It is I, Konohara Lombos. I need to speak with you, if you please. This is unexpected. My apologies, but I have news of the utmost urgency. Maybe I come in? By all means. Bolin let the colonel walk past. He scanned the hall before closing the door to verify the Greek was alone. Haralambos was a short, stocky man in the twilight of his career. He had an olive complexion, beefy cheeks, and bushy eyebrows. His uniform was immaculate, neatly pressed. The overhead light glistened on his balding pate when he removed his hat and stood at attention. Well, what can I do for you, Colonel? <clears throat> I would like to atone for my negligence. It was remiss of me not to check the batteries before taking those units into the field. Because of me, two seasoned terrorists got away. Every life they take from this day on will be on my conscience. I would rather not live with that burden, if it can be helped. Uh-huh. You mentioned something about news? Not two minutes after you left the villa, I received a call. My people have uncovered a lead. We might know where the two terrorists are right this minute. If you'd like, I will take you there. Warning bells pealed in Boland's mind. After the radio fiasco, he had no reason to trust Haralambos and every reason to suspect he was on the take. Terrorists sometimes paid military and police officers large sums of money to look the other way. It could be the colonel was leading him into a trap. Take me where? To a warehouse in Piraeus. It is believed the two terrorists might be there. My superiors instructed me to take a detachment and surround the place. But I thought perhaps you would rather handle this personally. Boland's suspicions climbed. It seemed strange the man would defy orders in so blatant a fashion. Why me? Oh, many reasons. First, as I said, to atone for my mistake. Second, to spare lives. The terrorists are not likely to give up without a fight. And I would rather avoid a battle in the middle of the city if I can help it. Lastly, I remembered you telling me how you would very much like to meet them again and... Finish what you'd started. Here is your chance. What do you say, Mr. Belasco? Are you interested? Olin had to admit the colonel's rationale was plausible. It would be the two of us? And my driver. I will instruct him to stay in our vehicle and be ready to call for backup should we require it. Very well. 
Poland slipped into his trench coat and tugged the strap of his duffel bag over his shoulder. He wanted to believe Haralambos was sincere, but even if he were wrong and it was a trap, the terrorists might be there to spring it themselves, and that suited him just fine. Turnabout, as the old saying went, was fair play. A military jeep had been waiting at the curb. Once on the way, Haralambos contacted a General Milonas. Hanging up his cell phone, he turned his head to face Bolin, who was in the rear seat, his duffel bag beside him. General Milonas has just informed me that all airports, bus terminals, and railroad stations were sealed off. The general is convinced the two terrorists must still be in country. You never explained why you believe they're at this warehouse. Mr. Belasco, our people have established that two of the suspected terrorists registered at the Aegean Hotel yesterday under assumed names. Those same names rented a car from a local agency. A car that parked outside the warehouse in question last evening. And how exactly would you know that? Uh, my apologies. About two weeks ago, the warehouse came under suspicion as a drop point for smugglers. Since then, the police have had it under constant surveillance. They have videotaped all the comings and goings and kept a record of every vehicle and boat that has stopped there. <laughs> One of those vehicles was the aforementioned rental car. What makes you think the terrorists are there now? Because the car is there. We instructed the police to let us know the minute it returned. Once again, Bolin reflected, it was all plausible and an incredible stroke of luck. It could be that terrorists were waiting for a ship and were lying low at the warehouse until it arrived. Ah, uh, I should let you know, General Milanos does not entirely agree with my decision. He would rather send in troops. I had to remind him that the Prime Minister stressed we accord you every courtesy and do whatever you request. Reading between the lines, Bolin understood the Colonel had gone out on a limb for his sake. I'm grateful for your help. Just so long as we do not let them get away. The General will not be so forgiving a second time. He was furious when I explained about the radios. So your tail's in the sling. Pardon? <laughs> oh, an American figure of speech, yes, indeed. My behind is most definitely in the slinger. If I let these two slip through my fingers again, my career will be finished. I will either be demoted or sent to a remote outpost in the northern mountains where I will languish for the rest of my days. The general made that quite plain. This is some gamble you're taking. Maybe you should call in the troops after all, or at least more police. I should? I thought you preferred to go in alone. I do, but it wouldn't hurt to have police surrounding the place, so the bastards can't slip past us like they did at the villa. Ah, yes. Consider it done. Piraeus was a major harbor. Thousands of seaworthy vessels and smaller ships and boats sailed in and out of port every year. Textiles, food, and machinery were the three most common legal cargoes. Drugs and guns were the most common illegal variety. Smuggling was widespread, and while Greek authorities did their best to stem the tide, Piraeus had a reputation as a smuggler's mecca. The warehouse district was busy 24 hours a day. The particular warehouse Haralambos had referred to, however, was dark as pitch and gave every appearance of being deserted. The jeep pulled into the parking lot across the street. In an unmarked van, parked in the shadows, were three police officers. The colonel consulted with them and came back to the jeep to report. The car is still there. He pointed at a late model sedan, barely visible near the warehouse entrance. They say that two men went inside and never came back out. Has anyone been there since? No, Mr. Belasco. They have an officer over on the wharf, the warehouse fronts, keeping watch for boats. But so far, it has been as quiet as a cemetery. Additional police should be here in 15 minutes at the most. We can go in then. We? I know you want to do it alone. And trust me, were it my decision, I would gladly let you. I have never been in combat, Mr. Belasco. And I have no romantic notions of pitting myself against hardened terrorists. But General Milanus gave me a direct order. He insists I accompany you inside. No offense, but a kill zone is no place for an amateur. Maybe we can work something out. Please, do not try to talk me out of it. As much as I would gladly stay out of the line of fire, I cannot disobey my superior. Not in this. If nothing else, I have always been a good soldier. Fine. I'd better get ready. Opening the duffel, he rummaged inside. The Weatherby Mark V he had used at the villa was broken down and in its special case, but he wouldn't use it here. He needed something smaller, 
something better suited to close confines, something with bells and whistles for night use. And he had just the thing. In recent years, the Heckler & Koch MP5 submachine gun had become popular with law enforcement agencies around the world, and with good reason. Compact and versatile, the MP5 delivered dependable firepower and could be modified for various combat scenarios. The version Bolin had brought along was an MP5 SD. It varied from the standard model in several regards. Instead of a buttstock, the end of the receiver was closed by a cap, which shortened the length by more than six inches. A night scope and laser sight could be mounted on top, and Bolin pulled out his toolkit to do just that. The MP5 SD was the silenced model of the line. Special casing was attached to the short barrel, acting as an inbuilt suppressor. Divided into two chambers, it reduced the SMG's noise level to a whisper. Bolin's had another modification. He had asked that a front grip be added between the suppressor and the receiver to provide better control and balance a lot like the front grip on his Beretta 93R. Since the majority of MP5s came with only full auto or single shot capability, he'd requested a model with a three-round burst option as well. The MP5 came fitted with a sling, which Bolin slid over his right shoulder. His Beretta was already snug in its holster. He strapped a holstered Desert Eagle on his right hip, attached a boot knife and sheath to his right ankle, and slipped a few grenades and other tools of his trade into the pockets of his black suit for good measure. Fully prepared, the executioner stepped out of the jeep, ready for war. Our timing is perfect. Here they come. A military troop transport swung into the parking lot and a police captain hopped out of the cab. Haralambos crossed to meet him. Seconds later, the rear flap of the truck unfurled and outspilled two dozen police officers. They formed three rows and stood at attention. Bolin was chafing to enter the warehouse. Every second of delay increased the likelihood that terrorists would get away if they hadn't already. A golden opportunity to capture an Al Jabbar member alive, and it was being squandered. It had never been done before, and Bolin knew the feds would give anything to get their hands on a living, breathing, potential treasure trove of intel. If he could take one of them alive, and if the feds could persuade their prisoner to talk, they could put the Al Jabbar out of operation that much sooner. A couple of big ifs, to be sure, but he wagered the payoff was worth the risks. The police were deployed efficiently, quietly, keeping well back from the warehouse so as not to alert those inside. Ah. Huh? Now it is up to us, my friend. Or should I say up to you? I am completely at your service. You are the expert in these matters. The officer's candor was refreshing. Too many times in the past, Bolin had to contend with arrogant know-it-alls who resented being made to work with an outsider. Stay behind me and do exactly as I do. Without fail, I have four grandchildren who I am extremely fond of. I very much desire to see them again. Keep your voice down or you'll be meeting your ancestors instead. Bolin headed across the street. Not a single vehicle other than the truck had come by since they arrived, and now police were stationed at both ends of the block to ensure civilians didn't stray into the fire zone. The executioner activated the starlight scope and raised the MP5 to eye level. The darkness seemed to magically dissolve. He could see the front of the warehouse as well as if it were daylight, tinted a swamp shade of green. Two windows overlooked the parking area, but there was no movement within. He stalked to the rental car, verified it was empty, and stepped to the front door. Haralambos was breathing much too heavily. The man was nervous, and Bolin hoped that wouldn't make him careless. The colonel was armed with a Mat-49 and held it clutched to his chest, as if afraid he might drop it. Bolin tried the doorknob, expecting it to be locked. He was glad to be proven wrong. He eased the door open wide enough for a look inside. Crates were stacked to the ceiling, mountains of them on either side. A narrow aisle led into the bowels of the building. No lights were on. The place was indeed quiet as a tomb. Braced for an outcry or a greeting of lead, Bolin slipped inside. If there was an office, he reflected, it had to be at the other end, close to the docks. A hand tugged at his sleeve and he stopped. I cannot see a thing, Mr. Blasco. Bolin frowned. One of the cardinal rules of clandestine ops, maintain silence at all times, especially at moments like this when the enemy might be close at hand. The damage had been done. Stay here. I'll go on alone. 
but I have my orders. You're inside. You've done as the General wanted. Now it's up to me. Wait for me to give you the all clear. I don't know. Grandkids or ancestors, Colonel. Think about it. Olin moved on before the Colonel could argue. His back to the left-hand crates, his finger curled around the MP5's trigger. Thanks to the scope, he could see well enough to distinguish gaps between the stacks. He peered into each before sidling by. A glow appeared at the far end on the right. Bolin sprinted to the crates on the other side and moved along them until he came to an open area. A small office lay just beyond. Light streamed from the open door, but no sounds issued from within. Bolin switched off the night vision scope. It operated on the principle of magnifying ambient light. In the dark it worked fine, but when near a light source it was prone to severe scope glare. For the moment at least he was better off relying on his own sight. To the right of the office door lay a crate, open and empty. Bolin had to go around it into the light to reach the office. As he did so, he heard a scraping noise from across the way, followed by the unmistakable ratchet of a weapon's bolt being thrown. He threw himself back into the darkness and dropped flat just in time. He couldn't see the assailant, but he had a fair idea where the man was, and he responded in kind. A second SMG joined the fray. Bolin saw a flash, triggered a three-round burst, and instantly rolled to the left. Heaving up, he ran to the nearest stack of crates and squatted. The terrorists were over in the far left corner. To reach them, Bolin needed to cross 30 feet of wide open space. They would cut him down before he made it 10 steps, but not if he could blind them. Bolin removed an MK1 illumination grenade from a side pocket. Filled with a magnesium mixture, the bomb would emit 55,000 candle power for about half a minute after it was detonated. As he started to pull the pin, he heard footsteps patter in the central aisle. It had to be Haralambos. Bolin hoped the Greek had the good sense not to say or do anything that would give him away. Suddenly, the terrorist with the silenced SMG triggered a long burst. He wasn't firing at Bolin, though. He was shooting toward the center aisle. Haralambos's MAT-49 responded, and the second terrorist opened up. Shit! Yanking the pin from the MK-1, Bolin rose and flung the grenade in an overhand arc, then dropped back down and buried his face in his forearms. Colonel, shut your eyes! Brilliant light flared, light so bright that even with his face pressed to his sleeve, it seemed as if the sun had gone nova. He ticked off the seconds in his head, and when he reached 25, he was up and racing around the crates toward the corner. As he passed the aisle, he discovered his fears had been justified. The colonel was down. The executioner discovered that the corner of the warehouse was empty. The two terrorists had vanished. Bolin's first priority was to investigate and find out where they had gone, but he rushed to the stricken officer and sank to one knee. Haralambos was in bad shape. He had taken multiple rounds in the chest and dark stains were growing on his uniform. <laughs> Sorry, I heard the shots and thought you needed help. Bolin's gut bawling into a knot, he scanned the warehouse but still saw no trace of the terrorists. Did you get them? No. Then don't waste time with me. Get after them. I'll call for help. Bolin unclipped the radio for him, shoved it into the colonel's hand and rose. He checked behind the crates on the right side before moving toward the corner. The light from the grenade was almost gone, but enough remained for him to notice lines in the floor where there shouldn't be any. Lines and a thin, recessed metal ring. A trap door. Kneeling, Bolin gripped the ring, leaned back so his body wasn't exposed to potentially deadly autofire, and pulled. The door rose easily on well-oiled hinges. Through the opening wafted the dank scent of salt water. Bolin cautiously looked over the edge. Buttressed by thick pylons, the end of the warehouse jutted over the water. Fifty feet below, small waves lapped at a hidden dock reached by a ladder from the trapdoor. Tied to the dock were two speedboats, sleek outboard cruisers able to outrun most anything on the water. There was room for a third. Lying flat, Bolin dipped his head lower and spotted it moving off quietly so as not to draw the attention of the police. Two men were in it, one at the wheel, the other at the stern, paddling. The man wielding the paddle saw Bolin. Dropping it, he leveled a sound-suppressed SMG. Bolin barely jerked back in time. Slinging the MP5, he dropped down the ladder three rungs at a time. 
The terrorists were speeding rapidly away. He undid the mooring line and sprang into the second boat. It was too much to expect to find the keys in the ignition, but jump-starting a boat wasn't much different from jump-starting cars, and thanks to his K-bar knife and quick fingers, within 90 seconds he had turned the motor over and opened the throttle to give chase. Bolin realized the police were firing at him in the mistaken notion he was another terrorist. Tucking at the knees, he weathered the hailstorm and sped for the open harbor. The speedboat responded to the throttle like a thoroughbred at the touch of the reins. A typical smuggler's craft, proving the police had been right to place the warehouse under surveillance. The terrorists were rocketing westward at a reckless cliff. Ships both large and small filled the harbor, to say nothing of dozens of boats of every kind, from fishing prams to yachts to schooners. At over 40 knots, the executioner flew parallel to his quarry's wake, a fine spray wetting his hair and dampening his face. He had to overtake them soon, or they were liable to slip away in the maze of ships that clogged the port. Sparking bullets abruptly speckled the stern of the other craft. The soldier instinctively dropped low as leaden rain bit into the foredeck and five or six rounds punched holes in the windshield. He didn't bother returning fire. At that distance, with the water as choppy as it was, scoring a hit would be more luck than skill. He concentrated on narrowing the gap. Off in the night, the lights of an ocean-going freighter appeared, creeping slowly into port guided by a tug. Most craft would sensibly give it a wide berth, but the terrorists were headed straight forth. They had to be up to something, but exactly what, Bolin couldn't guess. Then a new element intruded itself. A spotlight splashed across the water, courtesy of a helicopter streaking in fast and low from landward. By its markings, it was a police chopper, and its passengers were making the same mistake as the police on the dock. The spotlight bathed his craft. Ordering him to stop, Bolin figured. The speedboat was equipped with a radio. To let the authorities know he was one of the good guys, Bolin flicked the power switch on and studied the digital display. He had no idea which frequency the police monitored. To find it, he'd have to go up and down the entire dial. He reached for the microphone, then jerked back as sparks erupted from the control panel, narrowly missing his face and eyes. Slugs fired at him from the dock tore through the radio's vitals. God damn it! The chopper was almost on top of Bolin. It banged lower. A side hatch opened, and the business end of a machine gun was trained on Bolin's craft. So it wasn't the police, Bolin realized. To his knowledge, Colonel Haralambos hadn't contacted the Port Authority about the terrorists or about him. They didn't know he was in Greece with the tacit approval of their government. To the men in the copter, he was likely a smuggler and would be treated accordingly. Bolin assumed these were warning shots. The chopper was a variation on the French-made Alouette. Equipped with floats and incorporating a slightly longer fuselage, it was ideal for patrolling over water. Outrunning it was out of the question, but Bolin couldn't just throttle down and let the real threat get away. Maybe there was another option. Suddenly slowing to a crawl, Bolin raised his arms. He wagged them back and forth, pointing to the west at the other speedboat. The chopper settled lower, the prop wash buffeting him like a gale in a hurricane. He kept pointing, hoping they would take the hint. To the east, a siren wailed and lights flashed, a sign the launch would soon arrive. Bolin jabbed his fingers harder. Suddenly, the spotlight swiveled, spiking across the water to catch the other speedboat in its glare. The pilot did exactly as Bolin hoped. Like a great bird of prey, it swooped up over him and flashed toward the terrorists. Several hundred yards to the east, the launch was closing fast. Gripping the throttle, Bolin opened her up again, and the speedboat hurtled forward, the bow practically leaping out of the water. He saw the copter gain swiftly on the other craft. One terrorist was bent over the wheel. The second appeared to be trying to work the bolt of an assault rifle. The pair was as good as caught. A strategically placed burst from the copter's machine gun would stop their speedboat dead in the water. They might be willing to go out in a blaze of misguided glory or to commit suicide. But if Bolin could get close enough, he could wing either or both and cover them until the launch arrived. 
Then the second man straightened and pressed his weapon to his shoulder. With a start, Boland saw it was fitted with a grenade launcher. The man hadn't been working the bolt, he had been feeding in a grenade. The Greek chopper was too low and too close to the speedboat. The pilot realized his mistake and the copter tilted and started to rise, but it hadn't lifted 10 feet when the grenade launcher chugged. The terrorist at the wheel promptly swerved sharply to the right. Boland cut back on the throttle not two seconds before the grenade went off. The blaze of the impact was but a prelude to the helicopter itself, as it went up in an inferno of light and sound. A huge fireball engulfed the aircraft, reducing the fuselage to so much twisted charred metal. The copter canted, its damaged blades still crookedly spinning, and plunged nose first into the sea. The terrorists were back on their original heading, bearing directly toward the tug and freighter. Bolin opened up the throttle again. To his rear, the launch slowed and moved toward the flaming debris, slowly sinking from sight. Looking for survivors, no doubt, and destined to be disappointed. The gap between the two speedboats had widened, but Bolin was confident the killers couldn't shake him. He had to remember to keep his eyes on the man with the grenade launcher, or court the same fate as the chopper. Crewmen were running about on the tug's bow and pointing toward where it went down. A light started flashing above the tug's cabin, and a small spotlight was switched on and trained on the oncoming speedboat. The terrorists didn't seem to mind. They sped past the tug with hardly a glance and angled toward the freighter. The man with the grenade launcher tucked the weapon to his shoulder once more. Cold rage knifed through Bolan. He knew what they were about to do, what they had intended to do all along, and he was powerless to stop it. They weren't close enough for him to use the MP5. The other speedboat was broadside to the giant freighter. Holding his assault rifle almost vertical, the terrorist fired a grenade high against the hull. Hands flying, with no wasted movement whatsoever, he quickly loaded another and fired again. Bolin veered to the right. The hull of a ship that size should be thick enough to withstand an ordinary grenade with minimal damage. The terrorists were bound to know that too, and must have used armor-piercing grenades instead, probably with a fuse delay. Holy shit! Part of the freighter's side spewed outward like an erupting volcano. Great spouts of flame shot across the water. Debris showered like rain. A boiling red and orange wall of death rushed toward Bolan. He pressed on the throttle, but it was already as far as it would go. Blistering heat enveloped him, and for a few harrowing moments he thought the speedboat would be swallowed by it. Then the heat subsided, and a glance showed the fireball collapsing on itself, and the ship. Thick clouds of smoke poured from the freighter and swiftly spread. Up at the rail, people were scurrying about and pointing at a cavity in the vessel's side. Bolin swung to the left to take up the chase, but the other speedboat had been camouflaged by the smoke and was nowhere in sight. Slowing, he steered directly into it and cast about for some sign. The smoke grew thicker by the minute, and was soon so bad he had to cover his face with one hand in order to keep from coughing. Faced with the futility of locating them, not to mention the danger of colliding with the freighter, he spun the wheel, reversing direction. Bedlam rained on the ship. Bolin emerged into starlight and fresh air. Drinking it deep into his lungs, he headed east in a wide loop. His sweep took time, and after half an hour he had to concede they had given him the slip. He made for sure. The warehouse was awash in light. Dozens of police and emergency vehicles surrounded it. Police swarmed over the place like agitated bees over a hive. Nine or ten were on the main dock. As Bolin brought the speedboat in, they trained their hardware on him. He elevated his arms to demonstrate he wasn't a threat. Where is Colonel Haralambas? One of the policemen ran into the warehouse. The others enveloped the boat, relieved him of his weapons, and roughly hauled him out. For a minute, Bolin thought he would be dragged to police headquarters and thrown into a cell. Then the policeman who had gone off returned, and with him was the captain who had spoken with the colonel earlier. At his command, Bolin was released and his weapons returned. My apologies, sir. These men had no way of knowing who you were. And you do? Colonel Haralambos informed me of your, how shall I say, special status. 
He did not say much, merely enough for me to know you have official sanction at the highest levels. That was how Brognola's doing. Whenever and wherever possible, the Big Fed smoothed things over for Boland so he could get the job done with a minimum of fuss. Contacts, safe houses, transportation. Brognola took care of them all. The trick was to do it without drawing too much attention to Boland. Boland hurried toward the front of the warehouse. How's the colonel? Have they taken him to the hospital? Uh, they are about to, but it does not look good. He stopped breathing once already, but the paramedics were able to revive him. An ambulance was parked near the entrance, the rear doors open, and a pair of husky paramedics were about to lift the colonel in. Haralambos was strapped to a gurney, a respirator over his mouth. His eyes were open, and when he saw Bolin, he weakly lifted one hand and said something to the medics, who reluctantly paused. <sighs> Did you get them, Mr. Polesko? Bolin shook his head. I was so hoping that you would. I did not want to die in vain. <laughs> I guess I will never see those sweet grandchildren of mine again, eh? You should not be talking, sir. We must get you to the hospital without delay. But it was already too late. In the blink of an eye, he was gone. His body sagged on the gurney. The colonel lay completely limp as blood dribbled over his lower lip and down his cheek. A blanket was draped over the gurney, and it was rolled into the ambulance. The flashing lights were turned off, and the ambulance pulled out. Bolin stood and watched until it was out of sight. He couldn't say exactly why, given he hardly knew the man, but the Greek's passing affected him. Haralambos had been a decent, considerate human being. He deserved better. Better than to be coldly gunned down by people who snuffed out human life as casually as most people would swat a fly. My men and I are at your disposal. If we can be of any help, all you have to do is ask. Bolin just wanted to get to his hotel. The jeep was still in the parking lot across the street, and he trudged toward it. Is there anything you can tell me about the men who killed Colonel Harolambos? Their identities, perhaps. He said they were terrorists, but nothing more. They're members of the Algebar. Those devils. I have heard of them. What on earth were they doing in Greece? Between you and me and the moon, Captain, trying to assassinate the U.S. Vice President. Bolin had already said enough. More than he should. Rognola didn't want the attempt to become common knowledge. It was part of the reason the Fed had asked for his help instead of simply letting the Secret Service handle it. The sergeant had the passenger door open. His expression told Bolin he knew about the colonel, and the soldiers slid in without comment. When I file my report, what do I say about you? Nothing. I was never here. You never saw me. Highly irregular, sir, but I will honor the colonel's request and do as you wish. I... Yes? These pigs who killed the colonel, I hate to think that they will get away with it. Justice demands recompense. I hope your government will see to it that they are paid back in kind. Count on it. More than ever, he wanted to track down the Al Jabbar and finish their bloodthirsty campaign. Bolin nodded at the driver, who pulled out, then eyed him quizzically. The Blocka Hotel. Twisting, he slid the duffel from the back seat onto the floor between his feet. One by one, he replaced everything except the Beretta, then shrugged into his trench coat. By that time, they were halfway to Athens, and the sergeant driving hadn't uttered a word. Empty apologies weren't worth a damn. Bolin remained silent himself. Back in his hotel room, Bolin barely had time to set down his duffel. He had a hunch who it would be, and he was right. I hear it didn't go well, Stryker. To hell in a handbasket is how I would describe it. Propping a pillow against the headboard, he sank onto his back. Everything that could go wrong did. Murphy's Law strikes again. My contact in the Prime Minister's office informs me the liaison was killed, and something about a freighter nearly being blown to hell. Bolin recounted the night's events. They were only too vivid in his mind. 
So we're no closer to eliminating the Al Jabbar than we were two days ago. They have more lives than a damned cat. The Greeks have taken charge of the bodies at the vineyards and are trying to identify them. Maybe something will turn up. In the meantime, I've booked you on the afternoon flight out of Athens tomorrow. There's nothing on the burner at Stony Men at the moment, so I thought you'd like a relaxing flight home. Cancel it. You're staying over? The Al Jabbar just became my number one priority. I'll wait to see if the Greeks hit pay dirt, and if they do, I'll take it from there. Far be it from me to criticize, but that's a long shot. Those two operatives you shot in Islamabad were never identified. We ran their fingerprints through every international database we could access and came up with nothing. Sooner or later they'll slip up. They all do, eventually. Want me to send Jack over to keep you company? Jack Grimaldi was one of Boland's closest friends, an ace pilot who spent most of his time shuttling stony man personnel to hot spots across the globe. No. I'll handle this one solo. Well, there's no shame in asking for help. The last report we had, the Al Jabbar has upward of 30 members. As good as you are, a little assistance will go a long way toward evening the odds. I said no. Is there something I'm missing here? Something you're not telling me? I want to take down the Al Jabbar. It's as simple as that. Who are you trying to kid? <laughs> Nothing is ever simple with you. But if this is how you want it, we'll play it your way. Good. Oh, and there's one thing. Can you get a new liaison assigned ASAP? I'll contact the Prime Minister and arrange to have someone assigned. This time I'll stress how grateful we would be if they let you handle things your own way. Boland didn't bother to point out that he had stressed it the first time, but the General had overridden their wishes. That was the trouble with trying to circumvent chains of command in a foreign country. There was always someone who thought he knew better. One last item, and I'll let you get your beauty sleep. The President mentioned how grateful he was for our intervention on the Veep's behalf. He asked me to relay his thanks to whoever was responsible. <laughs> so, thanks. You didn't tell him it was me? I thought it best not to spoil his mood. You know as well as I do, he has serious reservations about relying on the services of uh, someone who's operated outside the government's purview. Olin gazed out the window at the Athenian skyline and shook his head. It was one more reminder that his working relationship with Uncle Sam rested on the thinnest of ice. They needed his expertise, his skill, but were wary of being found out. Of the public learning in newspaper jargon that the government was in bed with a former lone wolf who had worked outside the law. A revelation like that was every politician's worst nightmare. You take care, Stryker. You hear? Always. It had been a while since the Big Fed brought up his unofficial status and it made Bolin wonder if there was more to the comment than Brognola had let on. Shrugging, he walked into the bathroom and stripped off his shirt. He wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Bolin had more important matters to occupy him. If the Greeks came up empty on the Al Jabbar, he was back to square one. Nowhere. He could use a lucky break right about now, but he had been at this business far too long to expect or count on miracles. Still, a small one wouldn't hurt. It had been a slow news day, the kind Mort Collins detested. Mort was News Time Magazine's Athens bureau chief. He'd held the post for eight years and loathed every minute of it. He hated Greece. He hated the food. He hated the climate, the mountains, the ocean. In fact, it was common knowledge that Mort hated everything except Mort Collins and New York City. Collins's dream was to snag a transfer to the Big Apple. He was born and raised there, and his sole ambition in life was to get back to where he belonged. He'd never wanted to come to Athens. His bosses at Newstime had insisted. They claimed he was the right man and sent him despite his protests. It was his misfortune to be born into a wealthy family and to have a mother and father who gave him the finest education money could buy. They sent him to a prestigious private school where students were required to take three years of one of six foreign languages offered. Collins chose Greek, only because the woman who taught it had fostered some pleasant fantasies in his off hours. He had the further misfortune to become fluent enough to speak it like a native. So here he was, in the prime of his career, stuck at a post he despised. 
but Collins hadn't given up hope. All he needed was to break a major story, to show his bosses what he was capable of, and he was confident they would bend over backward to reassign him anywhere he wanted. Goodbye, Big Olive. Hello, Big Apple. Sadly, Athens wasn't exactly a hotbed of major news potential. Collins covered political squabbles, an occasional bank robbery, the mafia's ongoing shenanigans, the Greek-Turkish conflict, and he interviewed the movers and shakers, which to him was about as stimulating as watching grass grow. A call had come in from a stranger in Piraeus. A ship was on fire, the guy said. Police were all over the place. Since the only other person in the office was the cleaning lady, Collins decided to swing out to the harbor on his way home and get the lowdown. He wasn't expecting much of a story, but when he arrived and saw the scene for himself, his interest was piqued. The harbor was abuzz with activity. The freighter had been anchored well out from shore so it wouldn't pose a threat and was being sprayed with flame-retardant foam by a pair of tugs. Half a dozen helicopters were zipping back and forth, their searchlights sweeping the water. As the caller had attested, police were everywhere. Collins guessed that every cop within 50 miles had been brought in. He also noticed military transports and troops moving about. Something was up, something big. A large crowd had gathered to witness the spectacle, and Collins had to wend his way through to get close enough for a look at the freighter. Several policemen were keeping the people from pressing too close to the water's edge. Loose Time Magazine, more Collins. Any idea what happened here? I am sorry, sir. I do not. We have been told not to ask questions and to let them handle it. Them? Them who? The military, sir. They are in charge here. Collins's interest bloomed. He noticed a warehouse to the left that had been cordoned off by police. Soldiers were moving about, and military vehicles filled the parking area. Planting a friendly smile on his face, he ambled over and flashed his ID to a policeman who held out an arm to bar his way. I'm with Newstime Magazine. I'd like to see what's going on over there. You can go no farther, sir. My orders are not to let anyone pass this point. Is there someone I can talk to? Your superior, perhaps? For once, luck was with him. Another policeman approached. I am Captain Dimitrikopoulos. Perhaps I may be of assistance? I'd appreciate any information you can share with the press. The captain motioned him to one side. <clears throat> can you keep this off the record? Strictly between the two of us? Collins silently thanked his lucky stars. Of course. I received a report of an explosion. Is that a military ship out there? What, are they carrying munitions or something and afraid the whole ship will go up? No, sir, nothing like that. This was the work of terrorists. Collins blazoned the word in his mind. He couldn't take notes in front of this fool, but this was getting better and better by the second. You know this for sure, do you? I will have you know that I was one of the first to arrive on the scene. My men and I were ordered to surround the warehouse. I saw much of what happened. I was there when the ambulance took away the army officer that was killed. Do you know this officer's name? That I cannot divulge. Sorry. You need to contact their public relations officer. Uh-huh. What about these uh, terrorists? How many were there? Two, I believe. Only two? <laughs> that is more than enough when they are members of the Al-Jabbar. You have heard of it, yes? Collins froze. The Al-Jabbar had been featured in a recent News Time article on terrorist organizations. Any story about them was bound to make the next issue. He could hardly wait to file his report. I wonder what they're doing here. Trying to escape, I should think, after their failed attempt on your vice president's life. An electric tingle shot down Collins's spine. Do I understand you correctly? The al Jabbar terrorists tried to assassinate the Vice President of the United States? That is what I was told, yes. Collins let the full significance sink in. He had stumbled on the mother load, an honest-to-God headliner, one that could finally bring him his dream. But he had to be careful not to get ahead of himself. He needed sources, corroboration, supporting facts. <clears throat> Who told you this, Captain? It was... I am sorry, Mr. Collins. I was instructed to keep the information confidential. Can you at least tell me where the assassination attempt took place? That I do not know. Collins nodded his head. He had learned as much as he was going to hear. 
Thank you for your help. Rest assured your name will never be mentioned in my story. Story? You said this was off the record. No, you said this was off the record. You ought to know better than to trust a reporter. Ciao. Collins's mind was in a whirl all the way back to Athens. He had to jump on the story before someone else did. His biggest fear was that another journalist would beat him to the punch. As soon as he reached his office, he grabbed his little black book of contacts from his desk drawer and started making calls. He had scores of names and numbers. At one time or another, he had interviewed everyone of influence, from military leaders to heads of state. He knew people at every Greek agency and in every branch of law enforcement. All the years he'd spent in journalistic purgatory were finally paying off. In an hour's time, Collins had confirmed that there had indeed been an assassination attempt, that it occurred at the villa of Constantine Panopoulos, the two terrorists had been slain and two had escaped, and there had been a firefight at the harbor that resulted in the deaths of an army colonel, three police officers in a copter, and five crewmen aboard the freighter. A couple of puzzling aspects arose. For one thing, Collins established that the Secret Service whisked the vice president from the villa well before the attempt was made. The Secret Service agent he spoke to was adamant, insisting the Secret Service had nothing to do with the deaths of the two terrorists. Reliable sources in the Greek military and police claimed they weren't involved either. If no one was claiming responsibility, who had taken them out? The other riddle was how the U.S. government had learned of the plot beforehand. From all indications, Collins was convinced they had done exactly that. He phoned the vice president's press secretary and assistant to the Greek prime minister. Neither could help. Then he thought of an American professor at Athens University, a mild-mannered scholarly sort who happened to be in the employ of the CIA. The newsman had uncovered that choice tidbit at a cocktail party at the U.S. Embassy. He occasionally called the man, Fred Schoenfield, to have leads verified or refuted. This is all news to me, Mr. Collins. I'm even more in the dark than you are. But maybe an informant forewarned our side, or perhaps a wiretap uncovered the plan. There are a host of possibilities. Although, if I was a betting man, I'd lay money they gleaned the intel from global surveillance. It's reached that point where they can eavesdrop on practically anyone, anywhere, anytime. Which system is this? Don't tell me you've never heard of Echelon. Tell me whatever you can, Schoenfield. Uh, tell me whatever you can. Beretta behind his back, he opened his hotel room door to find a tall, gray-haired Greek in an expensive brown suit and tie, holding a briefcase. <clears throat> Mr. Balasco. Yes? Permit me to introduce myself. Dimitri Castorian at your service. I am your new liaison with my government. Come in. Thank you. No army officer this time? Mr. Bragnola felt it best if your new contact had direct access to the Prime Minister. I am on his personal staff and can ring him any hour of the day or night. Castorian set his briefcase on the table and removed a manila folder. My first order of business is to inform you we have identified one of the terrorists slain at the villa. The file consisted of a single sheet. Under a photo was the pertinent bio, such as it was. Sahura Narmer, Egyptian, age 24, place of birth, Cairo. Worked as a file clerk until two years ago when he disappeared. No criminal record. How did your people identify him so fast? Dental records were one factor. His family turned them over to Egyptian authorities when they reported him missing. The other was his fingertip. Narmer lost the end of one when he was 10. His father was cutting weeds with a scythe and Narmer came up behind him. The boy was lucky he did not lose his head. Is that all we know? We have established that Namar and another terrorist registered at the Acropolis Hotel under forged identities. The police have gone over their rooms and found fingerprints, but it could be weeks before a match is found, if ever. To be honest, identifying Namar so quickly was a surprise. So there it was. Bolin was left with a dead end. There is more. Namar and his accomplice rented a car. In it, we found a cellular phone. The serial number is being traced as we speak. By this time tomorrow, we should know where Nomer obtained it. And more importantly, his service provider. 
which in turn Bolin knew might result in a complete record of every phone call Narmer ever made or received. A treasure trove of intel that could point them in the direction of the Aljabar's base of operations. Staying in Greece hadn't been a waste of time after all. I am sorry we cannot get the information sooner. No problem at all. I will pass on our findings to Mr. Bragnola as soon as I receive them, and to you if you are still here in Athens. Why wouldn't I be? With the prospect of a major break looming, he wasn't inclined to go anywhere. The Greek unfolded a map and placed it on the table. I am sure you are eager to catch the terrorists who killed Colonel Haralambas, and we think we know where they are. Bolan leaned over the map and noticed a tiny island in the Aegean Sea had been circled in red. Initially, we thought the terrorists had rendezvoused with a ship and were halfway across the Mediterranean by now. Then, a high-altitude reconnaissance plane took some interesting photos. Castorian plucked a packet of photographs from the briefcase and spread them out alongside the map. It was a routine flight over disputed waters in the Aegean. We claim the area as ours, the Turks claim it as theirs. See this, uh, the tiny silver dot circled in red, and these others? Bolin nodded. On all the photos except one was a similar dot. The last was a blow-up, but not much could be discerned other than that it was a small, slender craft, and judging from the wake it left behind, moving like a bat out of hell. You think it's the speedboat the terrorists escaped in? That is our theory, yes. The boats hidden under the warehouse were retrofitted with additional gas tanks, extending their range by hundreds of kilometers. Granted, there are nearly as many boats in Greece as there are cars, but we find it interesting where this particular craft was headed. The island of Timas, an uninhabited speck far from anywhere. Reefs offshore make it supremely treacherous to shipping and boaters. No one ever goes there. Yet this speedboat did. It arrived about noon today, and to the best of our knowledge, it has not left. The terrorists are still there. Unless they sprouted wings, yes. We have taken high-altitude photos of the island and the surrounding sea every half hour, and no ship or boat has gone anywhere near it. We suspect they are waiting to be picked up under cover of night. And before you ask, yes, we debated sending in our navy. As I mentioned, Tinas is in disputed waters. The Prime Minister is afraid the Turkish government would construe it as an act of aggression. So you'd like me to go in and flush them out? Is that where this is going? If you have no objections, yes. We can have you there inside of 90 minutes. One of the fastest helicopters in the Hellenic Army Aviation Force is fueled and waiting to go. Let me grab my duffel and we're out of here. Sixteen minutes later, Bolin was streaking eastward toward the Gulf of Evia. The copter was an American-made AH-1 Cobra, one of eight, the young pilot mentioned, sold to Greece as part of an arms package deal. It had a top airspeed at sea level of more than 140 miles per hour and a maximum range of 315 miles. It seated two. The pilot, Lieutenant Dionekis, was from Sparta. A cocky hotshot, he handled the Cobra with a level of skill Jack Grimaldi would admire. He pointed out the plane at Marathon, where a famous battle was fought against the Persians, and offhandedly mentioned he could trace his family's lineage back to the illustrious 300 who fought to the death beside Leonidas. They crossed the Gulf, which was sprinkled with fishermen and pleasure craft, and shot over the rolling mountains and verdant valleys of picturesque Evia. Beyond lay the pristine Aegean and a host of islands, large and small. Bolin, in the gunner's seat in the nose, frequently consulted his watch and glanced over his shoulder to gauge how long it would be until sunset. They had to reach Thenus by then. Not only was that when the terrorists were likely to be picked up, but landing in the dark would be a dicey proposition. According to Dimitri, there wasn't a flat spot on the island. It was an outcropping of volcanic rock about half a mile in diameter. Its surface was twisted, pitted, and rent with ravines and fissures. In daylight, locating a spot to set down would be like finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. At night, it would be impossible. These men you are after, I speed on them and their cowardice. To kill people from hiding is not the way of a true warrior. Bolin thought of his tour as a military sniper, and the severe toll he wreaked on the other side by taking out their officers and select troops. Sometimes it's necessary. Is blowing up innocent women and children necessary? Is killing infants? I cannot believe you are defending them, Mr. Belasco. Neither could Bolin. 
terrorism under any guise was an evil that had to be expunged. Do not mistake me. I admire the work you do. To go where your country needs you and kill vermin like this. To know you are making the world a safer place in which to live. It must be very rewarding. It has to be done. But surely it gives you a good feeling inside. All the lives you must save, your country will thank you with its highest honors. As if that would ever happen. More likely, one day Uncle Sam would decide the soldier was more of a political liability than an asset, and he would find himself the prey rather than the predator. Talk about ironies. No one loved America more than he did. No one cherished the ideals on which it was founded more than him. The land of the free and the home of the brave was more than a catchphrase. It was an ideal by which he lived. To him, freedom was everything. Defending it was not merely a right, but a basic responsibility. Bolin knew sacrifice was called for. The defense of liberty came with a cost, and he had given up more than most. He would never have a wife to lie beside him at night, never have children to bounce on his knee, never know the exquisite joy of a family and a home. Loneliness came with the territory. I envy you, Mr. Belasco. I come from a family with a fine tradition of warriors. But my country has not been at war in many years, and I sometimes think I will grow old and retire without ever firing a round in combat. Maybe Dianicus was the lucky one, Bolin thought, but he didn't say so aloud. He had no illusions about war. It was a deadly, dirty business. Those who glorified it were usually those who had never been in uniform. Warfare didn't deserve to be extolled. Rather, it was the selfless service of the men and women who willingly gave their lives for their country who should be glorified. They were heroes, one and all. Bolin shifted his legs so he was more comfortable. He was dressed in his black suit and rigged for combat. Wedged in front of him was his duffel. His weapons, his night vision scope, his maps, his food rations, his cell phone. He might need any and all of them before this was done. I miss the days of my ancestors, Mr. Belasco. The days when battles were fought man to man. Where is the honor in dropping bombs from so high up, the planes that drop them cannot be seen with the naked eye, or firing a missile from a thousand miles away? The old ways were better, I think. Simpler. Nobler. Were it up to me, that is how war would be fought today. Were it up to me, there would be no war at all. Strange words coming from someone like yourself. You kill for a living, is that not true? I do what needs to be done. You said the same before. Is that all this is to you, then? You are performing your duty and nothing more? Duty is only part of the equation. I see it as a war between good and evil. Between those who believe in freedom and those who want to remake the world in their own image, willing to exterminate anyone who doesn't see it their way. A war that's been taking place since the dawn of time. But now the threat is greater than ever. Modern technology has made evil that much more powerful. Evil never rests, and neither can we. There has never been a day in recorded human history when there wasn't a war taking place somewhere. We have to be vigilant in freedom's defense, or evil will win out. Bolin hadn't meant to climb on a soapbox, but the pilot's comments had struck a nerve. So to you, what you do is more than duty. It is a calling. I don't know as I'd go that far. Settling back, he gazed out over the glimmering expanse of the Aegean. The farther they went, the fewer ships they encountered. Soon there were none at all just the sea and, now and then, a small island. Most appeared to be uninhabited. ETA in five minutes. Mr. Belasco, I think we have a problem. I am picking up a bleep on my radar. It is a jet fighter. It's Turkish, and it has a fix on us. Greece and Turkey had a long history of boundary disputes. Their long-standing rivalry over Cyprus was common knowledge. Less newsworthy were the dozens of times each year one side accused the other of unauthorized excursions into their airspace. Greece and Turkey were also both U.S. allies. For decades, the American government had walked a tactful tightrope in order not to antagonize one side or the other. Arms and munitions had been sold to both nations. So it was that Mac Bolan found himself in a U.S.-made Cobra helicopter whisking low over the Aegean Sea pursued by a U.S.-made F-16 jet fighter. Bolin caught a fleeting glimpse of the pilot, and then the jet was past them and climbing. In a dogfight, the Cobra would be at a severe disadvantage. It was armed with an M-197 cannon, tow anti-tank missiles, and a pair of short-range Sidewinder air-to-air missiles. But the F-16 had a cannon and missiles of its own, as well as Westinghouse ANALQ-119, 
and ANALQ-131 ECM pods and other advanced electronic countermeasure components that would effectively neutralize the Sidewinders. Lieutenant Dianicus, though, didn't change his heading. Again, the F-16 roared past. This time, the pilot did the last thing Bolin expected. He grinned and waved. The silver warbird arced up and away, performing a crisp aerial loop, and within seconds it was flying back the way it had come, toward Turkish soil. Those crazy Turks! Do you see what we have to put up with? They do that all the time. To them it is some kind of game. Would you rather he shut us down? Of course not. But mark my words, Mr. Belasco. One of these days, one of their pilots or one of ours will forget himself and make a mistake that will plunge both our countries into all-out war. It was a wonder that it hadn't happened already. The threat was always there, if not over Cyprus, then over airspace violations. One minute to drop. Bolin closed the duffel and peered out the cockpit. They had dipped so low they were nearly skimming the waves. Dianicus angled around to approach the island from the north a precaution based on reconnaissance photos that showed the speedboat had done so from the south. The Cobra was rapidly losing airspeed. Ahead, Bolin spied the island, and it was every bit as bleak and desolate as the Greeks led him to believe, a great knotted mound of ancient rock jutting skyward like an angry fist. There wasn't a plant anywhere, not so much as a blade of grass. In seconds, Thenus was beneath them. Lieutenant Dianicus banked right and left, seeking a safe site to touch down. Flat spots were extremely few and far between. Much of the surface rolled and dipped like the Aegean's waves, broken by large holes and wide depressions. Stony knobs and rocky spikes bristled like quills on a porcupine. Like a hummingbird swooping onto a feeder, the cobra dropped onto a level area no longer than the copter's landing skids. Bolin raised the upward-hinged side door, gripped the M-16 in one hand, the duffel in the other, and rose. Thanks for the ride, Lieutenant. Careful to keep an eye on the spinning rotor blades, he climbed down from the cockpit. Then, bent at the waist, he ran a dozen yards and turned. Dianicus smiled and gave him a thumbs up. For a moment, the chopper hovered, then it veered off across the sea to the northwest. Poland didn't linger. There was always a chance that terrorists had spotted the Cobra and might be converging on him that very minute. He hurried south, moving as fast as the inhospitable terrain allowed. He had never seen volcanic strata quite like this. Many of the rocks were sharp enough to cut exposed flesh. A basin three feet wide and two feet deep afforded Bolin the perfect place to ditch the duffel for the time being, which he did, after taking out the cell phone. Twilight was falling, but it would be a while before darkness claimed the Aegean. The only signs of life were gulls circling to the southeast. Bolin cat-footed from outcropping to outcropping, only showing himself when he had no other choice. The soldier had traveled approximately 200 yards when the wind shifted. It came at him from out of the southeast, and brought with it not only the moist scent of the sea, but the faint odor of cooked food. So the bastards were still there, and if they were busy eating, they likely had no idea that Bolin had landed. He worked his way toward the southeast shoreline. There was no evidence of a fire, but they would be smart enough to hide it. He covered another 200 yards. The aroma of food was so strong, his mouth was watering. He had yet to spot anyone. A moment later, without warning, the rock surface sloped away, and there, 20 yards off, was a brown tent. Beyond, pulled almost entirely out of the water, was the same speedboat he had pursued in Athens. Dropping flat, Bolin scooted back until only his eyes were above the rim. It would be ridiculously easy to cut them down. A sustained burst from the auto rifle or a fragmentation grenade fired into the tent was all it would take. But Bolin had other plans. The two terrorists were unwitting bait. Logic dictated that if they were being picked up, it would be by some of their own kind, either other Al Jabbar members or compatriots. Bolin wanted them all in his crosshairs. He was perfectly content to lie there and wait for whoever was going to show. The flap rustled and outstrode a muscular man with icy features, carrying an unusual slender case. Squatting, he set it in front of him, undid a latch, and opened it. From where Bolin lay, he could see the inside of the lid was actually a computer screen. A laptop of some kind, he guessed. The Arab removed a small satellite dish from a recessed compartment. The dish was no more than ten inches in diameter, with tiny telescoping legs. Unrolling a short cable, the terrorist connected it between the base of the dish and the computer. Next, 
He slid a pencil-thin headphone over his left ear and plugged the jack into the proper port. Bolin had never seen a comlink unit quite like it. It was state-of-the-art, rivaling anything the U.S. military used. The Arab pressed a button and the unit hummed to life. After he tapped a few keys, the small dish slowly began rotating. The man began to talk into the headset. Bolin was impressed. In all the intel gathered on the Al-Jabbar, there was nary a whisper that they were so high-tech. The feds regarded them as another run-of-the-mill fanatical organization, no smarter or more sophisticated than any other. But here was proof to the contrary. It took a lot of know-how and a lot of money to acquire and use a unit like that. The flap parted again. Out stepped a younger man with curly black hair and a cleft chin. He had a tin bowl in his hand, and as he stood there ladling soup into his mouth, he gazed eastward toward the Turkish coast. What do they say, Rakin? Shh! It's difficult enough to hear already. Rakin was trying to raise their Turkish contact. His partner guessed there was a delay of some kind, which didn't sit well with him. Annoyed, he scowled, turned away, and started walking to higher ground, toward the exact spot where Bolan was lying. Malik Sharik was uneasy. He didn't like being stuck on a speck of rock in the empty vastness of sea, nor did he like having only a two-day supply of food and water. If something went wrong, if the man they were counting on to rendezvous with failed to show, they would be stranded. Without fresh water, they wouldn't last a week. Their rotting bodies would lie unclaimed and unhonored to eventually be consumed by crabs and the incessantly noisy gulls. It wasn't a warrior's death. He took a few steps toward the low rise that overlooked their camp, then remembered how treacherous the terrain was and changed his mind. Their campsite was the one spot on the whole wretched island where a man could move about without the damnable rocks cutting into his shoes, his clothes, his flesh. Wheeling, Sharik stared eastward and spooned the last of his soup into his mouth. The packet boasted it was as delicious as homemade, but the broth was tasteless, and the lumps that passed for noodles had the consistency of wet clay. He had much to be unhappy about. High on his list was the debacle in Athens. It was bad enough they failed to kill the vice president. It was bad enough they'd lost two of their own. But to be forced into their contingency plan and flee for their lives was the ultimate indignity. All because of him, the one Sharik had seen in Islamabad the dark-haired demon with the hard face who hounded them incessantly. Somehow he'd found out they were awaiting transport at the warehouse and gotten within a dozen yards of them before they realized it. His shots had been so close, one nicked Sharik's left ear. The mystery man raised many questions. Who was he? How did he always know where they were? Aban Abbas would be furious. Sharik wasn't looking forward to making his report. He was looking forward, though, to getting off that miserable island. Seeing that Rakin had taken his headphones off, Sharik approached him. Well, don't keep it a secret. What did he say? The Turks have stepped up their military patrols along the coast. Hassan cannot leave until midnight. He says to expect him at two in the morning. The sooner we are off this dung heap, the happier I will be. A word to the wise. You must cultivate patience and a deeper faith in the beneficence of God. Sharik's temper flared. He would tolerate a lot of things, but he would not have his faith questioned. I am as dedicated as any member of the Al-Jabbar. I have complete faith that God will see us safely home. Then explain your nervous irritability. A true holy warrior stays calm when beset by adversity. Sharik would have dearly loved to kill the Saudi then and there, but Abbas needed Rakim's money for their cause, which came before all else. You would do better to dwell on how our leader will judge your performance. Your first mission was a dismal failure. Through no fault of mine, there must be a traitor in our midst. How else could the Americans have learned of our plan? Sharik hadn't thought of that. How else indeed? Three times now the American sniper had foiled them. Once could be considered a coincidence, twice could be construed as an extraordinary fluke. But three times definitely pointed to foreknowledge. I have confidence Abbas will learn the traitor's identity. After all, only a handful know about the Athens mission, and two of them are now dead. Interesting, is it not, that this makes the second mission you have been on where we lost brothers in arms? Are you saying I am a traitor? I offered only an observation. Make of it what you will. Sharik stopped and regained control. He wouldn't put it past the Saudi to use his pistol if provoked, and his own weapons were in the tent. 
I have been with Abbas as long as anyone, and I have been on more missions than most. Missions, need I remind you, that succeeded. Maybe so. But it is not for me to pass judgment. It is Abbas and God you must answer to. Sharik had taken all the veiled insults he could stomach. He stormed into the tent, set the tin dish next to the propane stove, and slung the Ameli over his right shoulder. It was a sad state of affairs, he mused, when waging a holy war depended on men like Rakim. Men so petty they were an insult to their exalted cause. He pushed on the flap and went back out. As he straightened, his gaze happened to sweep the rise and drift across it to the sea. An image flashed in his mind, something he had just seen. But it couldn't be. Casually strolling toward the water, Sharik watched the rise out of the corner of one eye. There it was again. Movement. So quick, had he blinked, he'd have missed it. As impossible as it seemed, his eyes hadn't deceived him. Someone was up there, spying on them. Sharik turned and walked toward Rakim. He pretended to be interested in the darkening sky, in the Aegean, in a flock of gulls, in everything except the rise. The Saudi was studying the monitor and didn't look up. Do you think fishermen ever visit this island? I doubt it. Their boats are too big to make it over the reefs. And no one lives here? Look around you, Sharik. Did you ever see a place less fit for human habitation? There is no fresh water, no vegetation of any kind. A person might as well live on the moon. I wonder how Abbas learned of Thinus. Weren't you the one who told me he has contacts all over the Middle East and Mediterranean? Maybe he asked his smuggler friends to suggest somewhere we could escape to in an emergency, and this was it. Why are you bringing all this up? We are not alone. I saw someone watching us. Do not look around or he might grow suspicious. You are seeing things, Sharik. It was a trick of the shadows and nothing more. I tell you, I saw someone. Where? On the north rim. All right, I will humor you. Let me get my gun from the tent. Watch for my signal and we will rush it together. You go right, I will go left. If someone is up there, we will catch them between us. Someone is there, Rakim. A mermaid, perhaps, or a cyclops. <laughs> the Greeks claim these waters were once haunted by all manner of strange creatures. Sharik moved south so the intruder on the rise would suspect nothing. The stars were coming out. It would soon be too dark to see much of anything. Rakim stepped out of the tent, the SMG close to his right leg. He caught Malik's eye and nodded. In concert, their weapons leveled, they crept toward the rise. The executioner was a keen student of body posture. Recognizing a man's stance had given him an edge at crucial moments, such as being behind enemy lines and identifying if a guard was alert or being sloppy. When he was up against a bevy of gunners and needed to know which was apt to fire first, he could even determine whether or not he was being lied to. Body posture spoke volumes. When Sharik had scanned the rise, Bolan had ducked down, waited a few seconds, then raised his head again. The Palestinian was looking away, but there was a certain tension in his posture that hadn't been there before. The man turned as if staring out to sea, but Bolan wasn't fooled. He had flattened again, then started crawling backward. When he had escaped their line of sight, he had risen and loped to the north. He didn't know how long he had before they'd make an approach. And when he had come to a waist-deep recess, he had jumped in and knelt with his back to the pitted rock. They took longer than Bolan thought they would. He saw them advancing over the rim now, the younger Palestinian from the east, the other from the west. They flanked their SMGs back and forth, primed to kill. A minute passed, and the hawk-faced Arab smirked broadly and lowered his HK-53. That seemed to anger the younger Palestinian. The older man flicked a hand in disgust and went back down. Their body language spoke volumes. The older man didn't believe his partner had seen anything. His cheeks reddening, the Palestinian glared and muttered under his breath. He surveyed the island from end to end, then he too pivoted on his heel and disappeared over the rock. Poland stayed put as night's mantle deepened. Soon he could move about freely. Until then, there was no need to press his luck. He would hear if a boat approached and take appropriate action. Relaxing, the soldier propped the M16 beside him. Now was as good a time as any to find out if the cell phone worked. He slid it from its pocket, pressed the on button, and when the display lit up, extended the antenna and tapped in a special number. Ideally, it would link him with the embassy in Athens, and from there his call would be relayed to Brognola. 
On the third ring, a woman answered, but the signal was too weak for Boland to understand what she was saying. He rang off, thinking he would try again later. Stars filled the heavens, but there was no moon. In that regard, Boland lucked out. It was time. A wraith among shadows, he crept toward the camp, circling wide to the east. Lit by a lantern on a stub of rock, the older Arab was at the comlink, typing on the keyboard. The Palestinian was over by the west shore, pacing like an angry leopard. Bolin eased onto his stomach. For more than an hour, he watched and waited, ignoring infrequent growls of hunger from his stomach. More time passed. The Palestinian went into the tent, and another lantern soon glowed within. The other terrorists stayed busy sending and receiving messages until almost midnight, at which point he removed the headset and entered the tent. They both came out a few minutes later and the younger man climbed into the speedboat. He emerged carrying a canvas pouch from which he took four cylinders. Flares, Bolin realized. The Palestinian laid them on the ground but didn't ignite them. Plainly, the pair was getting ready to signal someone. He hoped it would be soon, but the older man sat down and resumed typing and the Palestinian went back into the tent. Another hour passed. By Boland's watch, it was quarter past two when the older man switched off the uplink, replaced the dish and the headset, and closed the case. Soon after, the Palestinian reappeared, and both searched the sky to the east. He made sure the M16's selector lever was set on semi and tucked the stock to his shoulder. The younger man excitedly dashed to the flares, ignited them one by one, and deposited them at ten-yard intervals from south to north. That sound had to be a plane, not a boat. Since there wasn't a safe spot anywhere on the island for one to land, Boland suspected it was a seaplane. It should be close enough to spot, but he couldn't find it. It must have been flying without its running lights. <laughs> a whoop went up from the Palestinian, and he pointed at a star where there hadn't been one a moment ago. The star grew into several lights on a course that would bring them directly over the island. Boland wouldn't make his presence known until the aircraft landed. A few well-placed shots should guarantee it didn't go anywhere while he dealt with its occupants and the terrorists. As it soared overhead, Boland saw pontoons on the bottom. The Palestinian was showing more teeth than a used car salesman, and even his companion appeared happy their deliverance had arrived. Grasping the case, he stepped to the water's edge. The seaplane made a second pass. When it was only 40 yards out, a spotlight stabbed the night, the wide beam washing over Boland. He had no time to hide. The beam swept over him and he was up and running. He threw himself behind a gnarled spine and hugged rock. Heaving onto his knees, Bolin returned fire, but the terrorists had sought cover and the best he could do was momentarily pin them down. The seaplane was executing a tight circle to approach Venus head on. Bent at the waist, Bolin raced to the north. He had gone only about 15 yards when a hole yawned before him. Shit! Too late. Throwing his arms in front of him, he fell four or five feet, doing a belly flop that knocked the breath from his lungs. The grenade went off, the blast like thunder, and stinging chunks of rock rained like hail. Boland's ears rang, and a sharp pang lanced his left eardrum. It took only a minute for the ringing to subside enough for Boland to regain his feet. He brought up the M16, thinking the terrorists were approaching, but they had vanished. Bolin levered up out of the hole and sprinted toward the camp. He reached the rise to discover the boat racing out to meet the seaplane. They weren't quite out of range, but the speedboat was black as pitch, and Bolin couldn't see. Soon the boat was too far out. He had to look on in simmering frustration as the speedboat pulled alongside the seaplane and the terrorists climbed in. Damn it! That's twice now those two have gotten away from me. This is not going to happen again! Aban Abbas was troubled. The latest twists in the road filled him with a special horror. God had forsaken him. A passage from the book gave him great comfort, saying the truth came from God, and among men there should not be doubt. If there was one thing Abbas knew with complete certainty, it was that he was doing God's will. Why then, Abbas puzzled, did these missions fail? An hour ago he had received word from Sharik and Rakin. He'd sequestered himself in his office, trying to make sense of things. He wondered if the fault could be his. Perhaps there had been a flaw in his plan. 
Abbas reviewed it again and again, and each time he came to the same conclusion. The fault lay somewhere else. Exactly where eluded him. Dawn would soon break. The Aljabar's fortress was isolated from the rest of the world. To the west and south were hundreds of kilometers of unforgiving desert. To the east, perhaps a hundred kilometers, was the Indian Ocean. To the north lay the Gulf of Aden. Abbas had chosen the site, after much deliberation, for two reasons. First, it was centrally located, allowing his warriors to reach any given spot in the Middle East quickly. Second, the local government was a hotbed of corruption. As long as he made regular monthly payments to a few important officials, he could operate as he pleased without interference. There were no landlines into the fortress, no phone lines that could be traced. Abbas didn't need them. It was a testament to the marvels of modern technology that he could maintain contact with the outside world and keep abreast of current developments through the latest in satellite TV. Abbas reverently ran his hand over the cover of the Quran. To him, as the Christians would say, the Quran was the holy of holies. His every act was based on its teachings. His every thought was steeped in its wisdom. His childhood ambition had been to share its glory with all the world, not by force of arms, but as a teacher of righteousness. Then came the fateful day when Abbas was twelve years old, and he journeyed to Lebanon with his father, a successful businessman. His father had hoped Abbas would follow in his footsteps, but the world of trade and commerce paled beside the true faith. There, Abbas first encountered unbelievers, namely, American sailors on shore leave. How vividly he remembered the shock of seeing those big, coarse men parade down the street, laughing and swearing and acting as if the city were theirs. In their arms were loose women, in their hands liquor bottles. In broad daylight they did this, in full sight of decent people. <laughs> Fucking A, I shoot the motherfucker in a heartbeat. <laughs> you should all be ashamed of yourselves. Abbas's father was fluent in the language and had insisted Abbas learn it as well. Abbas's heart had leaped into his throat when the Americans halted, and one of them, the biggest and coarsest of the bunch, swaggered over to his father. You talking to us? His eyes were bloodshot and his breath reeked of alcohol. You are making a spectacle. You and your friends would do well to go indoors. Oh, what? You will pour us? You will go ahead. You see if we give a damn. This is our first port of call in eight months, and we're out to have some fun! Besides, we're not doing anything we wouldn't do in our own country. This is not America. You insult every devout Muslim with your blatant debauchery. Abbas thought the sailor might hit his father. What he did was much worse. Oh, big words, pal. Who the hell are you to judge us? Your beliefs don't mean squat to me or my friends. We piss on you, and we piss on your religion. We have the right to do as we damn well please. We're not breaking any goddamn laws. There are higher laws than those of man. Oh, I get it now. You're one of those holier-than-thou types. And we got assholes like you in our own country, walking around with their noses in the air, thinking they're better than everyone else. But I got news for you. You stink when you shit, just like the rest of us. Abbas watched as the big American swaggered back to his companions and listened to their taunts and harsh laughter, his heart burning with the slight on his father and to their faith. He yearned for his father to strike them down. He didn't lift a finger. Motherfucker. The incident gave Abbas much to think about. Until that moment, he hadn't been interested in other lands, other cultures. They had seemed so remote, so alien. In his innocence, he thought they had no bearing on his life or his people. He was wrong. Abbas began studying the ways of the West with a keen intensity his father found alarming. But Abbas was only after knowledge. He wanted to understand why Americans and those like them were the way they were. Why everything about them was so different why they studied a different book and worshipped a different prophet, why they deported themselves like animals and let their women run around half-dressed. The answer eluded Abbas until, in his confusion and bewilderment, he went to ask the one person who would surely know, his teacher. 
he remembered the kindly smile the venerable old man bestowed, and how, after stroking his long white beard, the teacher shared an insight that impacted Abbas's life forever. It is no wonder you cannot find the answer, for he who is to blame goes to great lengths to hide it. The master deceiver does not want his handiwork recognized. He delights in hiding the truth from earnest seekers and in befuddling fools. Americans are not like you and I. They are not children of God. Satan rules their lives and through them seeks to pervert us. The Quran contained many mentions of Satan. The faithful were encouraged to resist his wicked guile and live upright lives. But it had never occurred to Abbas there might be entire countries under Satan's sway. His perspective was altered in that one instant. Do they know this? Of course not. They believe they follow in the steps of God, but that does not make them any less evil. What can we do about them? We must fight against the friends of Satan, Abbas. The foundation was laid. Abbas grew to resent any adverse influences on Muslim culture. He learned there were many who shared his view. To his dismay, few were willing to do anything about it, to oppose those in Satan's thrall. They would pay lip service, and that was all. Not a boss. Early on, he planned to do as his teacher had instructed him, and openly fight for the values he held dear. He became a keen student of current affairs. Only through knowledge could he divine what the enemy was up to and take adequate steps to counter it. Abbas was 27 when his father died. At last able to do as he pleased and with enough money to live comfortably, he had traveled extensively, meeting others of a similar bent. He was with the PLF 18 months, with Hamas two years, with Hezbollah four. And all the while he was learning, adding to his store of knowledge and acquiring the skills that would serve him in good stead when he started his own organization. Breaking from his reverie, Abbas used the remote to turn on the television in the corner of the office. We have learned there was an attempt to kill the American vice president in Greece to address the European terrorism summit. American officials have refused to release details as yet, but we are about to go live with News Times Athens bureau chief Morton Collins, who broke the story. Mr. Collins, can you hear me? I can hear you. Will you recap what you know so far? <coughs> A four-man terrorist cell tried to kill the vice president yesterday. Two were killed, although by whom is not exactly clear yet. Is it true that terrorists were members of the organization known as the Al-Jabbar? Aban Abbas felt the blood drain from his face. According to my sources, yes. The Al-Jabbar has never attempted anything this big before. Their last known activity was in Pakistan, you might recall, where they uh, tried to murder the American ambassador and failed. Abbas gripped the Quran so tightly his fingers hurt. The world would think of them as incompetent bumblers. The operation was doomed from the start. The two who escaped barely got away with their lives after a running gun battle in the harbor. Greek authorities deserve to be complimented for how swiftly they responded to the threat. To be fair, the terrorists really never had a chance. Our side knew about the attempt well in advance. Uh, how's that, Mr. Collins? I've learned our government intercepted information that forewarned them of the attack. The vice president has Echelon to thank for saving his life. Perhaps the same can be said of the ambassador in Pakistan. Echelon? There have been rumors floating around about it for years. I had no reason to take any of them seriously until I investigated this incident. Echelon is a global surveillance system put in place by the U.S. and some of its allies to intercept telephone, email, fax, and telex communications. I have in my possession certain documentation some of it based on classified information, so I'm not at liberty to cite my source. So you're saying the government knew what the al Jabbar was up to beforehand? That's exactly what I'm saying. A major echelon facility is located in the Mediterranean, not far from where I'm standing. In fact... Enough! Out of the mouths of simpletons, Abbas thought, his insides churning. He had never heard of this echelon before. If what the buffoon was saying was true, there was only one thing to do. Jabal! The young Lebanese man entered and dutifully bowed. Have everyone gather in the courtyard. Ten brothers will be chosen to accompany me on a trip. We are going to Athens. Southeast of Izmir, Turkey, lay dry, rocky country better suited to mountain goats than human habitation. 
Tiray was the largest town of any consequence, located some 25 miles inland from the Aegean Sea. On the coast itself was Kildana, a town so small it wasn't found on most maps. The population stood at 62. And every one of them, according to Hal Brognola, would gladly stick a knife in the back of a government official or foreigner who came snooping around. Kildana's history was unique. What started as a safe haven for pirates back in the days of Henry Every and Edward England evolved into a den of smugglers. The residents had made their living on the shady side of the law ever since. Between 1900 and 1950, the Turkish government tried several times to finish off the practice, with no more success than trying to stamp out a forest fire with bare feet. Hard evidence was hard to come by. Gildana's residents were as tight-lipped as clams, and their clients were reluctant to talk to prosecutors. Those who did invariably disappeared. Nowadays, Ankara turned a blind eye to the town. So long as the smugglers didn't draw unwanted attention, they were left to their own illicit devices. Mac Boland learned all this while aboard a patrol boat bearing him from Thenis to the Turkish coast. Fortunately for him, his cell phone had made contact the second time, and Brognola arranged for the Turkish Navy to pick him up. Ten hours later, the boat was approaching the coastline. Luck had been with them. A Turkish air patrol had spotted a seaplane cruising landward at sea level in the wee hours of the morning and demanded the aircraft identify itself. The pilot was one Hassan Orgay, who claimed he was on his way home from a pleasure jaunt to Crete. The pilot reported it to his superiors and they ordered him to let the seaplane continue but to shadow the aircraft to its destination, Kildana. A flyover an hour earlier established the seaplane was still there, moored to a dock. Satellite surveillance indicated no other planes or boats had left in the intervening hours. Boland believed the two the Aljabar terrorists were waiting to leave under cover of darkness. It was a long shot, but he might be able to slip in and find them. He had to be careful not to be caught, or the townspeople would see to it he never left their town alive. Boland was preparing his gear. As he closed his duffel, a shadow fell over him. Good day. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Pamir. About ready to depart, I see, Mr. Velasco. For your own safety, we must let you over the side a kilometer north of Kildana. The sea is rough today, and it'll be difficult to reach the shore in a raft. I'll manage. Yes, I believe you will. Once you push off, we will continue down the coast to cement the illusion of a routine patrol. If God smiles on our endeavor, Kildana's inhabitants will be so interested in us, they'll never blink at you. My orders are to swing back around and be at the retrieval point by 7 p.m. Will that give you enough time? It'll have to do. Boland straightened and adjusted his trench coat over his casual shirt and pants. Pamir's brown eyes twinkled in amusement. Those are what you are wearing? They're the only clothes I have with me. Why? Gildana is a backwater region. Clothes like that would make you... How do you Americans say it? Stick out like a sore thumb. With your consent, I will ask among the crew and see if I cannot find you more suitable attire. Go ahead. Bolin appreciated the officer's help. It was best to blend in as much as possible if he was to get in and out of the smuggler's den with a minimum of trouble. Pamir walked off, and Bolin stepped to the front of the bridge and gazed across the forward deck. The patrol boat was a Yildiz class FPB-57. She had the contours of a pocket destroyer. Four diesels could propel her at up to 37 knots. Her armament included four harpoon missiles, a 35mm anti-aircraft gun, and two 7.62mm machine guns. The crew complement was 45, not counting officers. At the moment, the patrol boat was cruising at 20 knots, her bow pointed landward. Turkey's rugged shoreline stretched the length of the eastern horizon, as yet merely a dark line against the backdrop of blue sky. In a surprisingly short time, Pamir returned. He had with him a pair of baggy brown pants, a plain beige shirt, ratty shoes, and a coat that had seen better days. Wear these, and you'll look just like a native. From one of the coat's pockets, he slid a wool cap. Many men in this region wear these. Pull it low over your ears, keep your chin low, and you might be able to pass for a Turk. Bolin accepted the clothes and headed for his compartment to change. Since he couldn't very well traipse around Kildana with the M16 or the MP5 slung over his shoulder, he had to leave them behind, along with most of his other weapons from his duffel. As the soldier dressed, he mentally reviewed a map Pamir had shown him earlier. North of Kildana were low hills out of which flowed a stream that bordered the town on the east and was its primary source of drinking water. 
Past the stream lay a narrow plain that wound inland toward a high plateau. To the south were woods broken by deep ravines. By modern standards, Kildana was backward, even primitive. A single main street was hemmed by old buildings packed close to one another. According to Pamir, there were few cars and no street lights, and appliances were as rare as law-abiding citizens. The people of Kildana were clannish and highly suspicious of strangers. A few years back, the government sent in an undercover operative to try to infiltrate the smuggling fraternity. A month later, a sealed barrel showed up on the steps of an Izmir police station. The operative had been found inside, in pieces. Bolin examined himself in the mirror. He was taller than the average Turk and had to remember to slouch while moving about. He also had to avoid eye contact. Blue-eyed natives weren't unheard of, but it wasn't likely there were many among the smugglers. The dark line on the horizon was now a well-defined coast. Towering mountains were silhouetted in sharp relief inland. The patrol boat was making toward a series of low hills to the southeast, spray hissing over the bow. Bolin joined Pamir at the starboard rail. Four crewmen were busy inflating a raft. We are eight to ten minutes out. We must let you down on the seaward side in case they have spotters watching from the shore. I suggest you lie flat and wait five minutes before you start paddling. By then we will be well away and they will be less likely to notice you. If they do, they do. Mr. Belasco, I wonder if you truly realize what you are getting yourself into. These are not normal people. They are relics from a time when violence was a part of daily life. They are not, how you say, in their right minds. I have a job to do. I admire your sense of duty. I hope it does not get you killed. I would not do what you are doing, and I am a native. You don't even speak our language. Bolin shrugged. He didn't speak Chinese, Pakistani, Kurdish, or any of a dozen other languages, but that had never stopped him from doing what needed to be done. A word to the wise. Do not stare at any of the women. Their men will take it as a slight and kill you on the spot. There are no police, so you cannot expect help from that quarter. There is no mosque either, which gives you some idea of how religious the people are. The raft was almost ready. Pamir shook Bolin's hand in parting and excused himself to the bridge. The boat reduced speed and changed its heading to a more southerly course. They were running parallel to the coast, far enough out that anyone watching through binoculars wouldn't be able to see what they were doing. The crew dragged the raft to the rail, ropes were attached, the paddles placed inside. The four crewmen swiftly lowered the raft over the side and down into the sea. One of them nodded at Bolin. Grabbing hold of a rope, he slid his legs over the rail and descended hand under hand, his feet braced against the hull. The raft had drifted a few yards out. To reach it, Bolin pushed off and swung lightly down. Kneeling, he untied the ropes at both ends, grasped a paddle and moved another dozen yards off to be well in the clear. Pamir was on the flying bridge. He gave a crisp salute. Bolin returned it, then lay on his side and twisted his wrist to see his watch. When five minutes had passed, he rose on his knees and began paddling. The water was calmer than it had been all day, which made for easy work, but it also made it simple for anyone to spot him from the shore. He didn't like being exposed, but it couldn't be helped. A cove ringed partially by bluffs offered a secluded landing spot. Bolin pulled the inflatable in among a cluster of boulders and headed inland. He saw no one. Birds and insects were the only wildlife, although he did spy a few deer tracks. Half a mile in, he came to the stream and followed it south. Next stop, Kildana. A private jet landed at Athens International Airport late in the afternoon. Security was tight and the 11 passengers were under close scrutiny. They were members of a Somalia trade delegation on their way to Switzerland. Their credentials were in order and their luggage cleared customs without mishap. The spokesman for the group was a friendly young woman whose fluency in Greek impressed the officials questioning her, as did her beauty. She was turning heads, so lovely was her face, so lustrous her hair. The Greeks positively fawned over her. The head of the trade delegation was a big man going gray at the temples. He didn't speak Greek, but he was as friendly as the woman and answered all questions with a candor the customs officials found refreshing. Some of the delegation members seemed somewhat nervous, but that was par for the course. 
No one liked to be interrogated or have their bags inspected. Rented vehicles whisked the delegation to the Acropolis Hotel. They took four adjoining rooms on the same floor, 303 through 306. Leaving their luggage unpacked, all eleven gathered in 303 so the leader could address them. Well done, my brothers. Jamila, you are outstanding as always. Your aptitude for languages never ceases to impress. Now, the next phase must unfold without a hitch. Jebel, you will drive. Barak and Yassin, you will come with us. The rest of you will stay here. Do not answer the phone. Do not answer the door. We will not be more than an hour. Malik and Rakin will not be joining us. I contacted them and told them to stay put until further notice. Hassan will fly them anywhere I need them to go. Let us be on our way. The office building they sought was in the heart of downtown Athens. A sign in front listed the tenants, among them News Time Incorporated. A boss handed Jamila his cell phone and a slip of paper with the number they wanted. As they had rehearsed, she knew just what to say. Hello? May I speak with Mr. Morton Collins? Tell him it is in regard to the recent attempt on the Vice President's life. Uh, Mr. Collins? Uh, I saw you on the news. I have information for you. The Greek government has uncovered the identities of the two terrorists. Are you interested in learning more? Abbas had chosen the lure the journalist couldn't resist. Now all Jamila had to do was reel him in. I hear that news organizations occasionally pay for such information. How much is this worth for you? Oh, yes, that is a fair amount. No, I would prefer not to meet you at your office. There is a restaurant one block east of where you work. Would that be satisfactory? Yes, that's the one. Can you meet me there in, say, five minutes? You can? Thank you. I promise you will not be disappointed. He's on his way. Barak, Yassin. I will roll down my window and distract him. Get him into the car as quickly as you can. Then he is ours. They watched the wide, bronze-gilded double doors to the building's lobby. Not two minutes later, out bustled the person Abbas had seen on CNN, shrugging into a jacket. He carried a briefcase. Quickly, Abbas rolled down his window. Mr. Collins, we would very much like a word with you. Who are you? Jamila leaned forward and beamed her sweetest smile. We spoke on the phone. I've changed my mind about the restaurant. Please get in and I will explain. By then, Barak and Yassin were on either side of him. They each took an arm to guide him into the back seat. If he suspected any funny business, he didn't give any sign of it. I have to say, this is most irregular. Why the cloak and dagger business? Abbas snapped his fingers and the car pulled from the curb. The driver was instructed to maintain the speed limit. Where are you taking me? Shouldn't you introduce your friends here? Oh, Mr. Collins, introductions are not necessary, except in my case. I am Aban Abbas, leader of the Al Jabbar. Perhaps you've heard of us? Collins' eyes grew as wide as dinner plates. He went pale, and his knuckles wrapped around the briefcase handle grew white. You're joking! What would the Al Jabbar want with me? I'm not one of consequence. <laughs> you underestimate your value. I have traveled a considerable distance to make your acquaintance. A friend of ours has rented a house on the outskirts of the city. Once we arrive, everything will be made clear. You're not gonna hurt me, are you? Of course not. Since when do we kill journalists? All we want is information. Collins said nothing else. He constantly gnawed on his lower lip and glanced at the back doors, considering whether to make a break for freedom. He never did. When they arrived at the house, Collins was ushered inside. Sheets covered most of the furniture, and a layer of dust showed the house hadn't been occupied in months. Is this one of your safe houses? We have never been here before, and once our business is concluded, we will never come here again. Make yourself comfortable. This should not take too long. Clutching the briefcase with both hands, he slowly sat. Now, I give you my word I will never tell the authorities about this place, or about your being in Greece. Of that, we are certain. Abbas removed the sheets covering two chairs and swung them around so they faced one another. Abbas took a seat, and Collins was made to sit in the other. Before we begin, I want to impress on you the need for your complete cooperation. Break the little finger on his left hand. Bending, the henchman pinned Collins's arms. 
The newsman was so startled, he dropped the briefcase and tried to wrench free, but his strength was no match for theirs. Hey, 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 what are you doing? No, 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 please, please, ah! Calm down, American, or I will have them break another one. Why? In God's name, why? You supply your own answer, in God's name, as in everything we do. It is an object lesson. Answer my questions truthfully, or have a finger broken each time I suspect you of lying. The choice is yours. Now, I would learn more about this echelon you spoke of on the television. Is that all? Hell, you could have gone to the internet and learned all there is to know. There's no need to put me through this. Ah, <sighs> break the little finger on his other hand. Yassine went to grab it, but Collins wasn't the complete coward the boss had supposed. <laughs> the journalist butted his forehead against Yassine's temple, dazing him, and almost caused Yassine to lose his hold. Collins fought to rise. Yassine and Barak were hard-pressed to hold him down. Abbas had seen enough. Rising, he walked over, gripped the finger he had chosen. No more, please! Anything you want, I'll do! Very well. We will try again. But I warn you, my patience is at an end. If breaking your fingers is not inducement enough, there are other means of persuading you. Infinitely worse means. I'll behave! I'll promise! Ask away, please. You mentioned in your interview that you had gained access to classified information about Echelon. That's true. Where did you obtain this information, Mr. Collins? I, I, several sources. An American CIA operative, a Greek general, and a highly placed official at the American Embassy, with contacts at the Department of Defense. So in your estimation, the information is valid? In my opinion, yes. But bear in mind, I never received any cooperation from my government. They would hardly confirm secrets they did not want disclosed. Jamila, hand me the Kerr's briefcase. When she deposited it on his lap, he pressed the appropriate buttons to release the two latches, but nothing happened. He noticed the lock beside each latch. Do you have the key? On a key ring in my right front pants pocket. Yasin, bring it to me. In that same interview, you mentioned an Echelon site located somewhere in the Mediterranean. Where exactly would that be? Cyprus. I said exactly. Ayos Nikolaos Cyprus. It's all there in the briefcase, in the manila folder on the top. And so it was. Abbas thumbed through dozens of neatly typed pages, complete with maps and diagrams. The Cyprus installation was but one of many around the globe. Something caught Abbas's eye and he read aloud. The Cyprus site is of special importance because of its proximity to the Middle East and Northern Africa. It is ideally situated to intercept transmissions from numerous satellites serving those regions as well as Europe. So I was told, what else do you want to know? Anything my file doesn't cover, I'm sure I can get for you. There is just one thing. Where is Echelon based? There must be a headquarters, somewhere the other sites report to. Some place the American government collects all the information. Fort Meade, Maryland. What does it matter? Your organization's focus has always been assassination. What do you care about a bunch of eavesdropping equipment? I care a great deal when that equipment was used to thwart two of my operations, and when it cost me the lives of four holy warriors. There's not much you can do. No one gets near an echelon site. They're secure as Fort Knox. <laughs> Even Fort Knox can be destroyed if one is clever enough. I thank you for the information you have provided, Mr. Collins, and for showing me the grave mistake I made. <clears throat> mistake? What mistake? It was wrong of me to limit our targets to individuals. I see now we should devote our energies to crippling the great devil in other ways, such as crippling your country's ability to spy on the rest of the world. You can't be serious. I have never been more serious about anything in my life. What are you doing? Your usefulness is at an end, I'm afraid. Hold him down. Wait! God, no! There's no need! I, t I told you I'll keep quiet! That you will. Have you ever seen a man strangled to death, Mr. Collins? It is not a pleasant sight. Certainly not one you would forget. How fortunate for you that you can experience it. First time. <laughs> His face grew blood red. Making one last attempt to save himself, he jerked about violently. 
The tip of his tongue jutted between his lips, and his eyes began to bulge. His movements grew weaker. A final convulsion, and the deed was done. Dispose of this filth. Malik Sharik faced the dock at Kildana as he had done the rocky shore of Thenus. He was anxious to hear from Abbas so he and Rakim could get out of there. The town wasn't to his liking. It had a sinister air about it that grated on his nerves. A gloomy atmosphere that had more to do with its inhabitants than the few clouds scuttling overhead. Sharik tried to tell himself he was imagining things. He gazed across the sunlit Aegean and up at the blue sky, and all seemed right with the world. Then he turned and was confronted by the cold stares of the dozen or so Turks lining the dock. Many had guns, and all had wicked curved daggers sheathed under their belts. Relax, will you? Abbas will contact us when he is ready. It's not that, Rakin. Hassan, you were gone long enough. Hassan Orge. A greasy slab of a man with a moon face and yellow teeth, Orge was only slightly less hostile than the rest of Kildana's populace. Food does not grow on trees. Lacerda, Midia Dormase, Cigara Borge. You know I don't speak Turkish. I have salted fish strips, stuffed mussels, and pastries. Sharik spun. Icy fingers clawed his chest at the sight of a Turkish patrol boat. His panic subsided when he realized it was bearing from north to south, and he let out a breath he hadn't known he was holding. Strange. The next patrol is not due until tomorrow afternoon. The Navy lets you know their schedule, do they? We have our sources, Palestinian. How else did you think we elude their boat so easily? Hmm. This one is not on patrol. It is up to something else. Maybe your government suspects we are here. If that were so, the patrol boat would be steaming toward this dock. Orge tossed the sack to Rakim. Fill your bellies while I go talk with my people. Wait, Orge. What if our leader calls while you are gone and wants us to fly out right away? You did not mind my leaving to fetch food. This is much more important. We must post sentries and send a man with binoculars to the top of the nearest hill. All because a patrol boat went by? My people have not lasted as long as they have by taking our enemies lightly. If the government is up to something, if they try to infiltrate us as they have in the past, whoever they send will regret it. We will chop them to pieces and feed them to our dogs. The executioner followed the stream north until he came to the last of the low hills. The afternoon was hot, humid. Sweat trickled from under the woolen cap Lieutenant Commander Pamir had lent him as he hiked toward the top to study the layout of Kildana. Halfway up, a sweet odor brought him to a halt. Crouching, Bolin scoured the crest and saw puffs of smoke rising on the sluggish breeze. He crept higher, his right hand on the beretta. Soon he came to a gully that effectively hid him until he reached the top. A sentry had been posted, an old man whose hair and beard were flecked with gray. He was seated on a flat boulder, a Turkish-made 9mm Racine Favor SMG across his lap. As best Bolin could remember, it was a hybrid model based on a French design. Although the Turkish army used them for a number of years, the Racine Favor never saw widespread use because the firing mechanism was considered too complicated. The old Turk was puffing contentedly on a pipe while scrutinizing the countryside to the northwest. A rock the size of Bolin's fist was perfect for his purpose. Clutching it in his right hand, he stalked out of the gully. A glance to his left showed the tops of buildings and a few people moving along the dusty main street. He had to stay low or someone else might spot him. Moving with stealth long born of experience, the soldier came within an arm's length of the old Turk and raised the rock to strike. The sentry chose that moment to take the pipe from his mouth and elevate his arms to stretch. In doing so, he turned his head a fraction, just enough to spot Bolin. Instantly, the soldier swung, displaying surprising agility for someone his age, dodging the blow and vaulting to his feet. He grabbed the Racine Favor. Suddenly, Bolin found himself staring down the muzzle of the SMG. 
He slammed the rock against the barrel, swatting the weapon aside at the exact split second the old man squeezed the trigger and sprang to the right to avoid the spray of lead sure to tear up the hilltop. No shots rang out. In his haste, the Turk had neglected to flick the fire selector switch. The safety was on. Realizing his mistake, the old man clawed at the switch to remedy it. Bolin was faster. <laughs> Stepping in close, he smashed the rock against the Racine Favor's wooden pistol grip, knocking the subgun from the Turk's grasp, then pivoted and delivered a backhand swipe at the man's temple. The Turk ducked. Before Bolin could swing again, he produced a wicked curved dagger. The blade gleamed in the light as the old man streaked it in a glittering arc, meant to disembowel. Bolin sprang back, saving himself. He grabbed for the Beretta, but another swing of the dagger thwarted him, nearly taking off several fingers in the process. The old man was wily enough to know he had to press hard if he was to prevail, and that was exactly what he did. Weaving a tapestry of slices through the air, he didn't give Bolin a moment's respite. The executioner couldn't dodge forever. The Beretta was his best bet, but its sound suppressor wasn't attached. The shots would be heard, bringing more smugglers. Bolin was nothing if not adaptable. Skipping to the left to avoid a thrust at his ribs, he threw the rock with all his strength at the old Turk's right knee. The old man doubled over in agony. Before he could straighten, Bolin delivered an uppercut that caught the Turk on the jaw and lifted him clear off his feet. The dagger went flying from bony fingers as the old man smacked to the ground, unconscious. Squatting, Bolin cut strips from the man's loose-fitting shirt, bound the man's wrists and ankles, and applied a gag. Ejecting the Racine Favor's magazine, he tossed the SMG down the slope, and a few seconds later sent the dagger skittering after it. Then, on his belly, he crawled to where he could look out over the den of iniquity harboring the terrorists. Kildana was everything Pamir claimed. Ancient, shadowy, ominous, a pall of quiet hung over the town. Most of the houses were box-like affairs with flat roofs and small windows, built so close together there was barely room to walk between them. A lone jeep parked a block from the moor was the only visible transportation, other than the seaplane and several boats. The dock itself was deserted. Bolin saw two women walking along a narrow side street. Although many Turkish women had long since adopted Western attire, these two wore old-fashioned burkas and were carrying buckets. At the junction with the main street, they turned toward the stream. Sliding backward until it was safe to stand, Bolin headed down the north side of the hill. At the bottom, he worked around until he was in sight of the long dock and the seaplane. It was a tactical mistake for the terrorists to leave their most valuable link to the outside world unattended, and he wasn't one to let an opportunity to sabotage the aircraft slip by. Several shacks were situated at the near end. Shoving his hands into his pockets and tucking his chin to his chest so no one could get a good look at his face, Bolin brazenly strode into the open. Although his natural impulse was to run, he resisted the urge. Should anyone be watching, it would only arouse suspicion. Bolin had just reached the first shack when the door to a large building fifty yards away opened and outfiled over a dozen stern-faced Turks. They were tough-looking, rough-hewn men, predators like those Bolin had encountered in countless other countries, hard men who would give no quarter. Each carried an auto-rifle or an SMG. Pairing off, they spread out and moved into Kildana. Bolin didn't know what to make of it. They couldn't know he was there, so the logical conclusion had to be they were after someone else. One pair walked to the seaplane to stand guard. He drew the Beretta, reached into his coat pocket for the silencer, and threaded it onto the barrel. Holding down the grip in front of the trigger guard, he adopted a two-handed stance and was on the verge of banging off a three-round burst when the door to the same building opened again and out came three stragglers. One was a Turk with a craggy moon face that would give children nightmares. The others were more familiar, the young Palestinian and the older man from Thenus. Bolin tried to take aim, but they turned the far corner and were gone before he could fire. Moments later, the jeep's engine cranked over. Bolin wondered if the terrorists were waiting for the cover of dark to fly out. Maybe they intended to travel overland to Izmir or Ankara and book passage on a conventional flight. Bolin couldn't let them get away, not again. Lowering the Beretta, he held it under his coat and walked toward the rear of the buildings on the north side of town. Neither of the Turks by the seaplane noticed. One was gazing out to the sea, the other focused on a cigarette. 
Boland darted into a gap barely wider than his shoulders and sprinted to the front. The jeep was across the street. A Turk was at the wheel. Another was climbing in. The terrorists were gone. The driver pulled out, heading east. Rattling across the wooden bridge over the stream, it sped inland in a cloud of dust. The terrorists still had to be somewhere in Kildana. All Boland had to do was find them. He began to retrace his steps, then drew up short. A heavy-set woman was at the far end, peering in at him. Thanks to her veil, Boland couldn't see her face. He braced for an outcry, but after staring for a few moments, she waddled off, perhaps to inform some of the men she had seen a stranger. Boland hurried to the opening. The smart thing was to leave, but a voice gave him pause. He looked out and saw the heavy-set woman talking to two others. She was gesturing excitedly at the gap. The next instant, they started toward it. Whirling, Bolin hastened to the main street. He ducked around the corner before the woman could spot him and slid into a recessed doorway. Farther down was a pair of stone-faced Turks, their backs to him. Across the way, another duo was going from building to building. He glanced toward the dock and saw four more by the boats. Pulling his hat low, Bolin walked eastward. His skin prickled as he heard the door open and more footsteps, but they moved away from him. Up ahead, a side street appeared. Bolin had to pass several doorways to reach it. The door was open, and two small girls and a boy were playing inside. He had come on them so quietly, he'd spooked them. Bolin kept on walking. One more house, and he would reach the side street where there were fewer people. Suddenly, he was overcome with a feeling of being watched. Bolin glanced back, but no one was behind him. Nor were the men down the street looking in his direction. He was about to chalk it up to his imagination when he caught sight of a woman in a deep blue burqa across the street. Her face was hidden by a veil, but there was no doubt she had taken an undue interest in what he was up to. To his rear, feet scuffed the ground. The boy had stepped outside and was studying him intently. It took every iota of willpower Boland possessed to continue to stroll along as if he had every right to be there. Without warning, another woman stepped from her doorway. She was the first female he had seen whose face wasn't covered. In her 80s, she had leathery skin seamed with lines and cracks. Her thin lips twisted in a perpetual frown. She turned toward him and stopped dead in surprise. Bolin went to go around her, but the crone gripped his sleeve and addressed him in Turkish. Heman, Olga, Heman! Smiling, he tugged loose and continued on, but the harm had been done. Her dark eyes narrowed. A gnarled finger rose to point accusingly. It was a warning cry, one taken up by the woman in the window across the street. Leaning out, she pointed at Bolin and vented a trilling screech louder than the crones. Every man with an earshot had spun. Others rushed from buildings, bringing guns to bear. Shit. Bolin whipped out the Beretta. He fired three round bursts into a pair of men on his side of the street and shifted to do the same to a pair on the other side, but they were already seeking cover. Starting toward the intersection, he felt a stinging pain in his right shoulder. The crone was trying to kill him. She had drawn one of those curved daggers the Turks were so fond of, but her first swing merely nicked him. Now she came at him with a vengeance, thrusting and slashing and trilling all the while. Bolin backstepped, staying a half step ahead of her flashing blade. He didn't want to hurt the old woman if he could help it, but she left him no choice. Inadvertently, he backed against the house, and she was on him before he could skip aside, her dagger thirsting for his throat. He shot her between the eyes. More women were leaning out of windows or had dashed from the doorways to point and trill in inhuman chorus. Some of the men began to fire on the fly, their slugs zinging dangerously close. And as if that weren't enough, the boy he'd seen earlier flew at him, a sharpened stick hiked overhead to stab. The hairs on the back of the warrior's neck tingled as he realized it wasn't just the men he had to contend with. Every last person in Gildana, every woman and child, was now out to kill him. Bolin sidestepped the boy's rush and kicked him in the gut. It dropped the kid in his tracks and he fell to his knees. But then, pointing fiercely at Bolin, he opened his mouth and trilled like the women. Into the side street charged a burly Turk leveling an Uzi. Bolin rotated on the balls of his feet and headed for the hills. 
But the three women he had seen earlier, the heavyset one and her friends, were at the other end of the side street, brandishing daggers. Spreading out at arm's length so he couldn't get past them, they swept toward him. He shot two who got too close, shot another trying to stab him from the side. The soldier veered toward the buildings on the south side of the street. The mission had gone to hell. It was kill or be killed. Eliminating the terrorists had become secondary to making it out of Kildana alive. At the moment, that prospect was exceedingly slim. Shifting from right to left, he fired at those posing the greatest threat. More than two dozen townspeople were converging on him. Bullet after bullet pockmarked the building he was racing toward. A young woman who rushed out of the front door was turned into a sieve by withering fire from her own people. Miraculously, Bolin reached the entrance unscathed and rushed inside. Crouching against the wall, he ejected the Beretta's magazine, slapped home another, and flipped the fire selector to single shot. Then, drawing the Desert Eagle, he rose with a gun in each hand and backed into a shadowed corner. Trying to flee was pointless. There were too many, and they were too close. He had to make a stand. Caught up in a frenzy of raw savagery, the Turks poured into the house after him. Bolin triggered shots as fast as targets presented themselves. The first five through the doorway spilled to the floor, partially blocking it, forcing those who came through after them to scramble over the bodies. With ambidextrous precision, Bolin squeezed off round after round. Bodies filled the doorway, and still the smugglers and their women fought to break through. The soldier had a major tactical edge. The Turks were charging from bright sunlight into a murky room, and it took their eyes several seconds to adjust. Seconds he denied them. Those with guns sprayed lead wildly as they burst in, and the slugs came nowhere near him. Suddenly, the attack ceased. The bedlam died. Bolin reloaded both weapons. Ten feet from him lay a woman in a spreading scarlet pool. Her veil had come partially undone, revealing a young, attractive face, so serene in death it lent the illusion she was asleep. A twinge of conscience spiked him. Even though he learned long ago that the female of the species was as deadly as the male, he rarely had to kill women. There was a part of him, deep down, that regretted doing so. He had to remind himself that if any of them got close enough, they would gladly slit his throat. Bolin crept toward a front window and cautiously peered out. The street was deserted. He looked toward the dock and as far to the east as he could, but the mob had dispersed. They were up to something, and it would be foolish to stay there and find out what it was. He turned toward the front door and froze. Four men were emerging from a building down the street. One had a rocket launcher over a shoulder. Whirling, Bolin ran deeper into the house. The next room was the kitchen. Beyond was a narrow hall leading to a pair of small bedrooms. There was no back door. Fuck! Reasoning there had to be another way out, he returned to the kitchen and pushed aside a tapestry covering the left-hand wall. A side door. He was about to open it when he noticed whispering on the other side. They were out there, waiting for him to show himself. Bolin was trapped. Any moment now, the men in the street would fire the rocket launcher. It had looked like an old German-made PZF-44. The Panzerfaust, Bolin recalled, used a shaped charge warhead, 80 millimeters or larger, capable of reducing the house to rubble. If he retreated to the bedrooms, he would be spared the brunt of the blast, but the roof or one of the walls might still come crashing down on top of him. Better, he believed, to take his chances with the Turks waiting outside. From outside, the door flung open. There was no sign of the soldier. One of four waiting Turks looked to his comrades. Nasty blade at the ready, he took a step towards the doorway. The hand arced out from behind the door and seized him. Bolin spun the man where he stood and used him as a human shield, taking every shot that was intended for his own flesh. From the captive's armpit, he dispatched the other three in quick succession and finished by snapping his defender's neck. Bolin raced toward the rear. The men in the main street were bound to have heard, and sure enough, when he reached the corner and glanced back, they were at the other end. The Turk with the PZF-44 was sighting down the launcher tube. Extending the Desert Eagle, Bolin fired twice into the man's sternum. The Turk staggered back, the launcher's muzzle dipping at the very instant the trigger mechanism was squeezed. He landed hard on his stomach and protectively threw his hands over his head. Debris pelted down, 
chunks and bits of building and clods of dirt, along with grisly pieces of flesh. The rocket had gone to ground in the midst of the group. He stayed flat until the unnatural rain ended, then rose to his knees. Beside him lay half an arm. A few feet away were several toes attached to a pulpy strand of flesh. Heaving upright, Boland jogged toward the sea. He had several blocks to go. At any second, he expected more Turks to come rushing after him, but none did, nor did he hear any voices. A new sound broke the stillness, one that spurred the soldier into running afresh. He came to a side street and leveled his weapon, but the street was empty. Another fifty yards and Bolin would reach the dock. Bolin knew what he would see when he cleared the last building, and he fought down a rising tide of frustration. The seaplane was heading out into the Aegean, rapidly gaining speed. It was already out of range. He could only stand and watch as the pontoons lifted into the air and the aircraft banked to the south. The terrorists had gotten away. Again. God damn it! Bolin hoped the Turkish Air Force tracked the seaplane to its destination. His back to the wall of the last house, he sidled to the main street. It was still deserted. For Bolin to remain in Kildana was pointless. It was hours to the rendezvous, and he would rather wait out on the sea than here, where every hand was turned against him. Accordingly, he sidestepped toward the boats. A lean figure was momentarily silhouetted on a nearby roof, but ducked from sight before Bolin could tell whether it was a man or a woman. Another Turk appeared in a doorway farther down the street, spotted him, and melted into the shadows. Of the three boats, the one Bolin liked most was a souped-up powerboat fitted with a twin diesel. It was equipped with sonar and a variety of high-tech hardware used for eluding detection. The key was missing, but that didn't stop him. Prudently keeping an eye on the town, he quickly hotwired the ignition and moved to cast off. Suddenly, the figure on the roof reappeared. It was a woman holding a small child to her bosom. She shook a fist, raised her head to the heavens, and cried out as if appealing to God to strike him dead. Bolin removed the mooring lines, gripped the wheel, and carefully edged the powerboat from the dock. Once in the clear, he opened the throttle. He thought maybe some of the smugglers would rush out of hiding, hop in the other boats and give chase, but they didn't. His last sight of Kildana was its corpse-littered streets. Cyprus hadn't changed much since Saban Abbas was there last. Located 40 miles south of Turkey, the island was famed for its rugged mountains, picturesque beaches, and old hilltop castles. It was also noted for the long, festering dispute between the Turks and the Greeks over who should exercise control. Not so widely known was the fact a third party had a vested interest in Cyprus. Until 1960, the island had been part of the British Empire. When the Britons signed the treaty that created the Republic of Cyprus, they shrewdly insisted on a provision granting them perpetual sovereignty over two key military installations. The sovereign base areas, as they became known, were a strategic link to the Mideast and Africa. One was in eastern Cyprus and called, fittingly enough, the Eastern Sovereign Base. The other, the Western Sovereign Base, including the garrison at Episcopi, interested Abbas more. According to information provided by the late Mort Collins, hidden behind the facility's high walls was the Echelon Station responsible for the failure of the Al Jabbar's holy missions. Operated under the purview of the National Security Agency, the site was considered part of the Joint Signal Service Unit and protected around the clock by British soldiers. Penetrating their security would be a challenge, but Abbas was supremely confident that he could do anything. Playing the part of a tourist, Abbas had Jamila rent a car. With Barak and Yassin along, they made a circuit of the base perimeter. At one point, the road came within 300 yards of the wall. Beyond it were three huge white ray domes, spherical covers used to conceal large parabolic antennae, along with an open array of rod antennae and rhombic-shaped antennae. Abbas pointed at a two-story building midway between the ray domes. That is what we want, Jamila, the Echelon Command Center. We will hit it tonight, two o'clock. The ten of us against an entire military base? 
You know I would follow you to the gates of hell, but this... The barracks are at the other end, and most of the soldiers will be asleep. All that need concern us are the few guards and the echelon staff. Abbas went to stroke her hair, but remembered Barak and Yassin were in the car, and placed his hand on the seat between them. He had an example to set. It wasn't fitting for a leader to show he was subject to the same earthly desires as other men. Time is our enemy. By now the American journalist will have been reported missing. Those he worked with will know of his interest in Echelon. The American government might place this facility on high alert. Never underestimate our enemies. Americans are evil and arrogant, but they are not stupid. So we strike tonight. Now, drive me into town. I must meet with my contact to confirm he can supply the arms and explosives we'll need. Explosives? We have never worked with them before. I have. During my time with Hamas, I was taught by an expert. I am versed in the use of all kinds, and I will teach the rest of you. By morning, those domes will be a rubble. A new feeling of excitement coursed through him. The Al-Jabbar was entering into a new arena of activity, bound to elevate their prestige in the Muslim world. The following day, headlines would announce the site's destruction. By making a few discreet phone calls, he would ensure his organization received due credit. What then, Abbas wondered? Simple assassinations paled by comparison. The Al-Jabbar had to expand its horizons, move on to bigger, more spectacular targets. Master, how soon will it take them to rebuild? Rebuild? Those domes! How long will the facility be shut down? Six months? A year? It is too bad we cannot put it out of operation permanently. A physical blow couldn't have jarred Abbas more. All of their efforts, and the Americans would indeed likely have the site restored in another six months. It diminished their accomplishment. But he wasn't about to cancel the mission. It wouldn't look good were he to back out after Yassin's comment. The others might think he hadn't thought the mission through. Reluctantly, Abbas admitted to himself that he had let his thirst for vengeance get the better of his judgment. Destroying Echelon was a grand goal, but the only way to shut it down completely was to strike at the heart of the global network not at one lone site. The heart of the network. The phrase rang in Abbas's mind like the pealing of a bell. An idea blossomed. Are you all right? You have the most curious expression. Ah, I have never felt better. Impulsively, Abbas gave her elbow an affectionate squeeze the others failed to notice. God has graced me with a new vision. I know the purpose for being, and the cusp of my life is in the balance. I am not sure I understand. All you need to know for now is that all we have done to this point is but a minor prelude to an achievement that will put Al-Jabbar in the minds of every person on the planet. Praise God for his guidance. We are his sword, and our blade will bite deeper into Satan than any before us. This I swear. The Yildiz class FPB-57 cleaved the Aegean Sea like a knife. Alone near the bow, dressed once again in his own clothes, Mac Bolan leaned on the rail and let the fine spray moisten his face. To the west, a blazing red sun was slowly devoured by the sea. To the east lay the Turkish shoreline. You are a remarkable man, Mr. Belasco. Bolan turned. He hadn't heard Pamir approach over the hiss of water and the roar of the engine. The patrol boat had retrieved him an hour ago and was steaming south along the coast. The Turkish officer took a pack of cigarettes from his shirt pocket and offered one to Bolan, but the soldier shook his head. The men I sent ashore have radioed an update. They found 27 bodies and dismembered remains of five or six more. Single-handedly, you wiped out half of Kildana. I didn't have much of a choice. Bolan faced the sea. He had already shut the firefight from his memory and didn't care to have it brought up. Pamir lit the cigarette and tossed the match over the side. In one afternoon, you have done what my government could not do in 50 years. Don't make more of what happened than it is. You crippled their smuggling operation. It will be years before they are at full strength again, if ever. Surely that merits praise. I don't care about petty smugglers. The terrorists got away. Hassan Orge is a fine pilot, and a clever one. We didn't spot him on our way north to rendezvous with you, nor did his aircraft show up on our radar. My guess is he headed inland at treetop level. He could be anywhere by now. Wasn't your Air Force supposed to have some jets in the air? The fighters were a few miles out, so the smugglers wouldn't spot them. Keeping a low profile, as you might say, so as not to arouse the suspicions and put you in further danger. Bolin stared at the water below. He was back to square one. 
No new intel, no solid leads pointing him toward the Aljabar's base of operations. He might as well head back to the States. I am sorry, Mr. Belasco. We did what we thought was best. If it is any consolation, my government scrambled a dozen more aircraft to scour the southeast coast and its adjacent waters. They might yet turn up something. They might. I put in a call to your superior in Washington, as you requested. But it will be a while before we hear back, I am told. <sighs> Disgusting, Abbott, I know, but I have not been able to stop. The only thing worse than nicotine addiction is being addicted to women. Bolin wasn't in the mood for small talk. He preferred to be by himself, but it would be a breach of professional etiquette to give the officer the cold shoulder. The man was only being friendly. These thugs you are after, these al -Jibar. I hope you do to them as you did to these smugglers. Their kind give Muslims everywhere a bad name. I would not blame your countrymen if they believed all followers of Islam are lunatics. There are always a few too blinded by their prejudice to see the truth. Most Americans realize that Muslims aren't our enemies. Most Turks are Muslim. I guess you already knew that. We have a much more modern outlook than fundamentalists like the al Jabbar, who see the world as Satan's playground and believe they are doing the will of God when they slay innocent women and children. But then, every religion has a fundamentalist element, do they not? Those who believe only they will go to heaven or paradise and everyone else will burn in the pits. Boland said nothing. If history had taught him anything, it was that there were always those who thought they were right and everyone else was wrong. Fanatics who had no qualms about snuffing out the lives of those they looked down on. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Velasco's presence is required on the bridge. A Mr. Brognola very much desires to speak with him. Yudi's class vessels were equipped with state-of-the-art communications and navigation equipment. The communications officer handed Bolin a headset, and after adjusting it, the soldier stepped to one side. Al, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Striker. It's taken a bit longer than I anticipated to get back to you. We've had a major break, and I needed to confirm the intel before committing resources to ferry you where you need to go. You're going to sunny Somalia. Warlords are a dime a dozen there. Terrorist training camps are a thriving industry in themselves. You've located an Algebar training camp? If our intel is on the money, it's a combo deal. Two for the price of one. Training camp and base of operations rolled into one. Whoever the leader of the Algebar is, he's kept us on the ropes. He obtains all his arms and provisions through shell companies on a complicated network of email accounts and phone numbers under a dozen false identities. Our echelon site at Ios Nikolaos intercepted a message about an hour and a half ago. Your friends in the seaplane made the mistake of radioing Somalia direct. We were able to triangulate and have the location pegged to a ten square mile area in northern Somalia. That's still a lot of ground to cover. Oh, ye of little faith. By the time you reach Karenia, our satellites will have the site nailed, complete with high-resolution photos. Karenia? Then I'm heading for Cyprus? The Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, to be exact. Very hush-hush, you understand. Since officially our government hasn't recognized the TRNC, and we don't want the Greeks mad at us. The Turks have agreed to supply a car and a driver to take you to the Western Sovereign Base, where the British will get you on a military jet and ferry you to Northern Somalia. You should reach Karenia about 5 or 6 in the AM. I wish it were sooner, but that's the best I can do, given the logistics. We don't have any of our ships or flyboys anywhere near you at the moment. Use the time to catch up on your sleep. I'll try, Mother. Don't use that tone with me. If you knew all the strings I've had to pull to manage this, come to think of it, when you get to Ios Nikolaos, stop by the Echelon facility. I'll have the satellite photos relayed there. You can pick them up and study them on the flight to Somalia. You know, it wouldn't hurt to have backup on this one. Phoenix Force is in Southeast Asia at the moment, but I could have them join you in Somalia in, say, 24 to 36 hours, depending on how soon they can wrap up their current op. I won't need them. Really? We're talking maybe 30 or more insurgents at a heavily fortified location. You're the best, granted, but you don't fly around in tights with a big red S on your chest, either. No one is invincible. I'm sure David and his boys wouldn't mind swinging by to help you kick a little terrorist butt on their way home. Boland didn't doubt that one bit. David McCarter hated terrorists with a passion, but he didn't think much of the idea of having to wait another whole day. Once he hit Somalia, he wanted to get in and out as quickly as possible. Thanks, but no thanks. 
Okay. Give me a ring when you reach Cyprus. I expect to camp out in my office until this is over with. Over and out. The link went dead. Bolin removed the headset and handed it to the communications officer, then joined Pamir at a forward window. It looks like you're stuck with me a while yet, Pamir. So I have been informed by the Admiral. If you're hungry, I can have food brought to your compartment. And if you would like some company, I can bring my chess set. An American serviceman stationed in Ankara taught me how to play years ago. I have been in his debt ever since. I love the game. Just don't be too sore when I win. It's been said that catching an enemy napping is half the battle. The Al-Jabbar had won its strike against the Echelon facility before the terrorists went over the perimeter wall. At 2 a.m., the surrounding streets were largely empty, the homes and businesses dark. A stray dog roving the brush-covered ground between the wall and the nearest road was the only living creature to observe 11 camouflage-clad figures stalking toward the base. Aban Abbas spotted the mongrel and raised his French-made famas, but didn't fire. Even though it was fitted with a sound suppressor, the SMG would make some noise. Noise a sharp-eared sentry might hear. As long as the animal didn't bark, he would let it go. The others had slowed when Abbas did, and now he waved them on. It had been years since he was personally involved in a mission like this, and it was great to feel the old familiar rush of excitement pulse through his veins. Abbas had forgotten how thrilling it was. Coming to a shallow gully, he hopped into it and dropped onto his stomach on the other side. The others followed his example. Jamila was on his right, her features hidden by a black ski mask. Her teeth gleamed white in the darkness. The guards will be inside the wall. A hundred feet to the north was a spotlight. A hundred feet to the south, another. At the point where he intended to go over, it was black as pitch. The lights didn't overlap as they should. He expected better of the British. Lack security was more typical of American installations. A final sprint, and Abbas was at the base of the wall. He pointed at Yassin, the undisputed strongest member of the Al-Jabbar. Yassin slung his submachine gun, cupped his hands, and braced himself. By prior arrangement, Barak was first to place a foot in Yassin's hands and be hurled forward as if fired from a cannon. <laughs> Catching hold of the top with both hands, Barak checked the other side, nodded to let them know the coast was clear, and swung up and over. Jamilo was next, Jebel third, Abbas fourth. He remembered to bend his knees as he landed to better absorb the shock, then scooted into a patch of inky shadow to crouch and wait for the others. Three more had joined them when Jebel tugged at his sleeve and motioned to the south. A pair of British soldiers was approaching, though still a fair way off. Guards are coming. Stop until I give the word. Stay down. I will take them myself when they are right on top of us. The guards, young members of the Royal Military Police, weren't expecting trouble. Their sterlings were slung and they walked in silence. Abbas grinned as he curled his finger around the Famas's trigger. He had almost forgotten how exquisitely invigorating it was to kill an enemy. Years spent organizing the group's missions had dulled his senses. The compact rifle was already on automatic. He pressed a button that limited each burst to three rounds and sighted on the chest of one of the Britons. When they were only a stone's throw off, he stroked the trigger, shifted the sights to the chest of the second guard, and stroked the trigger a second time. The soldiers crumpled without a sound. Send over the rest! Spread out. You will be in position to provide cover fire should things go wrong. God favored them. When all eleven were over, the terrorist leader gestured and led them at a trot past the nearest radome to the command center. Isolated from other base buildings, it was a ripe fig waiting to be plucked. Amazingly, no guards were posted at the entrance. Even more incredibly, when a boss tried the doorknob, it turned without resistance. Someone had either inadvertently left the door unlocked, or the echelon personnel, composed mainly of Americans, had too much confidence in their British protectors. Across a circular lobby sat a man in uniform, dozing at his desk. Abbas nodded at Jamila, and she put a slug through the man's brain. Two narrow halls branched into the interior. Abbas took Jamila and four others to the right. Barak went to the left with the rest. They passed a number of small, unoccupied offices and came to a spacious room with glass walls. Inside, four technicians were scattered at various computer terminals and electronic monitors doing their work. 
Judging by the number of empty chairs at other posts, during the day the staff must have been larger. The leader of the Aljabar stalked to a glass door and eased it open. Two more technicians were at a coffee machine, drinking and chatting. On the other side of the command center was another glass door, Barak framed in the opening. Abbas signaled to let the others know the slackers by the coffee machine weren't to be touched just yet. Then he stepped aside so his people could file in. It was a magnificent slaughter. Abbas didn't take part. He was advancing on the bewildered pair by the coffee machine, his gun leveled meaningfully. Good evening. One had dropped a cup spilling coffee all over his shoes. The other's mouth was open wide enough to swallow a melon. My friends and I do not have much time, so I will come straight to the point. I need to learn all you can tell me about Echelon's headquarters in America. Which of you is interested in living the longest? Defiance flared in the eyes of the man who had dropped the coffee, and the boss shot him through the heart. The other technician began quaking so badly his legs nearly buckled. Abbas glanced over his shoulders. Jamila, Jabel, Barak, and Yassin were setting charges of C4, as he had instructed, while the rest were busy gathering every manual file and disk in sight and stuffing them into their backpacks. Now then, care to start talking, or would you rather stop breathing? Rimmed by the mountains along the Gulf of Aden, northern Somalia jutted into the Indian Ocean like the tip of a giant spear. It had the distinction of being some of the most inhospitable terrain on the face of the planet. Some parts barely received an inch of rain a year. Desert wasteland and vast rocky areas defied all man's attempts to gain more than the meagerest of footholds. Scorpions and snakes thrived. So did terrorists. As the executioner had long ago learned, evil flourished not only in the dark corners of the human mind, but also in the dark corners of the earth. In Somalia, terrorist organizations found a safe haven from the prying eyes of the western countries they yearned to topple. Local interference was minimal. For a substantial fee, Somali officials were willing to look the other way. More than a dozen terrorist training camps were currently active, that the feds knew of, most consisted of tents pitched in the middle of nowhere, and were it not for the daily rattle of gunfire and frequent explosions as the soldiers honed their deadly skills, the camps might be mistaken for those of wandering nomads. <laughs> Bolin's parachute came down several miles northeast of the site, believed to be the Al Jabbar's base of operations. The first thing he did was stash the chute in a ravine and checked his gear. He was dressed in desert camo and armed to the teeth. The backpack he had brought contained enough food and water to last three days, as well as his sole link to the outside world, a radio. Bolin wore dark glasses to shield his eyes from the sun's relentless glare. All around was a sea of rocks sprinkled with boulders. He consulted his map and verified his heading by his wrist compass. Then, slinging his M16, he began the long hike ahead. The soldier hadn't taken ten steps when a puff adder, sunning itself, hissed at him, bearing inch-long fangs, and slithered under a flat boulder. Bolin was wearing combat boots, but he still had to be careful where he stepped. The heat was relentless. It baked a man alive. Waves of it rippled in the air, distorting distant objects. Bolin became caked with sweat. Folded in Bolin's shirt pocket was the latest satellite photo of his destination. The image showed a high hill or bluff with buildings perched on top. A few more structures were visible in the shadows at its base. From the air, it didn't look like much, no different from other isolated Somali outposts. A casual observer would never suspect the truth, that it was where the fanatical seed of the Al Jabbar had taken root, a seed Bolin intended to dig out and destroy. As he hiked along, the soldier thought about his brief visit to Cyprus. The charred debris was what remained of the Echelon facility. When he'd arrived, the western sovereign base area had been swarming with soldiers. Military police everywhere, and the high brass were barking orders right and left. A bevy of Greek officials were on hand to inspect the damage. His liaison, Major Fawcett, sadly relayed the news that two royal military police had been slain. Seven more inside the facility were missing and presumed killed in the blast. 
Echelon had been crippled. An anonymous call to a local newspaper claimed the Al Jabbar was responsible. It gave Bolin more reason than ever to want to bring them down. The Al Jabbar was shifting focus. They had graduated from assassinating ambassadors and politicians to surgical strikes against critical targets. The organization had entered the big leagues in a major way and had to be stopped before they struck again. Bolin spoke to Hal Brognola. Brognola believed, and the executioner agreed, that those responsible had headed straight for their Somalian base and were there now, reveling in their victory. If so, he stood an excellent chance of catching them off guard. A piercing shriek high in the sky drew the warrior's gaze to an eagle circling in search of prey. Suddenly, the eagle tucked its wings to its sides and hurtled groundward. Whatever the eagle was after was on the other side of a low rise. <whistles> Bolin was halfway up it when the great bird reappeared, a small animal grasped in its iron talons. What it was exactly, he couldn't tell. The afternoon sun continued to climb. Bolin mopped his brow, but couldn't stop the trickle of stinging sweat into his eyes. Twice he took binoculars from his backpack, but all he saw ahead was the same bleak landscape. By his reckoning, Bolin had gone about four miles when he came to a cluster of boulders in the shade of a hill and stopped. Taking a seat, he propped the M-16 beside him and indulged himself in several sips of water. Not much, just enough to relieve his dry throat. It shouldn't be long before he spied the base, Bolin mused, but he'd have to wait for Dark to go in. Screwing the cap on the canteen, he slipped it into the backpack, placed the backpack on the ground, and leaned back. Something brushed against Bolin's right hand. He glanced down to find a hairy brown spider as big and thick as a grenade. Son of a bitch. It was waving its front forelegs in the air and had its other legs coiled to pounce. Eight tiny eyes were fixed on his fingers, and its large fangs were opening and closing reflexively. Bolin had never seen this particular type of spider before, but he had a strong hunch it was poisonous. If he moved, it would strike. He thought that by sitting perfectly still, he would cause it to soon lose interest and go elsewhere, but it showed no such inclination. One of the forelegs brushed the edge of Bolin's hand, and the spider came nearer, its fangs now a string's width from his skin. Bolin began to bend his left foot back toward his left hand. He had to move slowly or invite an attack, and it seemed to take forever for his ankle to rise high enough for him to reach the combat knife strapped to it. Unfastening the snap, he palmed the hilt and eased the blade free. The spider placed its forelegs on his second and third fingers and ran them back and forth. Only then did it dawn on Bolin the arachnid was trying to determine what he was. Its multiple eyes bent closer. Suddenly it sprang back, scrambled down the boulder, and darted off with amazing speed. <sighs> Bolin grinned and replaced the knife. Enough rest. Shrugging into the backpack, he grabbed the M-16, climbed to the top of the hill, and promptly flattened. Outlined in stark relief against the southern horizon was a steep, rocky crag, hundreds of feet high. The top had to be 15 to 20 acres in extent. The building atop it resembled a castle, with ramparts and towers and a wide wooden gate that opened onto a dirt road that wound down to a small village at the bottom of the crag. Bolin started to reach into his backpack for his binoculars. Around a knoll thirty yards away, a goat appeared. Four others followed, nipping at random clumps of dry grass. A girl of thirteen or fourteen trailed after them. She wore a long skirt and sandals, and despite the heat, a shawl over her head and shoulders. Bolin scowled. Civilians always complicated matters. The girl had to be from the village, and she and her people might be on friendly terms with the terrorists. They might not take too kindly to someone wanting to wipe out their guests. Not caring to be spotted, Bolin began to slide down. He turned, started to stand, and received a jolt of surprise. Another girl had come unnoticed around the side, and was calmly studying him. Only ten years old or so, her dark eyes alive with interest. Bolin slowly slung the M-16. When she smiled and raised her hand in a gesture of greeting, he returned it. Dr. Yabin Mumina. Do you speak English? The girl held her fingers close to her ears and wriggled them. Dr. Yabin Mumina? Maybe she wanted to know if he were a member of the Al-Jabbar. 
The people in the village had to be accustomed to encountering the terrorists now and then, which explained why she wasn't scared of him. He decided a little fib wouldn't hurt. Pointing to the fortress, he nodded and smiled. Around the hill came the older girl, a sister perhaps. She beckoned. The smaller girl reluctantly went over. At that, the older girl gripped the younger's wrist and hauled her out of there. <laughs> Bolin walked up the hill. Urging the goats ahead of them, the pair was hurrying toward the village. The younger one glanced back and smiled and was roundly cuffed on the head by her sibling. Ah! To linger invited discovery. The girls were bound to tell their parents, who might see fit to come find him, or worse, make mention of him to a member of the Al Jabbar. Bolin jogged to a dry wash that meandered in the general direction of the crag. It took Bolin an hour and a half to travel to within a hundred yards of the village. He counted nine thatched roof dwellings, each with its own small corral that held goats and donkeys. Seven men were seated under a tree, smoking, while a group of women gathered by a stone well, large clay vessels balanced on their heads. It was like turning back a page of history to the Somalia that existed a century or more ago. Truth be told, much of the world was the same. Those living in modern nations with their host of appliances and never-ending parade of luxuries tended to forget that many people worldwide still lived as their ancestors had. From rural China to the remote Amazon, from the exotic islands of the South Pacific to the hinterlands of the Canadian Arctic, life was conducted much as it had always been. The two girls came out of a dwelling. They had reached the village long before him, and the goats they had been tending were in a corral. Walking over to the women, they squatted near the one who had to be their mother. Neither showed any interest in the hill where they had seen him, which he took as a good sign. Suddenly, every villager in sight looked up at the fortress. Bolin heard it too. A brown flatbed truck barreled out the gate and roared down the dirt road, raising a cloud of dust in its wake. Two camouflage-clad men were in the cab, four more in the open bed. The driver took the turns much too fast, and it was a wonder the truck didn't careen out of control. The Somalis under the tree rose. The women were hustling toward their homes, shooing children who didn't move fast enough. By the time the truck reached the bottom, only the men were left, waiting in a silent, sullen knot. It didn't take any great leap of logic to figure out the villagers weren't fond of the outsiders. The truck came to a stop, and out hopped the man on the passenger side of the cab. A swarthy, brutish character of Middle East extraction gripped the oldest by the arm and shook him. Other Somalis made as if to intervene, but stopped when the men on the truck bed jumped down and leveled their weapons. A heated dispute arose between the oldest Somali and the swarthy leader. What it was about, Bolin couldn't say. It was tempting to drop the unwelcome visitors where they stood, but it would alert their comrades up above, so he had to content himself with lying low for the time being. The dispute ended. Some of the Somalis went to various corrals and returned, leading four goats by short ropes. The terrorists loaded the animals onto the truck. The driver executed a U-turn and the vehicle rumbled up the bluff. Angrily shaking their fists, the Somalis blistered the air with curses. Their fury was understandable. To families barely eking out a living, the loss of an animal they relied on for milk, meat and clothing could be catastrophic. Something told Bolin it wasn't the first time this had happened, but were it up to the Somalis, it would be the last. Their wives and children emerged from their homes. The way of the world, Bolin reflected. Since the dawn of time, the strong had always preyed on the weak and the helpless. It was the natural order of things, except where there were men and women willing to defy the strong on the weak's behalf. The truck was passing through the gate, Bolin trained his binoculars on the fortress and adjusted the magnification. Two guards were lazily pacing, nowhere near enough for a fortification that size. The terrorists had become complacent. That was always a prelude to carelessness and defeat. At the east end of the fortress, a few feet above the wall, was part of a rotor capped by helicopter blades. Bolin assumed the terrorists had used the chopper to travel to Cyprus and back, and he put it at the top of his list for demolition. Bolin mopped a sleeve across his forehead. The heat was stifling, but he had experienced worse. At least it wasn't as humid as the jungles of Asia or the Amazon. 
Twisting, he double-checked the village. The men were still under the tree, the women gathered at the well, the children playing. Life was back to normal. Occasional angry glances were cast at the ancient fortress that loomed over their primitive homes. Drowsiness set in. Bolin had only caught a few hours' sleep the night before. He could use a few more, but now wasn't the right time or place. Shaking himself, he sat up. The soldier was glad when the last vestige of the blazing sun sank below the horizon. He adjusted the straps to his backpack, blew dust off the M16, and crouched below the rim. Almost all the villagers had settled in for the night. A few stragglers were taking their sweet time, and he was forced to wait another ten minutes before it was safe to leave the wash and double time toward the dirt road. Until he was past the village, Bolin had adequate cover, but the lower part of the slope was as wide open as a Kansas prairie. Some men might have risked it. Bolin knelt behind a boulder and bided his time. Bit by bit, the sky darkened, miring the desert in gloom. When he couldn't see his hand at arm's length, he jogged to the road and continued on. Light filled a few windows of the fortress. Silhouettes occasionally flicked across the casements, and a man's head and shoulders showed above the parapet. The executioner was a third of the way there when the stillness was broken by the purr of an engine. But it didn't come from inside the fortress. It was borne to him from out of the desert to the southwest. A pair of headlights pierced the night, the size of peas at that distance. Bolin hadn't seen a road beyond the crag, but there had to be one. The vehicle was moving much too fast to be traveling cross-country across broken, boulder-ridden terrain. He continued to climb. The vehicle was miles off yet and would take a while getting there. On his right, a line of boulders materialized, and he moved closer to cover. Well, look! Dropping to his knees behind a boulder, Bolin prepared for a firefight. He thought the terrorists had spotted him, but there were no additional outcries. Nor was there movement on the ramparts. It was either routine procedure for them to turn on the spotlight at night, or else they had done it for the sake of their soon-to-arrive guests. Staying well shy of the lit area, Bolin glided higher. In a way, the spotlight helped. The spotlight would hamper the sentry's ability to spot him. Bolin had been around enough military vehicles to know a jeep when he heard it. The vehicle reached the bottom of the crag and roared upward. The soldier ducked to avoid the sweep of headlights. When he looked out again, three men had appeared. One was the barrel-chested brute who had demanded goats from the villagers. His brawny hands on his hips, an insolent sneer on his lips, he planted himself in the middle of the gate. The jeep braked, and out hopped a Somali officer in full uniform. According to his insignia, he was a general. A big man with a prominent hooked nose and a pointed chin, he strode to the brutish terrorist in charge and offered his hand. Kelmad lasku salamu. Salam. The man shook, but did not seem particularly pleased by the visit. Bolin had no clue what was going down. The leader motioned for the jeep to proceed them into the fortress. The two men entered, their posture suggesting neither was all that comfortable with the other. There weren't more than eight or nine generals in the whole Somali army, which hinted this was an official visit. The last thing Bolin needed was another complication. Brognola wouldn't take it too well if he killed a Somali officer. The U.S. wasn't on the best of terms with the Somali government as it was. Ideally, he should wait for the general to leave, but that might not be until morning. The other two men went on. The gate began to swing shut. Bolin could make it through, but the spotlight would bathe him before he went ten feet. He had to find another way in. Angling to the right, he sprinted for the high fortress wall. Once in its shadow, he prowled in search of a door or a window low enough for him to reach. The west, south, and east sides of the crag were sheer cliffs and at several points the fortress wall came perilously close to the edge. Deliberately so, Bolin guessed, to render the stronghold virtually impregnable. He came to a spot where there was barely a foot of earth between the wall and a drop of hundreds of feet, and cautiously extended his foot to what he thought was a firm place. He shifted most of his weight to it and eased forward, his hands pressed against the wall. Ugh, shit! The earth underfoot gave way, Gripping the wall, Bolin tried to shift his weight onto his left foot, but gravity and the added weight of his backpack pitched him forward. Ugh. Bolin's right leg went over the side. Lunging upward, he grabbed a protrusion on one of the rough-hewn stones and stopped his fall, but only for a moment. The 
ground under his left foot cascaded from under him like so much sand. His hold on the stone only delayed the inevitable for a split second. Bolan fell. The executioner's reflexes were second to none. As his legs dropped out from under him and he dropped like a stone, he clutched at the rock wall for all he was worth. Gouging his fingers into cracks between the stones, he rammed the steel tips of his boots into the cliff face, digging them into the dirt as far as they would go. It worked. Bolin stopped falling several feet down the cliffside, clinging like a fly to a glass pane, with nothing to grab to pull himself to safety, nor a foothold worthy of the name. And as if that were not enough, at that moment, voices drifted from above. <laughs> Kiramo, baby! <laughs> a pair of sentries was on the rampart. Craning his neck, Bolin saw the glow of a cigarette cherry and heard low laughter. He dared not move. More dirt and rocks would cascade over the precipice, and the terrorists were bound to hear. He wouldn't last two seconds. He had to wait for them to go. Bolin held on, his fingers and toes strained to their limit his shoulders and calves protesting. He had slung the M16 over his left shoulder before he made that last step. It slid lower toward his elbow, threatening to unbalance him with potentially disastrous consequences. The soldier glanced up. The tip of the cigarette was fire red. Whoever was smoking it was leaning on the parapet. All he had to do was look down and he'd spot him. The man at the parapet suddenly tossed the cigarette over the side. Like a lone firefly tumbling end over end, it dropped toward Bolan. Half a foot overhead, it struck the wall and bounced off, showering him with tiny sparks. <laughs> Gritting his teeth, Bolan pushed upward. Or tried to. He didn't have enough of a hold to lever his full 200 plus pounds. Worse, the added pressure caused more earth to rain from under his left foot, weakening his hold drastically. There was only one way to save himself. <laughs> Letting go, he flung himself as high and as far to the right as he could, his legs serving as twin fulcrums to gain added height. Twisting his back to the precipice, he dug his fingers into the cracks, bloodying his fingers. It almost wasn't enough. Bolin felt himself start to go over the side and flung his left leg along the bottom of the wall to better distribute his weight. It worked. For a minute, he lay still. Then, wary of the ground crumbling out from under him again, he slowly pulled himself onto his knees and crawled five or six yards to firmer footing. Bolin didn't waste time congratulating himself on his narrow escape. Rising, he moved on, treading light as a feather. The fortress wasn't a square. The builders had matched its shape to that of the bluff, which was roughly ovoid. There were no corners, no right angles, just a continuous curving expanse of wall. He passed under four narrow windows, all too high to reach, and came to a fifth. Bolin stopped. It was 15 feet up. He might be able to reach the sill, but should he slip, jagged boulders were waiting at the bottom to dash him to pieces. Sitting, the soldier removed his combat boots and socks. He stuffed his socks into the boots, then tied the laces together and slung the boots around his neck so they lay across the top of his backpack. Next, he tightened the sling on the M16 so it had no slack whatsoever and slung it over his right shoulder. Loosening his belt, he slid the buttstock underneath, partway down his pant leg, then fastened the belt again. He tested whether the rifle would shift by pushing against the handguard. It was tucked tight. <sighs> Bolin wedged the toes of his right foot into the cracks, reached up, and began to climb. The hand and footholds were tenuous at best. He had to grope and feel for each one. Six feet off the ground, the cracks thinned. Smaller stones had been used from that point on up, with only a hairline space between them. If he so much as sneezed, he would lose his grip. The wind didn't help any. It had grown a lot stronger since sunset. Invisible hands pushed against his backpack, but he had it strapped too securely to be dislodged. Or so he thought. Eight feet up, and a gust buffeted him so strongly his fingers slipped. Exerting every sinew in his forearms, he maintained his perch until the wind slackened and he could go on. 
At a height of 12 feet, Bolin slowly raised his right hand and caught hold of the stone sill. Gingerly placing his left hand next to his right, he performed a chin-up and pulled himself high enough to hook his elbows over the edge. A musty scent assailed him. The room was as black as pitch. Getting inside would be a feat in itself. The windows weren't more than a foot and a half wide. Bolin slipped his hands in, one on either side, and raised himself high enough to sit on the sill. Sliding his boots from around his neck, he dropped them inside. Then, carefully loosening the straps to his backpack, he slid it off, shoved it through ahead of him, and let it follow his boots. Unslinging the M16, the soldier held the auto rifle by the muzzle and lowered it as far as he could. He had to drop it the few final feet. The clatter it made was much too loud, and tensing, he listened, but heard nothing to show that terrorists had overheard. <clears throat> Shifting, Bolin slid his shoulders into the opening. It was a tight fit, but by wriggling and pushing against the inner wall, he squeezed in. Something brushed against his face, something sticky that clung to his face. Spider webs, he imagined. Pushing harder, he slid his legs in and balanced on the sill. From a shirt pocket, he produced a pencil flashlight and switched it on. He was in a storage room. In one corner were old benches and a broken table, stacked haphazardly. In another was a pile of rolled-up rugs, of all things. Other odds and ends, mostly furnishings, covered much of the stone floor, all of it covered with the dust of disuse. Pointing the flashlight straight down, Bolin took note of where the M16 and the backpack lay. Then, swinging his feet under him, he released his hold. He landed in a crouch and trained the flashlight on the ceiling. He had been right about the spider webs. They covered it from wall to wall. Bolin swiftly donned his socks and shoes. He slipped his arms into the backpack, reclaimed the M16, and stepped to a stout wooden door. A metal latch tarnished with rust had to be pressed. Damn, where's the WD-40 when you need it? Quickly, Bolin opened the door all the way and ran to his left down a narrow stone corridor. If anyone had heard, it would take them a bit to investigate. He had time to do a little exploring. Dust swirled in the flashlight's beam. More spiderwebs glittered like spun silk. Another door appeared out of the gloom and Bolin pressed an ear to it. He heard nothing to indicate anyone was on the other side. He opened it and slipped through, finding himself in a long, empty corridor lit by lanterns at both ends. Six doorways, three on either side, begged investigation. The M16 on semi-auto, Bolin moved to the first. This time, the hinges didn't make a sound. Holy shit. He'd stumbled on another storage room, but this one was crammed with enough ammunition to supply an army. Most was for 7.62mm and 5.56mm weapons. Once more, shrugging out of the backpack, Bolin removed a packet of C4 already rigged with a timer and debt cord. He set the timer for 40 minutes, hid the packet behind a crate at the rear, and moved on to the next chamber. He was on a roll. This one contained rocket launchers and rockets, 60 mines and kegs of conventional black powder. He hid another packet of C4 after setting the timer to coincide with the first. Bazookas and machine guns were stored in the next room. Bolin didn't plant C4 this time. He had three packets left, and he needed to scatter them about the fortress to maximize the damage. Slipping out, he hurried to the next room and was reaching for the latch when voices sounded at the far end of the hall. This is most irregular. Instantly, Bolin ducked into yet another munitions-crammed chamber. He left the door open enough to see two people move past the junction. One was the brutish terrorist, the other the Somali general. I wish he were here. He has a lot of explaining to do. Present your complaint and I will relay it to him. He left me in command. His curiosity piqued, Bolin sped to the junction. The pair was entering a room farther down the corridor. He verified no one else was in the corridor and quick-stepped to the doorway. A large circular table dominated a spacious room. To one side, chairs were arranged in long rows. The two men were taking seats at the table. Neither noticed Bolin drop to a crouch, dart between two of the rows, and sink to his knees. We are alone and can speak freely, I could. So perhaps you will be good enough to explain. If I know what you are talking about, I would. You dare feign ignorance? It has been on all the news channels. Our president heard about it on the radio, of all things, and sent for me right away. I am here at his personal order. 
What is it he hurt, General? The Al Jabbar is claiming credit for the destruction of an Echelon facility jointly run by the United States and the British in Cyprus. Since your leader is not present, I gather he must be involved personally. I would not know. He did not confide his plans in me when he left several days ago. My government is extremely displeased. Our arrangement specifically requires your leader to inform us of undertakings of this magnitude. I do not understand. Your government has never complained before. We never had cause to. We were always kept abreast of developments. But now, thanks to your leader's willful oversight, our country has been put in a highly compromising position. Your government had nothing to do with it. We know that, and you know that, but the Americans and British do not. Have you forgotten Afghanistan? My government does not want our skies darkened by American bombers and our cities invaded by American troops. <laughs> Let them come. Somalia is not Afghanistan. Your people will rise up and drive out the arrogant spawn of Satan. Have you forgotten how the Americans were humiliated in Mogadishu in 1993? Have you been listening to American media propaganda? It was not the American military that suffered humiliation in Mogadishu. We did. 150 of their Delta Force and Rangers killed almost a thousand Somali fighters. The American media never reported the true story, or those men would be enshrined as heroes. Inform Abbas when he returns that he must contact me immediately or the Algebra will be expelled from Somalia. He will not be threatened. We are not your servants to be bossed around on a whim. I do not care what you think of yourselves. Where do you think you are? This is Somalia, not Syria. The Algebra will abide by the restrictions my government has imposed, or I will return with a full regiment and enough artillery to reduce this fortress to rubble. Please, General. I meant no disrespect. I am sure Abbas will explain everything to your satisfaction. He had better. <clears throat> it is too late for me to start back tonight. You will accommodate my driver and I for the night. Of course. You can stay in the same room as before. I will have food and drink brought and whatever else you acquire. Bolin watched them walk toward the corridor. The general was in the lead. They were only a few yards away when the officer halted and gazed quizzically at the doorway, then at the rows of chairs. Bolin shot a quick glance in the same direction. Another man had shown up and was staring right at him in blatant surprise. The man had a checkmade scorpion on a shoulder sling, and as Bolin looked over, he grabbed it and swung it up to fire. The executioner beat him by a hair, triggering a burst that stitched the terrorist's chest and flung him back against the wall. Even as he fired, Bolin started to pivot toward the conspirators. The brutish terrorist was clutching an auto pistol in a holster. He never cleared leather. Bolin shot him in the face, then swiveled to cover the general, who was frozen in temporary shock, and was clearly unarmed. You'd be wise to get in your jeep and leave, general. Sliding a short black grenade from a pocket, he fed it into the 40mm M203 grenade launcher attached to the underside of the M16. Who are you? You don't want to know. Bolin gestured for the Somali to walk in front of him to the doorway. You are an American, aren't you? Sent to wipe out the Algebra for their attack on the Echelon installation. But how did you find them so soon? Wouldn't tell you if I could, General. Unless you want to be caught in the crossfire, I suggest you take my advice and make yourself scarce. Thank you. Yes. The general turned to the left and stepped into a hail of lead that turned him into crimson spattered awful in the blink of an eye. He died on his feet. Leaning into the corridor, Boland spied the pair of trigger-happy bastards responsible. They were at a junction, SMGs to their shoulders. Accidentally killing the general had rooted them in disbelief, giving him the edge he needed. He chopped both in two with a sustained burst. Five men swept into view. The sight of their fallen companions slowed them a bit, and it was then, when their attention was on the floor, that Bolin let fly with the M576 buckshot grenade and ducked back into the room. In a confined space, the M56 literally tore its targets to pieces. Turning to the left, Bolin hurried to another junction, listened a moment, then took the left fork. In the space of one minute, he had reduced the odds to 11 to 1. 
A closed door was ahead, and Boland slowed to try the latch. The door swung open to reveal floor-to-ceiling munitions, more than all the previous rooms combined. Planting one of his remaining C4 packs, he set a timer so it would go off along with its brothers. He hid the packet and moved to the door. Aratul! Please come in! Four men were jogging down the corridor toward him. Bolin let them go by. Now that he had learned the true leader of the Aljabar wasn't at the fortress, he would like to find out where the man had gone. There was something else. Prognola had told him the feds estimated the Aljabar's strength at 30 strong. Yet the late general had claimed only 18 were present. Where were the others? With Abbas? If so, what were they up to? Questions he might be able to answer if he could locate a command center or a communications post. For the next 15 minutes, Bolin played a deadly game of hide and seek. The terrorists made so much noise in their search that eluding them was no great feat but several times he barely found a hiding place in time. All the while, the minutes were ticking down to when the packets would go off. Yet another corridor brought the soldier to an archway that opened onto a courtyard. At the moment, it was empty. Not so the ramparts. Two sentries were near the gate, one on either side. They didn't spot him. Lanterns hung from pegs on all four sides of the courtyard, too faint to illuminate it. Dappled by shadow, Bolin sidled along the wall to another archway. Whenever one of the terrorists happened to glance in his direction, he froze until the man looked away. The first door in the next corridor was different than the rest. It was newer, a modern door with a knob instead of a latch, and it was locked. Bolin was handy with a lockpick, but that took time. He could shoot the door open, but the sentries and anyone else in the vicinity would hear unless the auto-fire was drowned out by a louder noise. Returning to the arch, Bolin fed another grenade into the M203. This time it was an ordinary M406 high-explosive round. He pried up the sight leaf mount. The distance was about 100 meters, only a third of the M203's maximum effective range. Aiming above the gate, midway between the sentries, he fired, then spun and raced toward the closed door. Someone had gone to a lot of expense to turn the drab stone chamber into a comfortable office. Wood paneling on the walls, a rug covered the floor. A large oak desk and an easy chair sat near some shelves stacked high with magazines. On the right wall was a calendar with a photo of a mosque. On the left wall, a plaque in Arabic. Bolin shut the door, replaced the spent magazine with a fresh one and moved around the desk. None of the drawers were locked. In one, he found a notebook nearly filled with Arabic writing and diagrams. In another, a leather binder with lists of what might be names and phone numbers. In a third were passports for nine different countries, all showing the same man with his features slightly altered. Fakes, Bolin guessed, and placed them in a side pocket in his backpack along with the rest. He found and pilfered one last item, a gold watch. Whoever it belonged to was bound to have left his fingerprints. Bolin rigged another packet of C4 under the desk and stepped to the door. Time to wrap it up. There should have been several men left, and Bolin wasn't leaving until he had accounted for as many as he could. He headed for the courtyard, and from under the arch spied three terrorists over by the shattered gate. The two sentries lay sprawled in pools of blood. Sighting down the auto rifle, Bolin squeezed the trigger three times in swift succession. Six to go, and the job was done. Bolin took a couple of strides, then jerked back as the archway was peppered by lead from somewhere to his right. Backing away, Bolin turned and ran to a junction. He took the left fork, followed it to another junction, and again turned left. He slowed, the M16 at his waist. Another archway was at the end, and a terrorist with an AK-47 crouched under it, the weapon trained on where he had just been. Slinking forward on silent souls, the soldier centered his sights on the back of the man's skull. Running to the archway, Bolin straddled the dead fanatic and glanced out. The courtyard was deserted, but for the bodies. He began to turn and realized he wasn't alone. Thinking the man he had shot wasn't dead, he leaped to one side. Cold steel flashed and something struck the auto rifle a resounding blow. The M16 was torn from his grasp and clattered to the floor. Bolin whirled. Confronting him was another Somali in uniform. 
the general's driver. He was a mountain of a man whose muscles bulged like cords of wood, wielding a glittering machete. You killed General Nabibi! For that, I will cut you to pieces! Bolin wasn't given the chance to explain that terrorists were responsible. The driver attacked without another word. The executioner stepped back and felt air fan his neck. The machete had missed by a hair's width. He grabbed for the Beretta, but as he swept it from his shoulder rig, the flat of the machete's wide blade struck it hard enough to tear it from his fingers and send it skittering across the floor. Wearing a look of fierce resolve, the Somali soldier hefted his weapon. Lunging, he cleaved the tempered steel in a tremendous stroke. Bolin flung himself to the right. Again the machete missed, again not by much. He dropped his hand toward the Desert Eagle, but had to snatch it up when the sergeant slashed at his wrist. <coughs> to slow the Somali, he snapped a kick at the soldier's knee and connected. Most men would have buckled. Dodging right, dodging left, ducking and weaving, Bolin evaded his adversary. Once more, he tried for the Desert Eagle and almost lost several fingers. Bolin took a long bound back. The Somali lunged, overextended himself, and Bolin quickly seized his adversary's wrist and elbow and drove his knee into the man's arm. <laughs> that should have been enough to force the Somali to drop the machete, but he wrenched loose and whipped it overhead. In combat, there was no such thing as fair play. Bolin did what he had to in order to survive. As the gleaming blade rose, he smashed his right fist into the Somali's groin. <laughs> The sergeant staggered. Leaping into the air, the executioner rammed the sole of his right boot into the man's neck. The big Somali sputtered, dropped the machete, and clutched at his throat. His legs swayed, but he didn't go down. Bands of steel encircled him, pinning his arms to his sides, and he was lifted off the floor. It was like being caught in the coils of a python. Bolin thrashed and kicked and strained, but the pressure on his rib cage continued to build. His ribs were on fire. He pounded his forehead against the other man's face, but it only made the Somali mad. Blood trickling from his nose, the sergeant lowered his shoulders and hurled himself at the wall. Bolin bore the brunt, and for a second he thought his spine had been shattered. Breath passed from his lungs, and the corridor spun. Bolin strained to break loose, almost succeeding, when his opponent swiveled at the hips and threw him bodily against the other wall. His left shoulder hit so hard, his entire side went numb, and it took a few seconds for him to prop his right hand under him and rise. Seconds the Somali used to step in close and kick him in the stomach. Knocked onto his back, Bolin saw the sergeant raise the same boot to stomp him on the head. He reacted instinctively. His right hand closed on the Desert Eagle, and he pointed it at the only part of the sergeant's body he could see, between the Somali's legs. Rocked onto his heels, the sergeant windmilled his arms to maintain his balance, but couldn't. Bolin was slow in standing. Flexing and unflexing his left fingers, he pumped his arm up and down to try to alleviate the numbness. It worked to a degree. Moving to the M16, he picked it up and was about to head for the courtyard when a pair of terrorists appeared in the archway. The instant they saw him, they opened fire. <laughs> to Boland's right was the doorway to the office. Hurling himself through it, he rolled into a crouch, reversed direction and hurled himself right back out. The terrorists were caught flat-footed. They weren't expecting him to reappear so soon and had started forward. Firing from the hip, he nailed both. Only four men were left, but they could be anywhere. Pumping another M406 explosive grenade into the launcher, Bolin crept to the courtyard. No enemies there, nor on the rampart. He edged to the left, his back to the wall, intending to make a complete circuit, and listen at each archway for some sign of exactly where the remaining men were hiding. Suddenly, figures materialized at the front gate. Bolin immediately took aim, but promptly lowered the auto rifle. Somalis from the village, five men and two women, were nervously glancing all about. Appalled at the carnage and destruction, they halted just inside and whispered among themselves. The remaining terrorists might show up at any moment. 
Boland doubted they would be glad to see the Somalis. They might gun them down out of sheer spite. Stepping into the open, he caught the Somalis' attention. They fearfully clustered together. He motioned for them to leave, but they either misunderstood or were too scared to budge. Suddenly, a lanky, bearded man came darting out of an archway across the courtyard. Without hesitation, he opened up with an Uzi on the villagers. Only the fact he rushed his initial burst spared their lives. Bolin, on the other hand, took the fraction of a second needed to settle the M16's sights on the center of the attacker's torso. When next he glanced at the Somalis, they were in full flight down the road. And then there were three. Bolin continued his circuit. When he was near the west wall, he spied the general's jeep parked in an alcove. Slugs pinged off the wall above him. Dropping flat, he saw two gunners on the east rampart. From their vantage point, they had clear shots, but they were poor marksmen. They expended their magazines, peppering the walls and the ground. As soon as the firing stopped, Bolin was up and racing across the courtyard. He reached a corner, only a heartbeat before another smattering of lead. Temporarily safe, he resorted to the grenade launcher. The trajectory had to be just right. With the rim of a cartridge, he loosened the screw at the base of the sight leaf and made the adjustment. The pair was still up there, waiting for him to show himself. Boland poked his head out and drew it right back again, drawing their fire. When they stopped, he popped out once more and launched the grenade. They saw it coming and panicked. One ran left, the other right, but neither raced far enough to escape the blast radius. One to go. Bolin checked his watch. There was still time to set another packet of C4. He considered making a sweep of the rooms on the north side. Another room filled with munitions would be just the thing. Or a jeep with a tank full of gas. The soldier had to remove his pack, lie on his back, and shimmy underneath to attach the packet. In 12 minutes, the fortress would go up like a giant Roman candle. From the alcove, he sprinted to what was left of the gate and stepped through. The villagers were almost to the bottom of the crag. One had a lit torch and was herding the rest ahead. Bolin headed down. There were any number of spots to lie and wait for the last terrorist, but he didn't stop until he heard someone attempting to crank over the jeep's engine. It had to be the last man. He was unaware of the C4, and if he got the jeep running down the road... Shit! Only a minute or two and the fireworks would begin. The villagers had spotted him and stopped. They were safe enough, but he was still much too close. Bolin glanced back and saw a terrorist in fatigues about to nose the jeep through the ragged opening in the gate made by his grenade. The opening wasn't quite wide enough and only the grill had made it through when the jeep became stuck. A cloud of dust enveloped the vehicle and its occupant, growing thicker by the moment. The driver threw the transmission into reverse and with a violent lurch backed up nine or ten yards. He shifted and revved the engine. On the left were some boulders. Bolin veered toward them, but he had yards to go when the driver popped the tranny into drive and rocketed toward the gate. pyrotechnic display lit up the sky. Rising, he hurried lower, holding one arm across his face to protect it. Villagers were frantically shuffling from their dwellings to witness the spectacle. Some held candles, a few had oil lamps. Bolin slung the M16. He had done what he set out to do, but his work was nowhere near done. Destroying the Al Jabbar's base hadn't destroyed the terrorist group. Abbas and at least ten others were still out there, somewhere, plotting new assaults. With their headquarters gone, where would the Al Jabbar retreat to? Bolin wondered. It was the million dollar question, one it might take the Feds weeks, if not months, to answer. He thought of the items in his backpack and reached around to give it a pat. 
maybe, just maybe, valuable intel would be gleaned. Intel that would help him close the book on the Aljabar once and for all. Bolin looked back one last time. Flames 50 feet high were eating at the stronghold, and a broad section of roof had collapsed. It would take days for the fire to burn itself out. Several villagers were moving toward the road. Once a few did, the rest saw fit to follow, and as Bolin approached the bottom, he was greeted by a nervous knot of men, women, and children. I mean you no harm. The little girl who had stumbled on him out in the desert shouldered past her elders and grinned, only to be snatched back by her mother. Bolin bore to the left to go around them, but the old man who had argued with Aikut stepped forward, palm extended, signifying he should stop. Kel madlakso salamo, mali manaksa. The two women ran off and shortly came hurrying back, and they weren't alone. Bolin realized the villagers wanted to thank him for ridding them of the occupying soldiers. And to properly show the depth of their gratitude, they were giving him one of their most prized possessions. <coughs> what in the world was he going to do with a goat? Aban Abbas had said it many times before, and he would say it again. Americans were their own worst enemies. Unbelievably naive, they committed blunders no security-conscious Israeli or South Korean would ever be guilty of. For instance, shortly after the World Trade Center attacks, Abbas had been watching the news and reveling in the death and destruction when a segment piqued his interest. A reporter was interviewing an American politician about the things that needed to be done to make America's shores safe. The politician mentioned that one of their top priorities should be increasing the budgets and manpower of the Coast Guard and major port authorities. Foreign vessels could smuggle in a nuclear bomb and transport it by truck anywhere in the country. Each day, over a hundred ships dock here, yet it's a rare day, as many as 15 are boarded and searched. Abbas never forgot that newscast. He'd filed the statistic in the back of his mind. And now, en route to America, he was glad he did. The freighter they were on would dock at Spain in a couple of days, and there they would transfer to an ocean-going tanker bound for New York City. He was seated on a cot in a forward compartment, once used as a gaming room. Other cots and sleeping bags took up most of the available space. I do not see why we do not have cabins. For one thing, Jebel, this is a freighter, not a luxury ship. It has few cabins and they are occupied. For another, we must keep to ourselves as much as we can. The fewer who see us, the better. I do not mind the inconvenience. What is a little sacrifice in the war against the great Satan? Abbas smiled. At moments like these, he wished he could take her in his arms and crush her to his chest. Exactly. The rest of you would do well to adopt her attitude. Our accommodations in the tanker will not be much better, and on the last leg of our journey, when we are almost to New York, we must hide in a false hold in case the tanker is boarded. America. I have never been there before. Just think. Do not let yourself be influenced by what you see, Yassin. In many respects, Americans will not seem much different than our own people. Many will smile and treat you kindly. But do not be deceived. Their acts, their very thoughts, are steeped in Satan's lies. Never forget, they are your enemies. Our master speaks true. Every hand will be against us. We must be as clever as foxes in all we do. Abbas shifted toward the pair who had joined them only minutes before the freighter set out from Cyprus. And what say you, Malik? Rakin, the two of you have been unusually quiet since we were reunited. I am troubled, Great One. I worry that when we reach America, he will be there. The one who thwarted our attempt on the Vice President. The one who nearly caught us in Athens, and again on Thinas. The same one who later showed up in Kildana. You worry too much, my brother. With all due respect, you did not see him. He truly is the devil, this one. He always knows exactly where to find us. Do not make him out to be more than he is. There is a logical explanation. Through Echelon, the American government intercepted our calls. Of course he showed up. They knew where to find you. But now we have destroyed their installation on Cyprus, and soon we will deal the entire Echelon network a crippling blow. Even so, I hope we have seen the last of him. Those Turkish smugglers tried to stop him and failed. An entire town. And he brought it to its knees. You are too timid, Sharik. He is a man and nothing more. 
He can be killed like any other. If he shows up again, I will prove it to you by slaying him myself. Enough. Your focus now must be on America. This information is worth its weight in gold. With it, our success is assured. Are those the files the American at the Cypress facility showed you, Master? The ones Barak was telling me about? <laughs> they are, Sharik. Now he had the location of every echelon site in the world. Not only that, he could access secret government files from any online computer terminal with the aid of a special disk. Passwords, encryption protocols, he had it all. Where will we go once we reach New York? I will tell you when the right time comes, Jabel. The less you know in advance, the less you can reveal if you are arrested. What I want to know is how you propelled our passage on such short notice. A smart leader thinks ahead and has every contingency covered. That is why I insisted that each of you keep several passports from different countries on hand, and why all of us with dark hair and beards will dye our hair a lighter shade and shave before we reach New York. <laughs> I have never taken a razor to my skin in my life. The same as my father and my father's father. You ask too much, Master. I ask only what is necessary to accomplish our holy mission. If we keep our dark hair and beards, we will be too conspicuous. The police, the military, even the American public are suspicious of anyone who even remotely looks like an Arab. A few alterations to our appearance, and we can avoid unnecessary trouble. My... my father will never forgive me if I cut off my beard. He will if you do it for the good of Islam. If you want, after we return, I will pay him a visit and personally smooth over relations between the two of you. You would do that for me? For you and everyone else. Must I constantly remind you, we are brothers in arms. We must always be willing to help one another. By doing so, we set an example for those who come after us and prove to them and the world our calling is holy. Captain Mustafa Runihara wore a sailor's cap and had his calloused hands shoved into his coat's deep pockets. A crusty old salt who had fought for the Palestinian cause when it was in its infancy, he walked over to Abbas with that peculiar rolling gait long-time seamen always had. I trust everything is to your satisfaction, old friend. You will not hear any complaints, Captain. Has your communications officer been monitoring official channels and newscasts as I requested? Mm, we have. Greek authorities believe you are still in hiding somewhere on the island. The British received an anonymous phone call reporting that you left Cyprus on a fishing boat and are now in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Nicely done. Thank you, Jamila. What about the Americans? What do they say? They have been oddly silent. A spokesman for that embassy issued a short press release announcing they might have substantial news to report in another day or so. Congratulations! You slipped out right from under their noses. Five hours more and soldiers were going through every ship in port. The Americans' silence troubled him. It could mean they were onto something. More than the British, more than the Israelis, more than anyone, the Americans were the one adversary the terrorists grudgingly respected. Their technology was second to none, their training superior to most, and their dogged persistence extraordinary. I apologize for confining you to these quarters during daylight hours, but I trust you appreciate the need. We cannot risk having you seen on deck by passing ships or planes overhead. So when do we get to stretch our legs? Hmm. From midnight until 4 a.m., the ship operates with a skeleton crew. All are loyal to me, and you are free to go up and enjoy some fresh air. But if another vessel should approach, you must come below until I give you the all clear. Does your crew know who we are? A few, Rakin. Many more suspect. But they will keep their mouths shut. They are being well paid for their cooperation. He was expending almost all the reserve funds the Al Jabbar had access to on this enterprise, but the expense was justified if they succeeded. If they failed, no. He refused to entertain the thought of failure. Runihara squatted by the cot and nudged him with an elbow. So tell me, just between old friends, why are you going to America? You know better. Not even a hint. Not one that will do you any good. Besides, the terrorist doubted the old sea dog would believe him. There were moments when it was hard for him to believe it himself. The target he had chosen was a critical cog in the American government. Some would call it indispensable. For not only was its headquarters also the headquarters of Echelon, it was the hub from which the great Satan's evil spread throughout the world. 
Aban Abbas planned to destroy the National Security Agency. To his neighbors, he was known as Ben Green. A quiet, unassuming man in his early 40s, he owned a large house in a quaint residential section of Newcastle, Pennsylvania. He had painted it when he moved in two years ago and trimmed the overgrown hedgerows. In the summer, he mowed his lawn once a week. In the winter, he always shoveled his drive and the sidewalk after it snowed. He never held parties. He never blared loud music. In short, he was an ideal neighbor. Green favored baggy shirts and loose-fitting pants that effectively hid his muscular build. He was an exercise buff and started every morning, after his prayers to God, with 500 push-ups. He never went to baseball, football, or basketball games, but he did attend local soccer matches and cheered as loudly as anyone else for his favorite teams. Green worked at the library. He never missed a day of work. He never complained about his schedule. He was never gruff with patrons. He was an ideal employee. One morning, not long after Green had started work, he invited a female co-worker to his house for supper. During the meal, she innocently asked how he could afford such a fine house on a librarian's salary, and Green responded he had used money from an inheritance left to him by a doting aunt to buy the place. After that, Green never invited over another co-worker. Green was a voracious reader. He checked out more than a dozen books a week. No one noticed that mixed in with books on American history and politics were a lot of volumes dealing with the Middle East and Arab nations. Every evening when he came home at 6.10 p.m., Green stopped his car at the end of the driveway and got out to open his mailbox and check his mail. Rain or shine, he never neglected the ritual. On this particular evening, Green braked his neon, trudged to the mailbox and opened it. He wasn't in the best of moods. He missed his native land and his own people and dearly yearned to be given permission to go back for a visit, although he knew that was impossible. Once he volunteered, the die was cast. There was no going home again. Green opened the mailbox and pulled out six envelopes. Four contained bills. One was from a credit card company that wanted him to sign up for their gold card. And the last was a flyer advertising the grand opening of a new store. That was all. Sighing, Green closed the mailbox and drove his car to the garage. Turning off the ignition, he gathered up an armful of books he had checked out that day and entered his house through a side door. Green set the books on the kitchen counter, tossed the mail into a basket, and went to the fridge. There was a small eatery in downtown Newcastle that specialized in Arab dishes. The food wasn't the best. Nothing could compare to the culinary delights of Egypt. But they served passable falafel and fool, and their dates were fresh. From the fridge, Green took some falafel and made a sandwich. He cut a slab of white cheese and poured a glass of Omar Khayyam wine. Placing it all on a metal tray, he walked into the living room, sat down in his easy chair, and used the remote control to turn on the TV. Midnight tonight is the deadline given by the Jobs for America Coalition. Green frowned. The evening meal was one of his favorite times of the day. He didn't like having it interrupted. Carefully setting the tray on the floor, he picked up the receiver on the fourth ring. Hello? Your brothers are coming for a visit. For a few seconds, Green was too stunned to move. It had come. It had finally come. He had known they might use any means, mail, phone, messenger, telegram. But even so, it had been so long that it took a bit for the wonderful reality to sink in. <laughs> he spun in a circle, leaped into the air, and then remembered himself and fell to the floor to bow in thanks to God. Elation coursed through him. Some of his brothers were en route. They were kindred souls, and it would be glorious to be among his own kind again. Green loathed Americans. They were a shallow, materialistic people caught up in a mania of self-indulgence. He couldn't wait for the opportunity to strike out at them again, to punish them for their wicked ways. Taking the tray to the kitchen, Green again opened the refrigerator. He hadn't shopped in a while and was running low. Humming to himself, he left the house, climbed in his car, and drove downtown. The owner of Metza, Mr. Morgan, was at the cash register and smiled as he entered. Mr. Green, it has been a few days. 
I was beginning to think you had switched to hamburgers and fried chicken. Not in this life. I've been busy at work. What can we do for you tonight? Are you eating in or take out? I'm throwing a party this weekend, and I would like to treat my guests to some authentic Arab cuisine. If you can't find what you need here, you can't find it, period. And I must tell you, your attitude is refreshing. My attitude? Towards Arab food. I like it because my mother was Jordanian, but many Americans today don't want anything to do with something that smacks an Arab culture. Heh, <laughs> can you blame them after 9-11? No, I suppose not. I was as outraged as everyone else. But I know better than to blame all Muslims for the deeds of a few fanatics. For a while there, back then, I was afraid I might go out of business. A lot of my customers stopped coming here. Green couldn't care less, but he nodded as if he were interested and frowned to show he sympathized. Now, what can I get for you? It's a long list. I have it all right here. Hmm. Let me see here. Do you think you have all that? Most, I think. Uh, that's quite a selection. Now, I'm all out of beetroot. I am the redfish row I have never carried. Sorry. Uh, do the best you can. Well, I'm waiting. Uh, how about some Egyptian salad and a tuborg? His appetite had returned, and he hungrily forked into the mix of tomatoes, cucumbers, watercress, onions, green peppers, parsley, and mint leaves, while Morgan and a teenage helper busied themselves filling the order. He washed the salad down with the beer and sat back, content. <sighs> All set. Green paid the man and carried two of the bags out to his trunk. The teenaged assistant brought the third. Thank you, son. A little something for yourself. Oh, thanks, Mr. Green. The rich odor of the white goat's milk cheese and other culinary delights filled the car, bringing back memories of a happier time. Absorbed in the past, Green turned right onto a secondary road that wound past a golf course. Not many people used it, and he sped up to get home that much sooner. Rounding a curve, he spotted a police car parked on the shoulder on the other side. He braked, but it was too late. The police car performed a U-turn and raced after him. Green fought down fleeting panic, braked, and pulled over. He lowered his window, pulled out his wallet, and opened it to his driver's license. Good evening, sir. License and registration, please. Thank you. Were you aware you were going 37 in a 25 mile per hour zone? I'm sorry, officer. I was in a hurry to get home and wasn't paying attention. I'm gonna have to write you a ticket, sir. Wait here. Green reached under the front seat and wrapped his fingers around the butt of a 9mm Stetchkin. A sound suppressor was already threaded onto the barrel. Oh, uh, officer? Yes, sir. The rookie took two in the face and was gone before he hit the ground. Climbing out, Green looked both ways. The road was deserted. He opened the neon's trunk and moved the groceries aside to get to a toolbox. From it, he produced a pair of gloves, which he slipped on, a coil of wire, and a small grenade. The front door on the driver's side of the patrol car was still wide open. Green peered inside. He didn't see a video camera, but he wasn't leaving anything to chance. Tying one end of the wire to the grenade's pin, he wedged the grenade under the front seat and slowly backed off, unwinding wire as he went. Once in his own car, he unwound another 60 yards or so, let it dangle out the window, and was set to tromp on the gas when he looked into the side mirror and saw the young cop still sprawled on the street and the clipboard beside him. Placing the roll of wire on the seat, Green slid out and retrieved the ticket book. He had almost made an unforgivable blunder. Tossing the incriminating evidence into the back seat, he climbed in, looped the roll of wire around the steering wheel, and accelerated. The wire rapidly played out, plucking the pin as it drew taut. The explosion blew out the police car's windows and caused the cruiser's front wheels to buck into the air. It also set off the fuel tank. Molten flame wreathed the vehicle as it soared over a ditch like a great ungainly bird. Flipping, it landed on its roof, which crumpled like so much paper. Green didn't stay to admire his handiwork. Raveling the wire, he pushed the speedometer to 60. At a stop sign, he turned right. So far, God was smiling on him. He hadn't encountered any other vehicles. At the next intersection, he had to wait for the light to change before he could go. 
Holding to the speed limit, he soon pulled into his driveway and steered into the garage. Green killed the headlights and sat in the dark. If the young one had radioed in his license number, their computers would have spit back there was no such person. They would have placed him under arrest. When his brothers in arms arrived, he would have been languishing behind bars. He couldn't let that happen. Green slowly pried his hands from the steering wheel. They were shaking. He was sick to death of America. Sick to death of playing the part of a meek law-abiding simpleton. He craved action. He prayed that when his brothers arrived, they had a part for him in their mission. His dyed hair and beardless chin were an affront to Islam. I am Sefu Salim Abbas. Reaching out, Sefu touched his reflection and smiled. Olin was of two minds about his downtime. On the one hand, he liked being able to hone his marksmanship and other skills. He also liked learning how to handle new weapons and hardware. He even enjoyed devoting an hour or two to reading a book or watching a movie. What he didn't like was an excess. A day here, a day there he could handle. A three-day stretch he could live with. Any longer, and he began to feel like a tiger in a cage. Now it was the morning of the fourth day since Bolin returned to Stony Man Farm, and he was feeling antsy. He wanted to get back into the world. He kept hoping the feds would uncover new intel that would set him on the Aljabar's trail, but so far their efforts had turned up nothing. Bolin rose early, as was his custom. He put on a dark blue sweatsuit, donned a black headband, and headed outside to go jogging. Situated in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, to all outward appearances, Stony Man Farm seemed no different from the scores of other farms in the region. But looks were deceiving. Hidden behind a facade of ordinary buildings was a state-of-the-art complex that was the nerve center for the most elite commandos in the country. Phoenix Force and Able Team operated out of Stony Man, as did Mac Bolin when he and the government had a common goal. They were supported by the cadre of computer and ops experts, the best in their respective fields, along with a number of techs who kept the sophisticated equipment humming. A golden crown heralded the dawn when Bolin stepped outside. The morning air was crisp and invigorating. <sighs> the door behind him opened. A whiff of familiar perfume told Bolin who it was before he turned. Barbara Price was the farm's mission controller. Morning. Mind if I join you? Price was more than a friend. On occasion, when either felt the need for companionship, they would get together for an evening. Or the night. Not at all. I just hope you can keep up. Oh, my, my, aren't we feeling smug this morning? They started off running side by side. Occasionally, their elbows brushed. Bolin was content to jog, but Price wasn't. She lived for her work. The latest satellite photos show no activity at the Aljabar Fortress. We doubt they'll try and rebuild now that it's been compromised. Based on the available intel, we think about 10 members are unaccounted for. Most, if not all, were probably involved in the Cypress escapade. Where they went afterward is anyone's guess. Too bad we didn't learn of it beforehand. It caught everyone off guard. For years, they've been content to specialize in assassinations. Then they go and make a quantum jump into the big leagues. I can't help but wonder what they've got up their sleeve. I want first crack at them. Don't worry. This is your baby. If intelligence comes up with anything, we'll send you in before we call on Phoenix Force or Able Team. Thanks. My big worry is that Cyprus wasn't an anomaly. That the Al-Jabbar has permanently shifted gears into a new phase. They could be getting ambitious. Any luck tracking down Abbas? Not yet. The fingerprints we took off the watch and the other items you brought back weren't in any database. We're cross-referencing all our files on every known criminal who's ever belonged to a terrorist organization, but so far there's no record of anyone by that name. It's the worst case scenarios. A major player who's a complete unknown. We can't even run a psych profile on the guy. You should be able to once the journal is translated. Oh, which reminds me. I expect to have a hard copy by one this afternoon. You want to sit in on the briefing? We'll be in the war room. I'll be there. 
What about that book with the list of names and phone numbers? We're still working on it. Most are in the Middle East countries, where the gears grind exceedingly slow. Hey, any interest in joining me for supper? About six-ish? I was thinking chicken Alfredo with a little wine. Make mine a beer instead, and you've got yourself a deal. Fair enough. It's a date. The freighter was only a few hours out of Cadiz, Spain, where the terrorists would transfer to the tanker Caspian, when Captain Rooney Hara brought Aban Abbas a radiogram. The message was in a code Abbas created expressly for his people. To the uninformed, it appeared to be a letter to a close friend, updating him on family affairs. To Abbas, it was far more, and far worse. Jamila, always sensitive to his moods, was first to notice. What is wrong? You have gone pale as a sheet. Our fortress has been destroyed. How can that be? What about our brothers we left behind? Only Nasir is left, and he was lucky to escape with his life. The rest are gone. Abbas lowered the message and bowed his head. He was devastated. The work of years, gone. Men he had nurtured like his own children, all slain. Questions flew fast and furious. Abbas took a deep breath and steeled himself. He had to be strong, for their sakes, if not his own. Sharik, the description he gives is of a large, dark-haired man. Him again! I warned you, did I not? Whoever he is, he intends to wipe us from the face of the earth. How did this man find our base? We destroyed the Echelon facility that was tracking us. Perhaps the Americans tracked us down before that. We have not seen the last of that devil. This time, Abbas didn't object to Sharik's use of that word. He was inclined to agree. Islamabad, Athens, Thenis, Turkey, now Somalia. The dark-haired one was always there, like an unwanted shadow. It was entirely possible he would show up in America, too. Something had to be done. Somehow, their pursuer had to be disposed of. If only they could lure him into a trap. But how, when they had no bait? Then it hit him. They most certainly did have bait. The kind their pursuer couldn't resist. Themselves. Lying down with his hands behind his head, the boss stared at the bulkhead and turned his mind to the task of turning the tables. After a while, a devious smile lit his face. He had just the thing. God willing, not only would the Al-Jabbar destroy the NSA and Echelon, but they would also eliminate the dark-haired thorn in their side. The war room was in the basement of the main building at Stony Man Farm. Bolin took the elevator down and found four people already seated. He nodded to Barbara Price and slid into a chair between her and the man at the head of the table. How Brognola had flown in from Washington, D.C. an hour earlier. The big fed looked as if he hadn't had a good night's sleep in a while, but that was typical. An unlit cigar was clamped in his mouth, and he was chewing on it as if it were a pretzel. Glad to see you can make it, Striker. The elevator got stuck on the 14th floor. You had that problem, too. Aaron Kurtzman, a barrel-chested, wheelchair-bound man affectionately dubbed the Bear, was Stony Man's wizard at intelligence gathering and assimilation, and often advised Prognola on critical matters. He also headed Stony Man's cybernetic team, which consisted of three exceptionally intelligent and talented individuals, one of whom was next to him, lightly tapping on the table in time to music only he could hear. Akira Tokaida was the youngest of the mission control team. One would never guess to look at him, clad in a denim jacket and faded jeans, with the earbuds to a portable CD player firmly implanted in his ears, that he was a certifiable genius. He had his eyes closed and hadn't heard Bolin arrive. I think we can begin, Kurtzman, provided you can tear your protege away from his music. Kids nowadays... One tap on the shoulder sent Akira smiling sheepishly, who turned off the CD and placed his hand on a small stack of red binders in front of him. Sorry. Sometimes I forget myself. Have we started? We'd like to. What can you tell us about the journal? Translating it posed no problem. It wasn't encoded. Just basic, everyday Arabic. We scanned it for any hidden code, but the journal is exactly what it appears to be. Namely, the private musings of Aban Abbas, the founder of the Al-Jabbar. Akira, you can hand them out. The red binders were passed around. Bolin opened his. 
It was a reproduction in English of Abbas's journal. The title was telling. The words and wisdom of a humble, holy warrior of God? The whole journal was like that, filled with pious rhetoric about the need to crush the great Satan, along with everyday entries that read like a diary. You've read the whole thing, I take it. All 102 pages, to Kaido and I both. Break it down for us. In terms of hard intel, it's a disappointment. Abbas is shrewd. He doesn't mention associates by name. He leaves blanks instead. Regardless, we learned Aban Abbas is Egyptian, born in a small village south of Cairo. His parents are deceased. He has three brothers and two sisters. One of them might, and I stress might, be involved in terrorist activity. The others chose normal lives. He started the journal about the same time he formed the Al Jabbar. But he never identifies the members except to say where a few are from. Toward the end, he goes on and on about a renegade Saudi he has high hopes for as a source of funds. Well, that's a valuable lead in itself. The Saudi government takes a dim view of rogues. With a little political prodding, they might be persuaded to ID the guy. I'll do what I can. What else? Abbas displays a pathological hatred of the United States. We've seen his kind at work before, but he's more intelligent than your run-of-the-mill fanatic. He has a warrior's spirit. Where do you get that from, Takaido? From his writings. He says a true warrior should confront an enemy face to face. But he realized that isn't always practical in today's world, so he chose assassination as his preferred modus operandi. Two whole pages are devoted to denouncing the World Trade Center attacks as misguided. This from the guy responsible for blowing up our echelon site in Cyprus. His philosophy has undergone a sweeping change. Maybe. Maybe not. In his eyes, the site was a legitimate target. Notice he didn't kill civilians. I'm willing to bet a year's salary that if civilians had been there, they'd be as dead as the echelon staff. Abbas might see himself as some sort of holy warrior, but when you boil it down, he's nothing but another cold-blooded killer. Correlate what we've gleaned so far and give it to your support staff for further analysis. Then go through the journal again, and as many times as necessary, to milk it for every bit of intel it has to offer. No reference, however obscure, should be overlooked. Barbara, what about that list of phone numbers? We're still working on it. So far, we've established that a lot are to ordinary businesses and individuals with no overt links to the Al-Jabbar. I hope to God it's not another dead end. The door opened, and in came a woman who worked in the communications center. She quietly apologized for interrupting, then handed the big fed a manila folder. Thank you. His eyebrows arched, and suddenly he buried his nose in the folder like a bloodhound taking to new scent. I'll be damned. Christmas come early. Care to share the good news? It seems a police officer in Newcastle, Pennsylvania pulled over a speeder three days ago. The patrol car was demolished. The culprit thought he got away scot-free. But he doesn't know the officers radioed in the make and license number of his vehicle. The police located him, but haven't made a move. Background check revealed the ID is a complete fraud. Nothing remarkable there so far. It seems the guy also has an interest in all things Arabic. Since he fit the profile of a potential sleeper, the police notified the FBI. Sleepers were terrorist moles who went underground, assuming American identities and living ordinary lives until they were activated. Bolin had encountered more than his fair share of the duplicitous agents. This morning, the Bureau set up a listening post across the street. They've got the guy on tape, talking to himself in Arabic. So they sent a report up through the proper channels. The transcript is included. For some reason, he's repeated the same three words several times. Sefu Salim Abbas. Special Agent Phil Durkin was playing it by the book. His team was monitoring the suspect around the clock to establish the man's habits. They had to take him when he least expected, with minimal risk to civilians. The house the FBI was using was directly across the street, belonging to an industrial engineer by the name of Stusman, who hadn't objected one bit to staying in a hotel at government expense until it was over. Earlier that day, Durkin received a phone call from the director. When Agent Frank Hengel told him who it was, Durkin thought it was a joke, 
The only time he had ever seen the Bureau's head of operations was at a regional meeting where he'd given a speech on the future of the Bureau. Sir? Apprise me of the situation, Agent. I believe we have the situation well in hand. Excellent. We can't blow this. I've received word from higher up. They want this man alive and unharmed. We can take him any time you say. Don't rush things. Take as much time as you need. Do not let him slip through your fingers. Once you have the suspect under wraps, call me, day or night. Here's my personal number. Fishing a pen from his suit, Durkin hastily scribbled it down. I'll contact you the second we cuff him, sir. Agent Durkin, do you know what a career-making moment is? Of course, sir. This is one of them. You can count on me, sir. I hope so. Now, take a few deep breaths. You're a highly trained professional. Use that training. Stick to procedure so if something does go wrong, no one can hold it against you. Understood? Yes, sir. Durkin walked over to the agent glued to the directional microphone. It was trained on a second-story bedroom window. Ben Green, or whatever his real name was, liked to sleep with a window halfway open at night and never bothered to close it all the way. He tapped Agent James Farouk on the shoulder, and Farouk removed his headphones. Anything new? No, sir. He hasn't made or received any phone calls since he came home from work. He's not the type who talks to himself a lot. Durkin nodded. Farouk was on loan from the Pittsburgh office. His mother was a Kuwaiti, and Farouk was one of the few FBI agents in all the Northeast fluent in Arabic. Whenever a possible sleeper was uncovered in the tri-state area, he was flown in to handle the translating. The only things he said in the past hour are, I can't wait, and that name he keeps saying every so often, Sefu Salim Abbas. Is it possible that's his real name? I can't say, sir. Strange of him to repeat it like he's doing, if it is. Durkin moved to one side of the picture window. The living room was dark, the curtains drawn halfway. The well-kept house across the street, with its neatly trimmed lawn and late-model car in the driveway, seemed so ordinary, it was hard to believe it could harbor a foreign fanatic bent on America's destruction. An agent was posted at each of the upstairs windows facing the target residence. Agent Noonan's post was the master bedroom. He had pulled a chair close enough to see out without being seen, and he motioned for Durkin to take a seat. Watch the house to the left of Green's and tell me if I'm imagining things. Durkin looked but saw nothing. A minute elapsed, and he was about to comment to that effect when the drapes on a ground floor side window parted and a woman appeared. She stared at Green's place for ten seconds or so, then closed the curtains. What the hell? She's been doing that every couple of minutes for about quarter of an hour now. I don't know what to make of it. Neither did Durkin. She had to be watching the Green place. If she kept it up, Green might notice. And the last thing Durkin needed was for the suspect to become suspicious things weren't as they should be. Why would she do that? It's almost as if she knows about Green, but that can't be. Durkin came out of the chair as if jolted by lightning. Call the hotel. Ask Mrs. Stusman if she's phoned any of her friends and told them what we're up to. She wouldn't. You specifically told them they weren't to say a word to anyone. Uh, some people just love to gab. Farouk, if you hear anything unusual, tell me immediately. He's watching a movie on pay-per-view. Snakes on a plane. Sounds good. Durkin was too concerned about having their surveillance compromised to appreciate the humor. One look at his face was enough for Durkin. <sighs> Your hunch was right on the money. The woman in the house next door is Mrs. Agatha Cleary. She's Mrs. Stusman's best friend. Mrs. Stusman thought it best to warn her about Green. Durkin partly blamed himself. When the Stusmans had asked why the FBI wanted to take over their house for a few days, at the time he'd seen no harm in mentioning Green was a suspected terrorist. Now he wished he'd simply told them it was a matter of national security and let it go at that. Mrs. Stusman swears she didn't call anyone else. Durkin gazed across the street. Procedure dictated that once they were compromised, the suspect should be taken into custody. But Durkin was loath to go barging in. Green was bound to put up a fight, and the orders from above were explicit. They wanted him alive and unharmed. So they should wait and do it by the numbers. But if Green was on to them, he could fly the coop any time. Once the sun sets, I want this block cordoned off like a steel drum. We'll wait about an hour or so after he's gone to bed and take him in his sleep. And Mrs. Cleary? 
phone her and tell her that if she shows her face at that window again, I'll have her charged with interfering with federal agents in the performance of their duty. Do you really want me to say that, sir? No. Ask her pretty please to stay as far from that side of the house as she can until we notify her that the coast is clear. Uh, I just hope our boy isn't on to us. Sefu Abbas was like a cat on a hot tin roof. He couldn't stay still for more than a few seconds. He kept glancing at the telephone, wishing it would ring, wishing he would find out exactly when his Aljabar brothers were due to arrive. Initially, he thought it might be within hours, or possibly the next day, but several had come and gone, and he hadn't heard a thing. Sefu hoped nothing had happened to them. He surfed the news channels every half hour or so, but there had been no mention of the Aljabar since the attack on the Echelon facility. Immense pride flooded him every time he saw video footage of the destruction, and with it, more than a little confusion. Sefu clearly remembered his older brother saying that to blow up buildings was the act of a coward. True warriors, Aban had proclaimed, fought their enemies face to face, man to man. Yet the Aljabar had blown up the building on Cyprus. Sefu hoped to learn why when his brothers arrived. Sefu rose and began to pace. He was a bundle of restless energy and had been at work also, always on the go, always having to do something. It was wrong, he knew. He was supposed to be a model of self-control. But how could he not be excited after all this time? Stepping to the picture window, he idly gazed up and down the street. It would be night soon, and the neighborhood lay quiet under gathering twilight. Lights had come on all up and down the block. He glanced across the street. Sefu stared at the home directly across from his. The Stusmans lived there. The husband was a football nut, the wife a chattering simpleton. Their house was always lit up. Even when they went out, they left the lights blazing. Typical wasteful Americans. Yet now their house was dark. For the first time since Sefu had moved in, not a single light shone in any of their windows. And yet another oddity. Their curtains were partially drawn. Not just downstairs, but upstairs as well. They had never done that before. Sefu walked to his kitchen. One window faced his backyard, another faced his neighbors to the north, the Clearies. Leaving his light off, he peered north just in time to see Mrs. Cleary's face at a ground floor window. She was gazing at his bedroom. He saw her twist and speak to someone. A hand thrust a phone at her. She talked a moment, then snapped her curtains shut. Before coming to America, Sefu had gone through rigorous training. Part of it had to do with learning to stay alert to changes around him. Every person had their habits, every neighborhood its own rhythms. When those habits and rhythms were broken, it was cause for concern. Sefu went to his bedroom, yanked on the top drawer to his dresser, tossed the few shirts it contained onto his bed, and pried open the secret panel he had installed shortly after he moved in. The wood matched that of the dresser perfectly. From it, he took two passports, a wallet containing a driver's license in the name of Simon LeBeau, and other forged papers. He shoved them into a pocket. Opening his closet, Sefu shrugged into a black jacket and zipped it all the way up. Kneeling, he pulled an old pair of boots from a corner. From one, he drew an Astra 300. It was an older make pistol, and Sefu liked it because it was short, light, and had the magazine catch on the heel of the butt, European style. The same boot also concealed a sound suppressor, which he threaded on. From the other boot, Sefu removed two magazines, already loaded, and a box of 9mm shorts. He inserted one of the magazines, pulled back the slide to feed a round into the chamber, and tucked the Astra under his belt. The other magazine and the spare ammo went in his jacket. To reach the basement, Sefu had to go through the kitchen. Quietly descending, he crossed to a rear window. A stepladder was beside it, placed there for this very contingency. Climbing it, he peeked out. The backyard was shrouded in darkness. He didn't see anyone along the fence, and the gate was still closed. He worked the latch and pushed the window open. Squeezing through, he crouched and drew the pistol. The neighborhood was uncommonly quiet. No children were yelling. No dogs were barking. Staying low, he crouch-walked to the gate, which was shoulder-high. The alley appeared to be empty until someone called. <coughs> A vague figure was at the south end. It took a while to spot another to the north. 
Policemen, Sefu assumed. They had him boxed in, or so they thought. Sefu stalked to the south. The policeman on the other side was leaning against the fence, and the top of his head jutted above it. Slowly extending the Astra until the business end almost touched him, Sefu squeezed the trigger. Catching hold of the top of the fence, Sefu swung up and over. He looked toward the north, but the policeman there hadn't heard the cough of the suppressor. Back toward the side street, Sefu spied a sedan parked at the curb a dozen feet past the alley. A man in a brown suit was near the front bumper, his hands in his pockets, looking bored. Sefu rose, held the pistol behind him, lowered his chin, and strolled along the sidewalk whistling to himself. From under hooded lids, he saw the man stiffen in surprise. Excuse me, sir, this block is... <coughs> Sefu shot him between the eyes. Frisking the body, he found the keys to the car and a wallet. A block from the bus station, he abandoned it. The next departure was in ten minutes. He didn't care where it was going. He would take it as far as the next town, get off and place a call to a contact in Philadelphia who would arrange for him to reach a safe house. Since he had nothing better to do, Sefu examined the wallet. He was stunned to discover the man he had shot wasn't a policeman, but an agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Sefu grinned. Like so much about America, they were vastly overrated. The tanker Caspian was 12 miles from the U.S. coast on a direct bearing to New York City when the Coast Guard intercepted her. The newest in the high endurance class, the ship, named Exeter, was equipped with a helicopter flight deck, the most sophisticated navigation gear known to man, and fixed mounted machine guns fore and aft. Captain Mark Wagner ordered the captain of the Caspian to bring the tanker to a dead stop in the water and prepare to be boarded. Below Wagner's position on the Exeter's bridge, the retractable hangar was being rolled out. The pilot and co-pilot were waiting to board the copter, along with a five-man boarding team. Standard procedure for a four-man team, but Wagner had orders to make an exception in this case. He stared at the new addition, a big dark-haired man in a pea coat who had arrived that afternoon at the cutter's berth carrying a duffel bag. They had been told to expect him and commanded to do whatever he required. The helicopter being prepared for liftoff was a Sikorsky HH-60J Jayhawk, one of a fleet of 42. Fitted with a Navstar global positioning system and coupled Doppler hover capability, it was the backbone of the Coast Guard's air arm. Twin T-700 GE-401C engines could propel it at a cruising speed of 150 knots for over six hours. Extra fuel capacity enabled it to fly 300 miles out to sea, stay on site hovering for almost an hour, and still have enough fuel left to make it back safely. The Caspian was slowing. Wagner instructed his helmsman to pace her and craned his neck upward. The tanker dwarfed his vessel. A slight turn to starboard and the Caspian could crush the Exeter like so much kindling. A few crewmen were leaning over the rail, staring down. Ordinary swabs who might have no idea the tanker was suspected of harboring terrorists somewhere within its massive superstructure. Presently, both ships were dead in the water, floating side by side in a choppy sea with slate-gray clouds scuttling overhead. The latest weather data wasn't promising. A storm was approaching from the west, but it wouldn't arrive before they were done. They had been ordered to wrap up their search in two hours' time, which was hardly enough to do a thorough job. But then, Wagner had to remember their main priority wasn't the interdiction itself, but ensuring the dark-haired man in the peacoat got on board the tanker. Who was he? Wagner wondered one last time, and gave a thumbs-up sign to the pilot about to climb into the chopper. Lieutenant Harv Dickerson had a reputation for being a bit of a cowboy, which was fitting since he hailed from Oklahoma. After strapping himself into his seat in the cockpit, he began to run through the standard pre-flight check with his co-pilot. Dickerson twisted and saw his boarding team climb into the bay. The dark-haired man in the peacoat entered last and took a seat at the front. Anything special we need to do when we get up there, mister? He didn't quite know what to make of the guy, and he wasn't sure he liked being party to subterfuge, but orders were orders. Do what you'd ordinarily do, and forget I'm even here. 
Will do. One thing. The men I'm after won't hesitate to kill you if they suspect anything. You and your men stay frosty. Thanks for the warning, but don't worry about us. We're old hands at this. We can take care of ourselves. Dickerson forgot about their special guest and resumed his duties. He had to get the twin T-700 GE-401C turboshaft engines up to speed and finish the prelim checks. You're clear for liftoff, Harv. Roger that. He took her up, whisking off the deck like a hummingbird taking flight, then banked sharply to make the steep vertical climb. He was, in effect, springboarding from one vessel to the other, a move designed to prevent anyone so inclined from getting a lock on them and shooting them down. Springboarding from one vessel to another required considerable skill, and Dickerson was one of the best. Although he had done it a hundred times or more, he felt his stomach churn slightly and hoped the guy in the peacoat didn't lose his lunch. As the Jayhawk swept up over the tanker, Dickerson had a moment to marvel at its size. The Caspian was a thousand feet long and close to 200 feet wide, one of the largest in her class. She was also one of the oldest, and her age showed in the wear and tear her hull had sustained, and the rust no amount of elbow grease could remove. Three crewmen were waiting, the stocky figure of their captain foremost among them. Dickerson brought the Jayhawk down on the proverbial dime. He landed so close to the reception committee they had to hold their caps on their heads to keep them from being blown off. Ensign Jake Murphy yanked the bay door open and deployed his men between the crewmen and the aircraft. Unstrapping, Dickerson gave control to the co-pilot. No one is to step foot in here, you hear? The guy in the peacoat hadn't moved, and it dawned on Dickerson that he had sat in the one spot where he was least likely to be seen from outside. The tanker's captain was a blockhouse on legs. He had a deep scar on his left cheek, and part of his right earlobe was missing. He smiled in greeting, but the smile did not touch his beady, glittering eyes. Welcome aboard. My ship and my crew are at your complete disposal. We appreciate that. We'll start aft and work forward. I assure you, I run a clean ship. Well, that's for us to find out. Lead the way, if you don't mind. They started off, and as Dickerson passed the Jayhawk, he realized something else. The orders from on high had specified they had to intercept the tanker one hour before sunset and be done one hour after the sun had gone down. He hadn't thought much of it at the time, but now it hit him that it would give the guy in the peacoat plenty of time to slip unnoticed off the Jayhawk in the dark. Who was that guy, Dickerson wondered, and then thought no more about him and got down to the business at hand. Mac Bolan sat quietly as the Coast Guardsmen and the reception committee hiked toward the stern. He went on sitting there as the minutes ticked by. Ten, twenty, thirty, and still Bolan didn't move. A couple of crewmen came along the catwalk toward the Jayhawk, but the co-pilot, a lieutenant junior grade named Gabriel, shooed them away. Bolin shifted the duffel in his lap. He had another half hour yet. By then, it would be dark enough. The feds had intercepted several cryptic transmissions to and from the Caspian that led them to suspect members of the Al-Jabbar were on board. One had been in code, but there wasn't a code invented that Akira Tokaido and his software couldn't crack. The message hadn't mentioned names, but it warned the recipient that their castle had been breached and they had to meet somewhere else. It was so amateurish, it was almost childish. The reference to a castle had to be Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Sefu Abbas was warning those on the tanker not to go there. Instead, they were to rendezvous where cats grew trees for whiskers, in the message's own words. The Stony Man staff hadn't figured out where that was yet, but they were working around the clock, and it was only a matter of time. Brognola didn't know how many terrorists were on board, but he was going to ensure that none would set foot on U.S. soil. Bolin had agreed to the plan. It sounded foolproof, but that was still no guarantee. The sun was sinking below the horizon. Bolin stirred and swiveled in his seat so he could see the length of the tanker. No one was nearby. Gradually, the shadows lengthened. By Bolin's watch, it had been exactly one hour since Dickerson and company left when he stood, duffel in hand, and stepped to the door. It wasn't his usual bag, but a smaller one he had requisitioned expressly for this op. The Jayhawk had landed between the foremast and the forward deck house. Hopping down, Bolin walked around the tail assembly and crept past the foremast. No one was on the crow's nest. With all the electronic navigation equipment tankers had to guide them, the crow's nest wasn't used all that often. 
Bolin moved around to the far side of the anchor windlass and mooring winch. They were large enough to conceal a car and wouldn't see use until the ship docked. Ducking behind the winch, she unzipped the duffel and removed an MP5K. It was another variation on the standard Heckler and Koch short version of the MP5 subgun, and different from the one he had used in Greece. Among the modifications on this one was a folding butt, which he now extended, and a custom sound suppressor, which he attached. He also attached a laser spot sight. The feature he liked most, though, was a three-round burst unit. Lastly, his MP5K came with a sling, which he looped over his left arm. Unbuttoning his peacoat, Bolin made sure his grenades were attached to his combat vest. Not explosive grenades. Only a fool would use one on a tanker filled to capacity. These were smoke grenades and flash illumination grenades that emitted 55,000 candle power for up to 30 seconds. The last two items Bolin took from the duffel were a cellular phone he clipped to his belt and mini binoculars fitted with a strap which he slid over his head and around his neck. He leaned his shoulder against the winch and settled down to wait. Now and then he saw a crewman across the huge deck, but always at a distance. Once he watched a seaman on a bicycle inspect tank hatches. Another time a man came down the forward catwalk toward the foremast, but he was only checking a valve, and when he was done he went back into the deck house. Night fell. The tanker's running lights automatically came on. Much of the deck was left dark, which made Boland's job that much easier. The lieutenant in the helicopter switched on the Jayhawk's lights, along with a spotlight that lit up a wide circle around it. Almost two hours to the minute after the Jayhawk had set down, Lieutenant Dickerson and his team reappeared on deck. They found no sign of the terrorists. After a short talk between Dickerson and Captain Tuskindi, the Coast Guardsmen climbed into their aircraft. The Jayhawk rose and dipped over the starboard rail, bound for its nest on the Exeter. Through the binoculars, Bolin saw Tuskindi flip his middle finger at the copter. The crewman with him laughed. They had pulled one over on the Coast Guard and were proud of it. Clapping one another on the back, they turned and ambled into the deck house. It was Bolin's cue. Rising, he climbed onto the catwalk and raced aft. Human nature being what it was, Tuskindi would probably go straight to the hidden men to let them know the coast was clear. Soon the Caspian would be underway. Bolin was 50 yards from the deck house when the same crewman who had checked on the valve a while ago emerged and came down the catwalk toward him. Bolin gripped the top rail and levered himself over, down onto the deck. He dropped lightly, making little noise thanks to the soft soles of his shoes. Cloaked in shadow, he listened. As soon as the footsteps faded, he jumped up, caught hold of the bottom rail and clambered back onto the catwalk. Precious seconds were being squandered. Bolin couldn't afford to lose sight of Tuskindi. He ran to the deck house, but veered wide of a spotlight and over to a ladder. The deck house was built like three boxes stacked on top of one another, each slightly smaller than the one below. He scaled the ladder to the second level, then went up another ladder to the top. Moving past several antennae, he crouched at the aft railing. The corners of his mouth worked upward. Tuskindi had gone through the deck house and was hurrying along the next section of catwalk toward the stern. Bolin sprinted to another ladder. Instead of using the rungs, he placed a hand and foot on either side and slid down. He did the same with the next ladder and reached the main deck. By then, Tuskindi was nearing the king posts. Paralleling the catwalk and keeping to the shadows, Bolin dogged the Russian's steps. According to Bruno Tuskindi's file at Stony Man, he was as shady as they came. He had avoided prison so far only because he was clever enough never to be caught with his hands dirty. The feds suspected him of running drugs and guns, among other illegal activities. He would do anything for the right price. The terrorists couldn't have chosen a better candidate to sneak them into the country. The same file contained a flag warning that Tuskindi was prone to fits of incredible violence. Twice in different ports he had been arrested for beating other men so severely they had been hospitalized for weeks. In each instance, Tuskindi claimed self-defense. Since neither victim preferred to press charges, he'd been released. Then there was the knife fight that made Tuskindi a legend among cargo ship crews everywhere. In a seedy bar in Lisbon, Tuskindi and another captain took a fancy to the same barmaid. After Tuskindi knocked his rival down, the captain and three friends came at him with knives. Tuskindi pulled his own. When it was over, Tuskindi was the only man standing. No doubt about it, Bruno Tuskindi was a dangerous man, and most of his crew were cut from the same coarse cloth. 
He suddenly halted and gazed to the south. Boland did likewise. The Exeter was circling toward the continental U.S., her flag flying proudly. The Russian lumbered on. On the watch for cables, gas vent lines, and hatch covers, Boland followed. He passed under two huge pipes that bridged the deck from side to side. Once past them, he could see the seven-story wheelhouse astern. Atop it were a towering radar mast and radar antennae. Tuskindi reached a point midway between the king posts and the wheelhouse and halted again. Hopping down from the catwalk, he went to a tank hatch on the port side. Bending, he opened the hatch, gazed toward the distant cutter once more, and climbed down into the hold. To reach that hatch, Bolin had to cross over the catwalk. He climbed up the near side and was in the act of hooking his leg over the opposite rail when a door in the wheelhouse opened, spilling a rectangle of light into the night and bathing him in its harsh glare. Vaulting over, he hunkered under the lip. Two men sauntered by where Bolin had stood only moments ago, talking loudly. Boland waited until the pair was out of sight, then raced to the open hatch and ducked below. Descending four rungs, Boland paused. He was suspended above a catwalk that ran the width of the vessel. A bulkhead was to his left, the hold to his right. There was no trace of Tuskindi. The soldier slid silently to the catwalk. What few lights there were did little to alleviate the gloom. After 75 feet, he came to another ladder, this one leading into the tanker's bowels. Far below, a slit of light appeared where there shouldn't be one. Boland descended faster. He couldn't predict how long Tuskindi would be down there, and it wouldn't do to be caught partway down and have the Russian sound an alarm. His plan was to eliminate the terrorists and slip off the ship when she docked, with the crew none the wiser. Boland's souls barely touched the rungs, but it seemed as if the ladder went on forever. At last, he neared the bottom. Shifting the MP5K so he could fire from the hip if he had to, he climbed down the rest of the way and swung toward the light. He found himself in an enclosed space five feet square. A door to a compartment was concealed in the bilge well, the lowest part of the hold where the ship curved from the keel. Bruno Tuskindi's gravelly tones reached Boland's ears as he sidled to the opening. We will wait until the crew has been offloaded to sneak you ashore. It must be done in the middle of the night when the docks are emptiest. I do not like having to stay down here another four or five days. That is how long you told us it would take, is it not? Better safe than sorry, eh, Abbas? Boland peeked past the door and saw several Arab men lounging in chairs or sprawled about. The captain and the terrorist mastermind, though, were around a corner, and he couldn't get a look at Aban Abbas. I believe in taking all due precautions, yes, but the delay that long is unacceptable. Look, you agreed to abide by my terms. No questions asked. Remember? And do you remember our leader telling you that we would do as you want, so long as your actions do not endanger us? How the hell is waiting a few more days going to hurt? Oh, I get it. You're worried about the Coast Guard. How many times must I repeat myself? They're not about to check us over again after we dock. I do not share your confidence. The fact that they stopped the Caspian shows the American government suspects something. So I would prefer that my people and I are not on board when you reach New York City. What do you want me to do? Lower you over the side in a lifeboat when we're half a mile out? That would serve our purpose admirably. And how do I explain the missing lifeboat to my superiors? No, you are on my ship and you will do as I instruct you. One of the terrorists near the door glanced toward it and Boland jerked back. You must have us confused with your crew. We are not at your beck and call. We are free to do as we deem best. You will arrange to have us lowered over this side when I give you the word. Who the hell do you think you are bossing me around? All I need to do is snap my fingers and two dozen of the meanest sea dogs who ever drew breath will pin you down here until you starve. I do not like being threatened. That makes two of us of us. The subject is closed. I have matters to attend. Not so fast. What's this? You're not letting me leave? Tell these pups of yours to get out of my way, or I will slit their stupid throats. I have heard of your reputation with a blade, but I've never put much stock in them myself. All things being equal, a man with a knife will lose every time to a man with a gun. Now you just hold on. You don't want to shoot this close to the tank. You could set off an explosion. Do not insult my intelligence, Captain, and I will not insult yours. The Caspian's tanks are made of reinforced steel. It would take a bazooka to penetrate one. Small arms fire will have no effect at all. Malik, 
Check outside to make sure he came here alone. We do not want his crew to find out. It's him! The executioner leveled the MP5K and fired a three-round burst, but quick as he was, Sharik sprang past the corner out of harm's way. Another Al-Jabbar member a few feet behind him wasn't as fortunate. The rounds cored his chest and flipped him onto his back. Poland slammed the door shut, but that only bought him a few seconds. He couldn't hold them at bay indefinitely, not when all they had to do was shoot through the door to turn him into a corpse. One recourse was left. Springing to the ladder, Boland started up swiftly. He didn't take his eyes off the door to the secret compartment, and when it opened slowly, he stopped and palmed a flash grenade. Letting the MP5K hang by its sling, he gripped the grenade and yanked the pin. Several heads appeared in the doorway. The terrorists weren't looking up and didn't see him toss the grenade right down on top of them. Striking one man's shoulder, it bounced into the compartment. Boland pressed his face against his right forearm and closed his eyes. Even so, when the grenade went off, he suffered the effect of staring into a bright white flame. He mentally counted to 30, opened his eyes again and resumed climbing. Around him, brilliant dots danced and swirled, like a swarm of fireflies gone amok. The terrorists were a lot worse off. Two came stumbling through the doorway, their hands clasped to their faces, and one collided with a bulkhead. It would be several minutes before the effect wore off. In that time, Bolin intended to find a spot on the catwalk where he commanded a clear line of fire, and keep them pinned below until the tanker reached port. A simple enough strategy, but it depended on an element over which he had no control, the crew not interfering. <clears throat> oh, shit. Before too long, Boland's position would become untenable. There were two hatches into the hold, the one he came through and another to starboard. If crewmen came down both, he'd face hostile fire from multiple directions at once. The cramped confines of the catwalk weren't to Boland's liking. They limited his maneuverability and his options. The best place to conduct a firefight was up on deck. Steps rang on the ladder below him. A burly terrorist was scaling it two rungs at a time. He had an SMG, and when he spotted Bolin, he tried to bring it into play. The executioner had already activated the laser sight on his MP5K. Fixing a red dot on the center of the terrorist's forehead, he squeezed the trigger. The man flopped backward, but didn't fall. One leg became entangled in the rungs, and the body dangled upside down, great red drops dripping from the entry and exit wounds. The starboard hatch was a good 125 feet away and blanketed in darkness. He thought he saw someone drop to the catwalk, and Bolin hurriedly backed into the shadows. He spun and raced toward the port hatch. They were trying to reach it to cut him off. If they did, he would be pinned between the hatches. Easy prey. Bolin ran. It became a race. Bolin was unable to tell who had the lead, but whoever did, it wasn't by much. He reached the ladder and glanced up to see the opening partially blocked by a crewman about to climb down. Bolin leaped to one side and felt the catwalk quake with the impact. Stepping back under the hatch, he saw a second crewman poke his head in. He fired, but he didn't think he scored. Today, today, on stage. The soldier had to get up on deck before they thought to slam shut the hatch, trapping him. Pulling his other flash grenade, he hoped his aim was true, yanked the pin and lobbed it almost straight up. Granata! Bolin flung himself against the bulkhead, one arm covering his eyes. The upper deck shielded him when the grenade detonated, and he was on his way up the ladder barely ten seconds after the glow faded. A pair of crewmen were staggering as if drunk. One had his hands over his eyes, the other's eyes were wide as saucers and pouring tears. Bolin belted him in the stomach, doubling him over, and then kneed him in the face. The second crewman heard his friend go down and turned right into a right hook. One punch sent him into unconsciousness. Bedlam had seized the Caspian. Several more were clustered by the starboard hatch, and they had seen Bolin emerge. Charging, they opened fire, but most of their rounds were deflected by the catwalk. Bolin backpedaled toward the port rail. He dropped one crewman, then another. Sustained bursts scattered the rest. By then, he was in shadow, and the few shots thrown at him were wide of the mark. Ejecting the empty magazine, he slapped the full one home and pulled back the handle. There had to be 20 crewmen on deck, with more arriving every second. Bolin glided toward the bow. Suddenly, new firing broke out in the vicinity of the starboard hatch. He dropped low to the deck, then realized none of the rounds was directed at him. Mystified, Bolin tried to make sense of it. 
Crewmen on his side of the tanker were rushing toward the starboard side, firing as they ran. One took a hit and pitched forward. A full-fledged battle was taking place. Give them hell, boys! They want to take over our ship! The terrorists were fighting the crew. Rising, Boland zigzagged toward the closest cover and stowed Derek amidships. Several figures had gained the catwalk and they began shooting at the wheelhouse. Slowing, Boland placed a red dot on the one in the middle and fired. The others had no idea where the shots came from, and he was aiming at the Arab on the right when the air near him was blistered by auto fire from near the starboard king post. He shot back, aiming at the muzzle flash, and pumped his legs toward the derrick. Moist drops splattered Boland's cheeks. For a moment, he thought it was blood, but then he noticed the moisture in the air. Clouds filled the sky. The storm had arrived, and light rain had begun to fall. Reaching the derrick, Boland ducked behind it. The firefight was spreading as more and more crewmen became involved. Solid sheets of rain pelted the deck with the hammering cadence of hail. In no time, he was drenched. Visibility was next to zero. Boland couldn't see his hand before his face. An added complication was the wind. It came shrieking in, distorting the blasts of gunfire, so Boland had a hard time pinpointing where the shots came from. The firing tapered, but didn't die out entirely. Since he wasn't accomplishing anything by squatting there, he moved along the derrick toward the starboard side of the ship. There was no telling whether the crew or the terrorists had the upper hand. The storm had thrown a major monkey wrench into the works. He might not be able to eliminate or contain the Al Jabbar threat before the Caspian reached port in which case he should put in a call to Brognola. Huddling under the derrick out of the brunt of the downpour, Bolin unclipped his cell phone and punched the red button to activate it. He tapped in the Big Fed's cell number, then put the phone to his ear. No ringing, no dial tone, nothing. The storm had cut him off from the outside world. The only way to reach Brognola now was through the ship's radio. Reattaching the phone to his belt, Bolin crept to the end of the derrick. He thought a vaporous shape flitted across the deck to his right, but he wouldn't swear to it. He continued straight ahead and soon came to the catwalk. He spied several forms to stern, slogging through the rain with their shoulders hunched against the elements. Sliding under the bottom rail on the starboard side, Boland dropped to the deck. They never spotted him. Once they had disappeared into the watery veil, he started toward the wheelhouse where he would find the ship's communications center. A deadly game of cat and mouse had ensued between the two opposing forces, with Bolin caught in the middle. Several times, figures slunk dangerously near, but in each instance he froze and they went on without stopping. The need to move at a snail's pace was vexing. Eventually, the dull yellow glow of lights rewarded his patience. He ran the final few yards and moved along the wall to a door. It hung halfway open and out of it stuck a blood-spattered leg. Boland pivoted on the balls of his feet, his finger curled on the MP5 case hair trigger, but except for the dead crewman, the passageway was deserted. Picking his way over the body, he went down a short flight of steps. A little farther in, he came on another casualty, again a bullet-riddled crewman. At the next junction, he turned right and started up metal stairs. <laughs> Hurrying backward, Boland craned his neck for a glimpse of the shooter. Whether it was a crewman or terrorist was irrelevant. The man was too well hidden and could drop him before he was less than halfway up. There was another stairwell to port. Bolin opted for the path of least resistance and headed to the far side. At the far stairwell, he listened, then trained the MP5K straight up and took the stairs three at a bound. Bolin had to grip the rail to keep his balance. It had come from somewhere above. Proceeding with caution, Bolin gained the top level. He pushed open a pockmarked doorway. Smoke and dust hung thick in the air, and the passage was littered with debris. A doorway and part of the bulkhead to his left had been ripped apart, and from the ragged cavity poured more smoke. Whoever was responsible had to be nearby. Every nerve taut, Bolin inched forward. One glance was enough to show he wouldn't be contacting Brognola. The explosion had made a shambles of the communications console, no doubt sabotage on the part of the Al Jabbar, to prevent the crew from requesting help. Two bodies were strewn among the wreckage, one minus its legs, the other in more pieces than a jigsaw puzzle. Toward the center of the ship was the bridge. Boland took a few steps, then saw a hand materialize out of a doorway. A spherical object came sailing toward him. Jesus! Whirling, he flew to the landing and hurled himself down the stairs. 
He cleared the first level and was vaulting around the bend when the grenade blew. Thankfully, the wheelhouse wasn't located near the holding tanks. He stopped and turned. Shadows played across the landing. They were after him. Bolin needed a spot to make a stand, and this wasn't it. It'd be as simple as tossing another grenade at him, out here exposed. Bolin flew to the bottom and into the passageway that would take him out on deck, only to find it blocked by a pair of crewmen. They didn't ask who he was. The moment they laid eyes on him, they jammed bolt-action rifles to their shoulders. Bolin cut them down where they stood and was out the hatch before his pursuers appeared. It was like walking into a lake. Rain cascaded over him, soaking him anew. Blinking to clear his vision, he stepped to one side of the opening. Within seconds, several Al-Jabbar men came stalking around the other end. Well trained, they advanced in stages, each covering the other. The executioner clipped one, but the other retaliated with a stream of hot lead that whined off the edge of the hatch, forcing him to spring to safety or be perforated. Suddenly, he collided with someone. Spinning, he discovered a crewman who looked as surprised as he was. The man held a pistol, but instead of firing it, he bolted through the hatch. A fatal blunder. Bolin took half a dozen steps from the wheelhouse. The downpour temporarily slackened as lightning rent the sky close to starboard. For a split second, the deck was lit up as if by a strobe light, and in the harsh glare, he saw armed figures the length and width of the ship, stalking one another. Simultaneously, the rain resumed in all its unbridled fury. Bolin flattened. So much lead was being thrown, anyone on his feet was at risk. Lunacy at its worst, with neither side liable to emerge a clear-cut victor. Twisting to starboard, he crept toward where he hoped that Derek would be. In the deluge, it was difficult to gauge. A small nook under an overhang offered drier shelter, and Bolin slid under it on his haunches, only to discover he wasn't alone. A man lay on his side, facing him, one hand over a wound oozing blood from his stomach. Are you mine or theirs? If mine, help me up. If theirs, shoot me, bastard, and be done with it. How about if I'm neither? Bolin leveled the MP5K on Tuskindi. Grunting, the captain rose unsteadily onto his elbow. He was pale, his skin stark white against the dark. Who the hell are you? I'm hitching a ride into port. Oh, the damn Coast Guard. They brought you, didn't they? He snuck on board when our backs were turned, am I right? How badly are you hit? Oh, change the subject, why don't you? See if I give a damn, what difference does it make? Those stinking fanatics have done me in. That's why you're here, isn't it? You're after them? Abbas and his loons. Where is Abbas now? Oh, I wish I knew. And I wish I still had my gun so I could walk up to the lying son of a whore and splatter his brains all over the deck. He did this to me, the bastard. I was a fool to think I could ever trust him. Keep your hands where I can see them. When he raised his head, his mouth and chin were dark with blood. Did the Algebar bring missiles or rockets with them? Or any crates that could contain biological or chemical weapons? All they brought were their submachine guns, small arms and a few grenades. Whatever they have planned doesn't involve smuggling anything into your country. Everything they need is already there. Abbas said as much? No, but he dropped enough hints. It is big, American. He bragged that it would make him famous, and that the Al Jabbar would become the most feared terrorist organization in the world. <coughs> That's all? What more do you want? Times and dates? <laughs> uh, you have no idea of the pain I'm in. Bolin switched his weight from one foot to the other. Uh, you consider me beneath contempt, no doubt. But I only did what I had to in order to survive. In that, I am no different than your own politicians, who cut deals your people never hear about to line their own pockets. Save your excuses. I struck a nerve, did I? <laughs> did you feel that? Feel what? The deck. The Caspian is changing course. Bolin was skeptical. With the driving rain and the lashing wind, a change in heading would be impossible to notice from on the ship. I can feel it, I tell you. I helmed this ship for seven years, and I know her better than anyone. 
since none of my crew would dare change direction without my consent. A boss must be irresponsible. The soldier remembered overhearing how insistent the terrorist leader had been that the Aljabar leave the ship before it docked. He started to rise. Tuskindi's right hand flashed out from under his left sleeve, his dagger held low for a thrust of the groin. For a man his size and in his state, he was extremely swift. So was Bolan. Nice try, Captain. Hal Brognola paced the floor of his office at Stony Man Farm, a cigar clenched between his teeth, as he glanced repeatedly at the phone. Who is it? Barb, I have an update. Come in. These photos are the latest satellite images. Murphy's Law seems to be following Bolin on this one. Brognola examined the photos. They showed, in marvelous detail, a nightmare of a storm, a maelstrom of swirling clouds lit by threads of lightning. It's right over the Caspian. Sustained heavy rain, wind gusts of up to 65 miles an hour, localized high seas, the works. It wasn't this strong when we started tracking it. It picked up strength once it was out over the ocean. <sighs> now it's pounding the hell out of that tanker. I hope our boy found a cozy dry spot to hold up. This could be why we haven't heard from him. A severe storm like that would bury his signal. His phone, yes, but not the ship's radio if he could get to it. Have the Coast Guard radio the Caspian and inquire about their status and whether the storm will delay their arrival. Monitor and record the call. I want to hear it. Tuskindi might become suspicious. Not necessarily. Given the intensity of the storm, it's perfectly normal for the Coast Guard to check on ships in the area. Get cracking. Brognola did not want the Aljabar making landfall. He did not want some of the most vicious terrorists in the world running loose on American soil. He would gladly have sent in a Delta squad or Navy SEALs, but his hands were tied. The Caspian was sailing under a Liberian flag, and international law didn't condone the use of overt military force. Then there were the politics to observe. The president didn't want a military intervention splashed all over the news channels. Discretion was called for. So once again, Uncle Sam sent in the one man who had never let them down. Still, Brognola would dearly have liked to send in backup. As good as he was, Bolin was just one man. And there were times, Brognola suspected, when even Bolin tended to forget that fact. This time around, Brognola had the impression his operative was taking the whole Al Jabbar business much too personally. Being thwarted in Greece and Turkey had made Bolin twice as determined to put an end to them. Brognola resumed pacing. To an outsider, he might seem a nervous wreck, but it was actually good for him. It helped him think, and it wasn't bad exercise. Lord knew he didn't get enough. Price returned sooner than he anticipated. Well, what did Tuskindi have to say? Let's hear that tape. There isn't one. The Coast Guard couldn't get through. You mean the transmissions were garbled? I mean there were no transmissions, period. The Caspian never answered. For a moment, Price's usual calm reserve evaporated, and she looked as worried as Brognola felt. The commander offered to send out a boarding party. The Exeter is back at her berth, fully manned and ready to go out. How much longer until the Caspian reaches port? Forty, fifty minutes, depending. The choppy seas are bound to slow her, but not much. Not a ship her size. How long would it take the Exeter to interdict her? Twenty minutes, give or take. Less if the storm breaks, which isn't likely at this point. Brognola did the math. Even if all went well, the Coast Guardsmen wouldn't be on board the Caspian all that long before the tanker docked. Although going to sea in stormy weather and boarding under adverse conditions was the kind of thing the Coast Guard specialized in, he would be putting good men and women at extreme risk for questionable cause. It would violate two of the personal rules he lived by. One was that he never put anyone's life in danger needlessly. The other was that he never let personal friendships dictate professional decisions. As much as he valued Bolin, as close as they had become, he couldn't, in all conscience, commit to a course of action based on sentiment. Sir? Tell the Coast Guard thanks, but no thanks. Our original plan is still viable. I have a 60-man task force waiting for the Caspian. If the terrorists are still alive, they'll be taken into custody. Very well. The way Price said it, Brognola felt as if she had jabbed him in the gut with an ice pick. Mac is a big boy, Barbara. The day we lose faith in him is the day we might as well look for new jobs.
The executioner stalked toward the Caspian's wheelhouse. The unrelenting downpour battered him. Underfoot, the deck rose and fell. Not enough to make Bolin lose his balance, but enough that he would if he wasn't careful. On either side, giant waves crashed against the hull, adding to the din of the raging tempest. Out of the night came a new exchange of gunfire. Stray slugs were thrown every which way, and once again Bolin had to drop to avoid taking one. The firefight lasted longer than before, and when it was over, low groans could be heard between the howling gusts of wind. The soldier hadn't gone far when he found the first body. Beyond were more, seven, eight, nine, all crewmen. There had been a concerted effort to retake the wheelhouse, and it had failed. Four more bodies were sprawled in front of a passageway, heaped high with furniture and whatever else the terrorists could get their hands on. Bolin didn't get too close. He imagined the Al-Jabbar had done the same at every entry, but there had to be a way in. There weren't enough of them to cover all the windows and the roof, too. Recalling the diagram he had studied at Stony Man Farm, he hastened to a ladder that would take him to the second level. It was close to the side rail. No one was on the landing. Boland tried the door, but it was locked. He doubted that terrorists had posted a guard on the other side. They needed every man they had to repel the crew. Sliding a lockpick from his vest, he bent and inserted it. He had to work by feel, a challenging task with the deck tossing and the rain beating down. Replacing the pick, Bolin sidled inside. Glancing up, he saw no one and made his way higher. He didn't stop until he reached the top. The intervening levels were quiet, but that didn't necessarily mean they were deserted. Bolin cracked the door. The passage was empty, nor did he hear anything. But if the Aljabar had indeed taken control, they could be anywhere. Although his magazine wasn't empty yet, the executioner inserted a new one, then glided past several open rooms. One was the infirmary, another an office. A third had a lot of charts on the walls. None was occupied. The next door was shut. Bridge was stenciled in bold black letters. Bolin looked both ways, then shoved it open and rushed inside, ready for anything. The place was in shambles. The main computer console had been riddled with bullets, and tiny wisps of smoke curled from the holes and cracks. A radar screen had been shattered, a large bank of equipment smashed to useless ruin. It made no sense to Bolin for them to have destroyed everything. He picked his way among the litter until flashing red numbers caught his eye. A digital display above the main console was counting down minutes and seconds. To what? He walked to the wheel and gave it a turn. There should be resistance, but there wasn't any. It spun like a roulette wheel and only stopped when he gripped it again. The terrorists had disabled the steering control. Bolin pressed a button on the wall under the words, Engine Room. Snipped wires were to blame. He stared out the tinted windows. From this high up, he had an unobstructed view of the full fury of the storm. A charcoal black sky writhed overhead, pierced by vivid thunderbolts. White caps roiled the ocean, and high waves were breaking over the distant bow. He saw a lot of bodies, but no movement. The crew was either dead, or those still alive had sought cover below. As for the terrorists, he was at a loss. They had gone to all the trouble to seize the bridge, only to destroy and abandon it. With the bridge out of commission, no one could control the ship, not even the Al-Jabbar. What possible benefit was that to them? Stepping to the bullet-riddled console, he stared at the digital display. Thirty-eight minutes and seven seconds left. The Caspian was an old bucket, but her bridge was modern. She had been retrofitted with a computerized system for controlling her steerage and the engines. Once the coordinates and speed were programmed, the only way to change them was by an override command or by the captain assuming manual control. But the computer and the manual switch had been shot to hell. There was no altering whatever was last fed in. Bolin glanced out the windows again as chilling insight flooded him. The terrorists wanted it that way. Bruno Tuskindi had been right about the ship changing course. It was no longer bound for New York City, but for somewhere else somewhere the terrorists had chosen. And thanks to the storm, the feds wouldn't realize it until it was too late. 37 minutes and 10 seconds until they got there. Bolin tried to reduce the ship's speed anyway. He moved the large lever to full stop, but the Caspian went on plowing through the turbulent seas. To stop her now, he had to shut down her power at the source. 
The soldier raced from the bridge. The engines were at the stern, the same as the wheelhouse. Once he reached the stairwell, he descended until he came to a metal door labeled power plant. It wouldn't open. He tried the pick, but it wouldn't slide into the lock. Peering closer, he saw the keyhole had been fused solid, perhaps by an incendiary strip. Unless he could get his hands on some C4 or a battering ram, he wasn't getting in there. Bolin headed back up. He had to hand it to Aban Abbas. He had covered all the bases, as if he had planned it in advance, which Bolin wouldn't put past him. Since the Al Jabbar's inception, Abbas had shown a flair for strategy. At the landing, Bolin halted. He had to find the terrorists, but where to start? They weren't on the bridge, they weren't in the engine room. Then he remembered the talk he overheard, and Tuskindi's talk of a lifeboat. <laughs> Bolin shoved on the door, but the wind shoved back. He put his shoulder into it and slipped out before the wind slammed the door shut on him. The lifeboats were on platforms on either side of the wheelhouse. The executioner began to climb a ladder to the nearest and looked up just as an enormous wave curled over the side and slammed into him. Hooking his elbows around the rungs, he clung with all his strength. The water pulled at him like a living thing, the pressure almost unbearable. For a few moments, he thought he would be torn from his perch. Then the wave dissolved, its energy spent. He shot to the platform and dashed under the davit. The lifeboat platform was deserted. Bolin had expected as much. No one in his right mind would contemplate lowering a boat in those conditions. But if they weren't there, then where? Up near the tanker's bow, Aban Abbas turned from a window to hear Rakim's report. All is going according to your plan, Master. The deck house is secure. Only a few crewmen still live, and they've gone down into the holes to escape us. You have but to command, and we will hunt them down and finish them. There is no need. Soon we will reach land. Jamila, what has our victory cost us? Three men are dead, another is hurt. Abbas walked into the next room where most of his men were gathered. Ten were left, more than enough to carry out his inspired design. Eleven once they linked up with Sefu. How are you faring, Jabal? I am fine, Great One. The demon himself could not kill me. But he is still out there somewhere. This is a large ship, Sharik. We will be gone long before he finds us, and then that will be the last of him. Abbas could tell Sharik didn't share the same opinion, and to be honest, neither did he. He had been shocked beyond measure when the dark-haired one showed up outside their hiding place in the hold. Abbas wasn't superstitious by nature, but the demon, as they all now referred to him, was enough to make anyone paranoid. Everywhere they went, there he was, an evil genie they couldn't shake, even halfway around the world. It baffled him, and Abbas did not like things he couldn't understand. We have the ropes ready, as you instructed. The storm is a blessing, Barak, sent to render our enemies powerless to stop us, 19 minutes until we hit. Did you have all this plan from the beginning, Master? Taking over the Caspian, I mean. And programming their computer to do your bidding. If so, truly your wisdom exceeds that of Solomon. Do not make more of it than there is, Jabal. We are at war, and at war, a competent commander must take every contingency into account. Plans within plans. Only then is success assured. Take Tuskindi and his ship. I would have rather sailed on a different vessel, one friendlier to our cause, but we needed to reach America quickly, and Tuskindi would sell his soul for the right price. I did not trust him, though, so I made plans to take over should he give us trouble. You did an outstanding job, Great One. Others are as worthy of your praise. We could not have done it without Yassin's knowledge of computers and the Rakin's experience, or without the beneficence of God, without whom nothing is possible. Take heart, my brothers. All has gone well so far. But the biggest challenge yet remains. Once we are on United States soil, we will be among the enemy. We must be as wise as foxes, as deadly as cobras. We will stay in America only so long as necessary. The faster we get in and out, the less chance they have of finding us. Besides, we must strike before they can figure out why we are here, or all this would have been for nothing. Abbas went back into the other room. Only Jamila was there, staring aft. Walking up close behind her, he breathed deep the fragrance of her hair. Anything, Jamila? No. There is no sign of anyone. I heard what you said. It is not like you to deceive them. How do you mean? They are young. 
They do not see beyond the picture you paint to the reality. All the planning in the world cannot guarantee success. The National Security Agency will not throw its doors open and invite us in to destroy it. Such pessimism. Such realism is more like it. As long as the Americans did not know we were en route to their country, our goal was achievable. Now they do, and the odds will drop accordingly. If any of us make it out alive, I will be surprised. Everyone knew the sacrifice they might be called to make when they took the oath of brotherhood. All well and good, but I fear we are overreaching ourselves this time, Aban. It was rare for her to call him by his familiar name, except when they were alone. Abbas glanced over his shoulder to confirm they were, then gave her shoulder a gentle squeeze. If we die, we die. God's will be done. The others can perish, and I will not shed a tear. But I do not want you to share their fate. I want you to promise me that you will not let yourself be killed. It would be folly. A man has no control over his fate. That is not what you told them. Jamila grasped his left hand in both of hers and pressed it to her chest. My heart is yours, and always will be. As long as breath remains in my body, I will not let harm come to you. Be silent. He didn't like to discuss intimate matters where prying ears might overhear. Do not be angry with me. A woman in love, even a warrior, is still a woman in love. And I love you more than you can imagine. Jamila tilted her head and parted her lips, but Abbas pulled away, his emotions in turmoil. Part of him yearned to kiss her, but the other part, his rational self, reminded him this wasn't the right time or place. Have you heard nothing I've said? Control yourself, or I could come to regret ever accepting a woman into the Al-Jabbar. Wheeling, he took a step and drew up in consternation. Shariq was in the doorway. My pardon, Master. I did not mean to intrude. He quickly backed into the other room. Abbas followed. Sharik went to a corner window, and he walked over next to him. How much did you see? Oh, hardly any anything. I hope you will not think less of me. I know I have always taught a true holy warrior does not give in to the enticements of the flesh, but we are still men, and we have needs. The dalliance now and then is understandable. That is not what you told Haji the night he brought that woman to our stronghold. You slit his throat, if you'll recall. There is a crucial difference. He brought a drunken harlot among us. Jamila loves me. And do you love her? The question smacked of disrespect, but it also gave Abbas pause. How deeply did he care for her? He was very attracted to her. He might go so far as to say he was extremely fond of her. But could he honestly say he loved her as she loved him? There is no need to answer. My personal affairs are my own, and you will say nothing on this to the others. Haven't I always done your bidding? I will make a circuit of the deckhouse to make sure the demon is not anywhere near. Abbas glowered, then caught himself. Sharik had always been among the most loyal of his followers, but something had changed between them. He could feel it. It worried Abbas to think Sharik might tell some of the others. His leadership depended on their total trust, on their looking up to him for guidance and inspiration. They were bound to think less of him if they learned about Jamila, and he couldn't permit that. He had to make absolutely certain Sharik never said a word. Resting his forehead against the glass, Abbas chided himself for being so careless, like the time in Greece when he squeezed Jamila's hand in the car. Lapses like that could cost him dearly. Maybe Sharik wasn't the only one he had to deal with, Abbas reflected. Maybe, in the words of the West, he should give some thought to killing two birds with one stone. The storm battered Mac Bolan mercilessly. He had gone from hold to hold, listening at each hatch for signs of his prey, and was now approaching the deckhouse. His body bent into the wind, one arm across his forehead to shield his eyes from the worst of the rain. He fought for every yard he gained. The wind never slackened, never gave him a moment's respite. He was tired and soaked to the bone, but they were minor discomforts. Boland's other hand was wrapped around the catwalk rail. He dared not let go. The last time he did, the wind had pushed him back a good dozen feet. Boland's hair and skin prickled as if to an electric shock. Trudging on, he mechanically placed one foot in front of the other. The soldier had exhausted all other possibilities. 
Abbas's group wasn't in the wheelhouse, they weren't below decks, and they hadn't abandoned ship. If he didn't find them in the deck house, he might as well admit they had given him the slip. He'd tried to reach Brognola again, but his cell phone still wouldn't work. The only bright spot was that while the wind hadn't lessened, the rain had. Not a lot, but enough that visibility was somewhat improved. Bolin was not far from the deck house when a figure came along from the right. Instantly, he crouched so as not to be seen, and the figure went in through a door at the end of the catwalk. The only reason Bolin didn't shoot was because he couldn't say with certainty whether it had been a member of the Al Jabbar or a member of the crew. He stepped nearer and detected movement at a deck level window. It looked like a woman. Remembering the voice he heard in the hold, he cradled the MP5K. Suddenly, the window exploded and the barrel of an SMG protruded. Bolin flung himself to the left as the weapon spat lead. He tried to grab the bottom rail to arrest his fall, but it was too slick, and he tumbled to the deck and landed with a jarring pain in his shoulder. <sighs> Bolin rose slowly, his back to the manifold. He had found them at last. But what now? The roll of the deck was worse here than aft, and if he strayed from the catwalk, he was liable to wind up on his back, or else fall prey to the huge waves that clawed at the deck with watery talons. Bolin rose and swept the lower windows with a steady burst. As he dropped back down, he felt the Caspian shudder. He couldn't account for it. There hadn't been an explosion. Seconds later, it happened again, more noticeable than before, and he had the distinct impression the ship was slowing. He wondered if it had anything to do with the digital countdown on the bridge. The glowing hands on his watch revealed there were three minutes left until whatever had been programmed into the Caspian's computers was due to happen. Bolin, glancing up, saw something that explained it. To the south, he couldn't say how far, a large beacon probed the dark, sweeping back and forth, a beacon so powerful even the rain couldn't dampen its brilliance. It had to be a lighthouse. And if that was the case, the Caspian was close to shore. Very close. A terrible image filled Bolin's mind. With no one at the helm, and no way to change course or stop, the tanker would run aground. Should it break apart, the contents of the holds, hundreds of thousands of gallons of crude, would spill into the ocean. It would be an environmental disaster akin to the Exxon Valdez. The coastline for hundreds of miles would be impacted. The terrorists had to know the risk, but to them it was merely another blow struck against the great American devil, collateral damage of a whole new sort. Bolin dropped onto his stomach and snaked forward. The next second, the tanker's bow rose into the air and the Caspian lurched as if she had been torpedoed. It didn't last long and the bow sank back down. It was a good thing Bolin was on his stomach or he would have been tossed across the deck like a leaf. As soon as the ship steadied, he continued to crawl. He was close enough for them to spot him, but no one opened fire. He decided to make a run for the door, and he was halfway to his feet when the tanker lurched again, worse than the first time. The deck canted to the left. His feet were swept out from under him. There was nothing for him to grab, so he was sent rolling toward the gunwale. Ordinarily, he wouldn't have rolled far, but the deck was so slippery, it was like shooting down a water slide. The soldier was almost to the side rail when the ship righted itself. Heaving to his feet, Bolin lunged toward the deck house. He had to reach it before something else happened. But he had only taken eight or nine strides when the Caspian shook as if in the grip of an earthquake, and a new grinding noise rose from under her keel, caterwauling that went on forever. Suddenly, the tanker came to a stop. One moment it was doing upward of 12 knots, the next it was as motionless. Bolin was catapulted forward, along with everything else on the deck that wasn't tied down. He threw up his arms to protect himself a fraction of a second before he slammed into the deckhouse like a flesh and bone battering ram. He braced for the impact, but instead of smashing into a solid wall, he struck a window. Amid a shower of glass shards, Bolin thudded onto his shoulders. Momentum flipped him onto his side, and he lay dazed on the floor. Marshalling his wits, Bolin pushed onto his knees and hiked his SMG. There was no one in the room. The room contained a sofa and some chairs, and that was all. The terrorists had to be in the next one. Bolin trained his weapon on the doorway. When half a minute passed and the enemy still didn't show, he scanned the passageway. They weren't there either, nor in the next room or the next. 
Bolin started to go toward the bow, then spied a square object resting on a small table. It was a packet of plastic explosive rigged with a timer, overlapped with two-inch wide electrician's tape. Fuck! He pried at the tape, enough to realize he couldn't get it off and disconnect the detonator before it was triggered. Only 41 seconds remained. The executioner grabbed the bomb, then was up and outside. He raced toward the port gunnel. The packet was large enough to blow a hole in the Caspian, to say nothing of the secondary explosions it would trigger. One way or the other, the Aljabar were determined to spill the crew. Bolin was equally determined not to. A bolt of lightning lit up the deck, revealing a gas vent line directly in his path. Huh? He vaulted over it, but as he came down, his right heel slipped out from under him, and down he went. Oh, shit! Unable to stop, he slid clear to the gunnel and stopped himself by thrusting both feet against it. There wasn't much time left. Bolin clutched at the rail and straightened. The wind was at his back. He hurled the packet. The wind caught it and whipped it off into the darkness like an out-of-control kite. Bolin hit the deck and covered his head with both arms. The foredeck lit up, and the Caspian rolled to the right. Then the light died, the vessel righted itself, and was still. Leaping to the rail, Bolin peered over the side. As near as he could tell, the hull was intact, no crude spilling into the sea. But he couldn't see the entire length of the ship, and for all he knew, there might be a break farther down. The soldier moved to the deckhouse as fast as the rain and wind allowed. He jogged out the door they had left open. Ahead loomed another 200 feet of storm-battered deck to the foremast. Beyond, another 50 feet or so, was the bow. Bolin slogged in pursuit. He could make better time now that the deck wasn't rolling and pitching under him, but it was still slick. The wind was worse than ever. Strong gusts constantly tried to rip him off his feet, and it was all he could do to resist. He kept hoping he would spot the Al Jabbar or hear their voices, but they had too great a lead. The thought spurred Bolin, and he pushed himself harder. If the Al Jabbar made it off the tanker, finding them in the raging sea would be next to impossible. Then, as if to prove Bolin wrong, the storm ended. He broke into a run. Visibility was better, but a lot of clouds were still scuttling overhead, and it was so dark he didn't see the huddled figure up in the crow's nest until he was almost abreast of the foremast. Automatically, he snapped the MP5K into firing position. Don't shoot, mate! God in heaven, please don't shoot! Identify yourself! Adam Kentwork, out of Liverpool. When the firing started, I came up here to hide. I didn't want any bleeding part of it. I mean, blimey, I didn't hire this tub to have my ass shot off, now did I? Did you see anyone go by here? I sure did. A whole bunch of blokes. Ten or eleven, I couldn't rightly be sure. And a crumpet, if you can believe it. They were talking all funny-like. Arabic, I reckon. I thank God they didn't spot me or we wouldn't be having this bloody chat. Bolin sprinted past the anchor windlass and the mooring winch, across open deck to the bow. The Al Jabbar had made it off the ship. The soldier stepped to the white railing. Four thick ropes had been securely tied to the uppermost and led over the side. He peered down. The tanker had come to ground on a broad, sandy stretch of beach bordered by woodland. There was no sign of his prey. Adjusting the MP5K so it hung across his back, Bolin gripped one of the ropes and climbed over the rail. Like everything else, the rope was soaked. He locked his ankles around it and carefully descended hand under hand while scouring the woods for a boss and his fanatics. Ten feet from the bottom, Bolin unwrapped his legs and let go. Swinging the SMG in front of him, he examined the ground for tracks. The rain had washed away most of their prints, but not all. He found a few, enough to indicate their direction. Like a bloodhound hot on the scent, the soldier lit out after them. The woods were cloaked in darkness, but he could see well enough to avoid the rocks and thickets that lay in front of him. Bolin wished the cloud cover would disperse so he could get a fix on where he was. The tanker had grounded well north of New York City, that much he knew. How far north was the question. The soldier slipped a compass from a small pocket in his vest and slowed just enough to read it. The terrorists were bearing to the northeast. Pocketing the compass, he pressed on. Since everything Aban Abbas did was thought out well in advance, the soldier had to believe the terrorist chose that area specifically. But there had to be human habitation somewhere, and where there were people, there were roads, and the vehicles Abbas needed to spirit his people away. Moments later, several lights appeared. 
As Bolin drew closer, he saw they were windows in an old house on the side of a hill. Fatigue was setting in, and Bolin was caked with sweat, but he pumped his legs with renewed vigor. He still had more than 200 yards to go and feared he wouldn't get there in time. Figures filed from the house to a two-car garage. One stooped, gripped a handle, and swung up the wide door. An overhead light blinked on, bathing an SUV and a sedan. Gritting his teeth in frustration, Bolin tried to get within range. He bored through a thicket to gain a few precious feet. Bolin raced up the drive and onto a porch overgrown with ivy. The front door hung open. A few feet inside lay the crumpled form of an elderly man, his body riddled with bullets. Bolin went through the motions of checking for a pulse. A hallway took him past a living room and a music room containing a piano and a cello to an immaculate kitchen that spoke of loving care. The woman responsible was on the floor by a table. She had white hair done up in a bun and wore an apron that was splotched red. The light had left her eyes. Standing, he unclipped his cell phone and tapped in the special number to Brognola's private office. Mac? I'm here. Where are you? Where the hell is the Caspian? The Coast Guard said it went off radar during the storm. We've been trying to locate it. Our satellites are useless. We sent a few planes, and they're still out looking. You'll find it on a beach somewhere north of New York. Bolin recounted the events on the ship and on shore. Brognola listened in silence, not once interrupting. Damn. They are here, and they're on the loose. All right, so we deal with it. I'll alert the FBI, have the state police mobilized, and get word to every municipal and county law enforcement agency in the tri-state area. It's a straight-out manhunt now. There's no need for secrecy. I want them, Hal. Duly noted. We'll advise the other agencies to locate but not apprehend and relay word immediately. You don't understand. I'm going to take them down personally. Is it me, or is this one getting to you? No matter. I'll do all I can to give you first crack at them, but don't hold it against me if things don't work out the way we want. We're getting a fix on your signal. Once I know exactly where you are, I'll send Jack to pick you up. In the meantime, sit tight. Try to get some rest. I could use some dry clothes. Done. Any word on Sefu Abbas? The one bright spot. Remember that phrase in his message, where cats grew trees for whiskers? We think he was referring to the Catskill Mountains. Which are here in New York. It won't surprise me if we find they're within driving distance of where you are. The Catskills are about 50 miles long and 30 miles wide. 1,500 square miles is nothing to sneeze at, but it's a hell of a lot better than having to comb the entire state. If you ask me, Aban Abbas made the biggest mistake of his life coming here. He's on our turf now, and that gives us the edge. I sure as shit hope so. The hunting lodge had seen better days. Decades earlier, it had been a hot spot for hunters as far south as New Jersey. The lack of business showed. The buildings were in dire need of a coat of paint, and many of the cabins had cracked windows and roofs in disrepair. Sefu Abbas came out of one of the cabins he had rented and walked down a winding path flanked by tall pines to the office. The owner, a man in his fifties with a double chin and a belly as big as a clothes basket, looked up from one of the girly magazines he kept stashed under the counter. Hey there, young fella. You off into town again tonight, are you? Not tonight, Mr. Lester. Sefu had spent the past several evenings at the small library in the nearby town of Tuttleville. There wasn't much to do at the lodge except listen to the radio and watch a TV with terrible reception. Mr. Lester ran a pudgy hand across his perspiring brow. Oh, that's right. Tonight's the big night, ain't it, Mr. LeBeau? Your friends are supposed to get here. Before midnight, if they don't lose their way. I'm sorry I ain't got cable and all that fancy jazz the big change do, but times have been hard. I'm damn lucky to still be afloat. Sefu reflected that they couldn't be too hard if Lester ate so well. Where did you say you're from again? Norlands? That's right, that's right, down Louisiana way. You know, I gotta admit it, I don't know Cajuns from Canadians. But if your friends are as kindly and nice as you, they must be a great bunch of people. Sefu never failed to be amused at the ignorance of the average American. He couldn't for the life of him understand how they became a superpower. I'm here about the towels. You told me the day I arrived that you would put clean ones in the cabins my friends are to stay in, but you still haven't done it. Oh, damn, damn. My memory ain't what it used to be, son. Uh, you have to forgive me. You don't mind taking them yourself, do you? 
I'm expecting a phone call, and I'd hate to miss it. Sefu very much doubted the lazy slab of lard was expecting any such thing, but he played along. I don't mind at all. Anything to help you out. That's right decent of you. Lester brought over an armful of towels and washcloths. Yeah, there's a gal from the FBI should be calling any time now. The, uh, <clears throat> FBI? Oh, yeah. Some lady agent called about a half an hour ago, wanted to know if I had any foreigners staying here. Can you believe it? <laughs> the last foreign type I can recall was a fellow from Philly. Came up here about a year ago, I think it was. He only stayed a day. Sefu knew the man well. He was Syrian, one of the Aljabar's network of contacts. Mukhtar was his name, and part of his mission was to keep a list of safe havens in times of emergency, and relay them periodically to Somalia and warriors undercover. It was on Mukhtar's advice that Sefu had chosen the lodge in the first place. Huh. What'd you tell the FBI agent? I told her the only one I had registered was you, and you're born and bred American. She wanted the registration information, but I couldn't find the damn sheet, so she's calling me back. This time I'm ready for her. Sefu reached under his jacket, drew the Astra 300 with the suppressor already threaded on, and shot Lester in the temple. Huntsman's Lodge, may I help you? This is Agent Sandra Downing of the FBI. Is Mr. Lester there? I'm sorry, he's left for the evening. Sefu glanced at a framed photo of Lester proudly holding a 12-pound bass. He went night fishing with some of his buddies. I'm his brother, George. I'm holding down the fort. Did he mention anything to you about a registration slip? No, he sure didn't. He took his six-pack, jumped in his pickup, and drove off without hardly a word. Uh, will you do me a favor, George? Leave word for your brother I'll be calling back tomorrow morning at 8 sharp, and he'd better have the information I need. Oh, I sure will. I, I hope he's not in any trouble. Grinning at how he had outwitted her, he stepped to the front door to change the sign from open to closed. Headlights swept into the parking lot and two vehicles pulled in, a sedan and an SUV. Sefu held his breath, hoping against hope, and when he saw the third person to slide from the SUV, he flung the door open and raced down the steps with his arms wide. Aban! Brother hugged brother, then Aban gripped Sefu by the shoulders. Our celebration must be short. It is time. FBI agent Sandra Downing didn't know quite what to make of it. She had relayed her suspicions about the Huntsman's Lodge to the assistant director in charge. She explained that when she originally talked to Carl Lester, the man had babbled on about everything under the sun, and she had a hard time keeping him focused on the issue of the registration slip. At one point, she distinctly remembered him saying that the area up there was great for fishing, and he invited her to come up and try her hand sometime. After she mentioned she didn't fish, Lester commented he used to, but he had given it up because of a bad back. Strange, then, that the man who claimed to be his brother said Carl Lester had gone off fishing for the night. Downing reported the inconsistency and thought nothing more of it until she was called into the ADIC's office of Richard Vernon at 26 Federal Plaza. His window offered a panoramic view of New York City's skyline, but she was only interested in why he had called her in. How would you like to take a crack at the guy who murdered those two agents in Newcastle, Pennsylvania? The director wants our people in on it, and since you were the one who tipped them to Huntsman's Lodge, he thinks it only fitting you go along. I'm... I'm flattered, sir. Well, stay grounded, agent. Letting this go to your head can get you killed if you're not careful. You and 34 other agents are to assemble at a diner in the town of Tuttleville by 4.30 tomorrow morning. Go loaded for bear. I'll provide you with detailed directions on how to get there, but it's fairly easy. I'm sure I can find it, sir. But why so many agents to arrest one man? Because evidently he's not alone. The word is there might be ten or eleven more. All members of the Al Jabbar, the bunch that blew up the Echelon building in Cyprus. I haven't been privy to how they reached our soil. All I know is that after I relayed your report, a plane was sent to overfly the lodge and confirm the terrorists are there. Will you be in charge of this operation? Uh, no. An assistant director from headquarters is being flown in. Perhaps it's best if I enlighten you to certain mitigating factors. Apparently, the director had to raise holy hell to get permission for us to go in. He's insisting the Bureau have a hand in nailing the scumbag who killed our boys. But Washington wanted to send in some other agent. 
So they compromised. Did I understand you correctly? They wanted to send in just one guy? So I'm told. He'll be there tomorrow. Our people are to give him their fullest cooperation. Even the AD. Don't let it affect your focus. Go in, do your job, and things will be fine. You're extremely competent, Agent Downing. I know you're up to this. It took an hour and ten minutes to reach Tuttleville, as sleepy a hamlet as Sandra Downing ever saw. The diner, appropriately enough, was called Ma's Place, and the parking lot Vernon had mentioned was in reality a dirt lot. Most of the others involved had already arrived. Downing had to park half a block from the staging area. Her ID in hand, she moved toward a group of agents being addressed by a distinguished-looking gentleman in an expensive suit. She recognized him as Assistant Director Alvin Crampton from headquarters. He was close friends with the director, and rumor had it might have a shot at the position himself one day. She threaded through her fellow agents to hear better, nodding at those she knew. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress enough the crucial nature of this exercise. It is imperative none of the suspects escape our cordon. Washington wants these madmen stopped at all costs. From out of nowhere, a chopper flashed in low over the diner and hovered to one side, the two men inside giving them the once-over. The pilot's lean features creased in a crooked grin. He said something, then laughed and banked the cobra so sharply for a second Downing feared it would flip over completely. Across the street was a playground with the usual slide, swings, and monkey bars, and nearby was a grassy area barely large enough, in her opinion, for a VW bug. Yet the Cobra's pilot sat the warbird down right on it with breathtaking speed. Gazing over at them, he stuck his thumbs in his ears and scrunched up his face. The cockpit opened and out climbed the other man. Once on the ground, he stepped back a safe distance and nodded. The cockpit closed, the pilot wriggled his fingers in parting, and the helicopter whisked off. The newcomer turned. There was something about him, a presence, a sense that here was someone extraordinary. Tall, dark, and muscular, he moved with the fluid ease of a natural-born athlete. She would describe him as ruggedly good-looking, with a face that bore the stamp of hard experience like a badge of honor. Over a form-fitting black suit, the man wore body armor and combat webbing. He was packing plenty of hardware, including an M-16 slung over his left shoulder. The way he carried himself, the word that popped into Downing's mind was soldier. Assistant Director Crampton hurried to meet him. They shook hands, and Downing was fascinated to see the deference with which the A.D. treated him. The soldier absorbed it all in stony silence. May I have your attention? We need to get this show on the road, so I'll be brief. This is Mr. Belasco. He is sanctioned at the highest level not only to take part in this operation, but to exercise command prerogatives as he sees fit. He has graciously allowed me to handle the details, so here's how we'll proceed. Our two SWAT teams will conduct the crux of the operation. The rest of you will primarily be concerned with containment. You'll be divided into four squads, A, B, C, and D, each with a supervisor who will coordinate our deployment and relay instructions in the field. An agent held up a large poster board with the layout of the Huntsman's Lodge drawn in black magic marker. Downing edged closer, as did many others. When we deploy, Squad A will establish a perimeter to the north, B to the east, C to the west, and D to the south. Once we are all in position at my command, our teams will close in and apprehend the suspects. If that's all right by you, Mr. Belasco. Intel suggests there could be as many as 12 of them. We have superior numbers, but they'll be packing a lot of firepower. Get one thing clear here and now, and you'll be a lot better off. These are killers, not run-of-the-mill robbery suspects. They won't give up without a fight, so take them down fast and hard. But be advised that if we can take any alive, we are mandated to do so. He spent the next ten minutes going over the diagram and detailing how events were intended to unfold. That wraps it up, folks. You have your assignments. Oh, before I forget, I need to appoint a liaison and work with Mr. Belasco here. Will Agent Sandra Downing please step forward? Dumbfounded, Downing had to will her legs to work. Any special reason you picked me, sir? You're a qualified marksman, your father was an army colonel, and you spent your entire childhood living on military bases. Downing was puzzled as to what all that had to do with her selection. 
I'll do the best I can, sir. What is it exactly you want me to do? Pretend you're Mr. Belasco's shadow. Left alone by the soldier's side, Downing glanced up at him and tried to quell her nerves. I guess it's you and me then, sir. Mike. I beg your pardon? You can call me Mike if you want. If you say so, sir. You just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Have you ever killed before, Agent Downing? Can't say as I have. I've never been in a position where I've had to. You're in one now. If you don't think you can pull the trigger, if you have any doubts whatsoever, stay in the car. I don't like my liaisons gunned down. <laughs> Does it happen often? Too often. His earnestness rattled her. Let's gear up, people. She was glad when the order came to gear up because it gave her the opportunity to compose herself. She was a professional. She had a job to do. And she would be damned if she would let Assistant Director Crampton or Mike Belasco or anyone else intimidate her. The convoy pulled out precisely at 5.30. To the east, the sky was beginning to brighten. Downing rode in the same car as the AD, in the back seat with Belasco. A Beretta 92F was in a shoulder holster under her right arm, and a Colt M4 carbine was propped against her leg. The AD mentioned you're qualified as a marksman. Yes, sir. My goal is to one day be assigned to a Bureau SWAT team. Not many women are, so it would be quite an honor. Your father will be very proud of you. You don't miss a thing, do you? I can't afford to. It's the little things that trip us up and put our lives in jeopardy. The full significance of what he was doing with them struck home. He had been prepared to take on a dozen terrorists by himself. A person had to either be insane or one of the best soldiers alive to do a thing like that, and he didn't strike her as a lunatic. Assistant Director Crampton looked over his shoulder. With any luck, Mr. Belasco, we'll catch them napping. I plan to stop a quarter of a mile from the lodge and proceed the rest of the way on foot. We'll deploy a hundred yards out and let our SWAT teams move in before we commit ourselves. Is that acceptable? As long as your people do it quietly enough. If you lose the element of surprise, a lot of good agents are going to die. Don't worry, Mr. Belasco. Our people undergo some of the most rigorous training in all of law enforcement, and our SWAT boys are second to none. Downing fingered her M4 and hoped it all went as well as the assistant director seemed to think it would. She remembered her father telling her that in combat, nothing was etched in stone. An op could go south fast, and once it started to unravel, sometimes there was no recovery. Mike Belasco didn't appear the least bit nervous. He was staring out, his posture as natural as if he were slumped on a sofa in his living room. Downing envied him. Her own body was wound as tight as a roll of barbed wire. As soon as the cars pulled over and everyone climbed out, her nervousness evaporated. Crampton was having everyone line up at the side of the road, the SWAT teams in front. Belasco didn't wait for them. Since Downing had been told to stay close to him, when he jogged north, she did too. The sun was poking above the horizon, but much of the countryside was still in shadow. The lodge didn't come into view until they rounded a bend, and then all they could see were the roofs of several cabins. Stick with me. He crossed a ditch into the woods to their left and bore to the north again. Downing glued herself to his heels. She was breathing heavily after they had gone a couple hundred yards, but he wasn't phased one bit. When he abruptly stopped, she almost ran into him. The trees thinned ahead and ended at the edge of a field. Past it was a parking lot. Only one vehicle was parked there, a battered old pickup. Bolin, gazing through a small pair of binoculars, scowled. Damn. What's wrong? I'm afraid the terrorists have flown the coop. The two vehicles they stole, an SUV and a sedan, are gone. They must have left shortly after the copter flew over. By now they could be anywhere. Bolin moved in a crouch toward the field. Agent Downing, where the hell are you? I don't like Belasco and you going off by yourselves. You should have told me. Do you want me to tell him that, sir? No, no, no. Just keep me informed of your location. We don't want any casualties by friendly fire, now do we? Downing filled the AD in on their location, then hastened to catch up to the mystery man. Before she could finish, the soldier grabbed her by the shoulder and yanked her down flat beside him. Oof. She looked in the direction he was looking and discovered why. A man of obvious Arab descent had stepped from a cabin. He was fully dressed in a short-sleeved shirt and slacks and was holding a towel. Facing east, he spread the towel in front of him and got down on his knees. His morning prayers. It stunned her. 
Even though Downing knew the Al-Jabbar was made up of Muslim extremists, she had never given much thought to the religious aspect of their characters. To her, they were cold-blooded killers and nothing more. Two more men came out, one with his own towel, the second carrying a small rug. They knelt on either side of their companion, and all three began bowing and praying. Only three out of twelve. That's better than none. Shouldn't you tell Crampton? He was right. She should have reported it the moment the suspects appeared. Advise him to stop where he is, and keep everyone there until I give the all clear. We don't want the terrorists to spot them if we can help it. And let him know the Arabs are the only guests at the lodge. Those three wouldn't be praying out in the open if anyone else was around. It would be too conspicuous. The agent quietly did as he had instructed. In a bit, they came to a field, and the soldiers sighted down his M-16. You wouldn't shoot them when they're unarmed, would you? Who says they are? Their prayers lasted longer than Downing imagined. The sun was almost all the way above the horizon when the trio stood, picked up the towels and rug, and went back inside. Now? Now. But remind Crampton the terrorists are wide awake and might have a man posted at the windows. Downing resented the implication her fellow agents would botch it if they weren't careful, but she smothered her feelings and passed on the message. The soldier snaked into the field, winding sinuously through the high grass, barely disturbing the stems. He stopped halfway across. This is as close as we dare go. Excitement rose in Downing. She had never been on a field op this big or this dangerous. The soldier, though, was calm. He turned, staring off to the east. He didn't seem particularly pleased. Downing shifted and discovered why. A line of agents was taking up position, and although they tried to stick to cover, every now and then she could see one as plain as day. And if she could, so could the terrorists. They're doing the best they can. That's not good enough. More agents were spreading out to the north and west. Others formed a line to the south between the field and the woods. The grass behind Downing rustled, and up beside them crabbed Assistant Director Crampton. He was sweating profusely, and his face was fire engine red. <sighs> We're almost ready. I just hope they haven't spotted us, sir. And if they have, there are three of them and thirty-five of us. They don't stand a snowball's chance in hell. SWAT 1 and SWAT 2, are you in position? Excellent. We are good to go on cabin number four. I repeat, we are good to go on the fourth cabin. Decked out in helmets, armor, and camo, the FBI SWAT units closed in, one from the east, the other from the west. Downing admired their military efficiency. How they flitted from spot to spot, always with their weapons at combat ready, one always covering the others. The teams had honed their coordination to a science. They reached the lodge in question, and while SWAT 2 covered all the windows and the door, SWAT 1 moved in. As yet there was no movement, no sign of life at all from within the lodge. Another few seconds and we'll have them. Like mice in a trap. SWAT 1 now had men on either side of the door. At a hand signal from the team leader, two of the agents stepped in front of it to kick it in. There they were, Two FBI SWAT teams, highly trained and supremely competent, about to kick the lid off a can of worms. In effect, Bolin was there as a glorified observer. He was supposed to offer Crampton the benefit of his expertise and see to it the agents didn't make fatal blunders. But as long as they did everything by the book, all he could do was sit back and hope for the best. As the two SWAT members prepared to break down the door, autofire from inside churned the door into Swiss cheese and did much the same to them. Their body armor protected them from the worst of the hailstorm, but not from all of it, and down they went. At the same instant, the door to a cabin catty corner from the one housing the three terrorists was swung open, revealing a fourth. He had an SMG, and before SWAT 1 and SWAT 2 had any inkling he was there, he cut three of them down with brief but accurate bursts. Son of a bitch! Swanson, get your wounded out of there! Retreat and regroup! The terrorists in the first cabin were firing through the windows, catching SWAT 1 and SWAT 2 in a withering crossfire. A single SWAT member made it to the corner of another cabin farther down, and he limped badly. This can't be happening! We have men down! All agents, converge on the lodge at my command! Bolin had lain idly by long enough. He had fulfilled his promise to Brognola, and now it was time to take control. Cancel that order. Now, I'll handle it alone. Like hell? Those are our people on the ground, and we'll get them out of there! Do you remember what your director told you? The assistant director hesitated. He nodded, his reason asserting itself over his outrage. 
but then one of the terrorists fired a short burst into a fallen agent feebly trying to crawl to safety. God damn it, that's it! Our people are being slaughtered! Close in! Close in! The assistant director barreled toward the cabins. The agents on the perimeter were also on the move. Bolin acted. His fingers a blur, he fed a high explosive grenade into the grenade launcher. Angling the M16 skyward, he gauged the trajectory and fired. He couldn't hope to hit the cabins from where he was, but he could land the grenade right on top of the beat-up old pickup in the parking lot. The blast was loud, but even louder was the explosion when the gas tank went up. The force blew the pickup into the air, flipping it onto its shattered roof. The soldier's ploy had the desired effect. The FBI agents halted in their tracks, including Crampton. Overtaking him, Bolin grabbed him by the arm and practically threw him to the ground, then knelt down. Not another step. Call off your agents, or you'll have to answer to your director for your failure to obey a direct order. Have your people stand down. I'm going in. Without waiting for an acknowledgement, Bolin rose and stalked toward the lodge. He had only gone a few yards when the grass beside him rustled. He knew who it was without looking. Tell me, what do you think you're doing? You're following orders? So am I. Your devotion is duly noted. I get back there. No can do, Mr. Velasco. Bolin stopped and turned. The iron set of her jaw told him it was pointless to argue. Either he slugged her and left her there unconscious, or he made the best of the situation. He was going to have a long talk with Prognola when he got back. You could be killed, Agent. I knew the risks when I signed on. End of discussion. Do what I do, then. Keep your head down. Bolin directed her, and was off through the high grass, beelining toward a cabin several doors to the west of those occupied by the terrorists. There were twelve cabins in all, staggered in a long row and separated by small islands of shrubberies and trees. A stone walk threaded among them and over to the office. Suddenly, the door to cabin number four opened and the lone fanatic dashed toward cabin three, the one his allies were in. Pivoting from side to side, he sprayed lead indiscriminately. Snapping up the M16, Bolin fired. Downing's shots echoed his own. The terrorist was flung to the stone walk. He tried to push himself up, but collapsed. SMGs opened up from cabin number three, firing into the tall grass, but Bolin and Downing were no longer there. The executioner had led her to the left, and they were only 20 yards from cabin number seven. The grass ended well short of it. When I give the word, run like hell. Now! They hurtled from cover with a dozen yards to go. At least one of the terrorists spotted them. Without delay, Bolin moved around to the northwest corner. From there, he had a clear line of sight at the west side of cabin number three. The window had been busted out, but he didn't see anyone. I'm gonna work my way closer. Cover that window. Are you sure this isn't an excuse to ditch me? You're a qualified marksman, remember? The range wasn't all that great, 60 yards, but the window was narrow and the targets would be in shadow. It would take some fine shooting. They won't lay a slug on you. Bolin ducked in among some shrubs to cabin number six. Staying close to the rear wall, he sidled to the corner and on into the next strip of vegetation. Cabin number five wasn't in a direct line with number six, but to the south about 10 yards. He had to cross another open space to reach it and glanced back to make sure Downing was in position. An enemy filled the window, submachine gun firm against his hip. In the blink of an eye, Downing's M4 chattered. Dark splotches marked the gunner's face and he staggered back. Bolin gained the safety of cabin number five. Moving to the front, he sidestepped to the corner. Velasco! One of them's making a break for it! Bolin spotted a stocky terrorist in full flight to the southeast. He had a scorpion and he was raking the grass and the trees with the intent of punching through the federal cordon. He couldn't keep them pinned down forever, and he knew it. His right hand disappeared under his jacket and reappeared clutching a grenade. Jerking the pin, he slowed and cocked his arm. He was close enough to the agents to catch seven or eight in the blast radius. Bolin aimed at the man's right shoulder and arm, his slugs shearing through sinew and bone just as the terrorists started to throw. The grenade fell from fingers gone numb or limp right at the man's feet. He dropped his subgun and grabbed the grenade with his other hand. What was left of the unlucky man rained down in pieces. Bolin ran between a couple of pines to cabin five and along the front to where he had an unobstructed view of the cabin containing the last Aljabar gunner. The door was wide open and a swarthy face appeared in the doorway. Only for a moment, though. 
backpedaling, Boland centered the M16's sights on the entrance. As soon as the man stepped through, he would fire. Another moment, and a long, dusky-hued object protruded from one of the shattered windows. The thickness of a man's arm, it was capped by a cylindrical cone. Boland instantly knew what it was, a Russian-made RPG-7 missile launcher. It swung toward him, and he did the only thing he could do, run. He hoped to reach the far side of the cabin before the terrorist fired, but he wasn't quite there. The heat missile struck the corner where he had just been standing, and the force of the explosion pitched him to his hands and knees. Covering his head, Boland pressed his forehead to the ground as pieces of wall and roof pelted him and the surrounding area. Most of the debris was small and only stung, but a few pieces were large enough to leave bruises and welts. A cloud of dust and smoke rose. Holding his breath, Boland wheeled and flung himself around the corner toward cabin three. He had to reach it before the terrorist reloaded. With a range of close to 500 yards, the RPG-7 could reach any of the feds along the perimeter. Groping through the smoke, Boland nearly tripped over the body of a SWAT member. He stepped over it, groped right, groped left, and suddenly the doorway was straight ahead. Sprinting across the jam, he saw his enemy feeding another missile into the launcher. The fanatic was caught flat-footed, but made a stab for an Uzi on the floor at his feet. Bolin emptied his magazine. He slapped a new magazine in and went outside. Crampton and a knot of agents were hurrying from the field. Havelson, get the vehicles up here ASAP. Ziegler, I want this whole area taped off. Stinson, get cracking on fingerprints. Caldwell, I want all these cabins gone over with a fine-tooth comb. We might find a clue as to where the rest of this bunch was headed. Boland slung his M16 and moved toward the parking lot. His presence was no longer required. If the FBI learned anything important, they were under orders to relay it up to Brognola. He unclipped his cell phone. Grimaldi had promised to stay nearby and be ready for a swift liftoff. Say the magic word. Get me the hell out of here. A gleaming cobra blazed out of the sun. The canopy rose, revealing the grinning features of Jack Grimaldi. You rang, boss? The drive to Philadelphia was much too long to suit Aban Abbas. Every minute wasted was another minute the American authorities spent tracking them down, and he couldn't bear the thought of being captured. Not after all he and his brothers had gone through. Not after the cost of money and men, and the loss of their headquarters in Somalia. Sefu was driving the SUV, Aban beside him. In the back seat were Rakin and Sharif. Jamila followed in the sedan along with Barak, Yassin, and Hosef. Abbas had left the rest of his followers at the lodge to get ready for the assault on Washington, D.C. Every weapon had to be cleaned and reloaded, every piece of ordnance inspected. He tried to raise their contact, Mukhtar, on his cell phone again, but there was no answer. Relax, brother. He is not expecting us for another 90 minutes yet. He could be anywhere. I can't believe we are together again. You have no idea how much I have missed you. I have missed you too, Safu. When this is over, I hope we will have some time to ourselves. I would like to hear about Mother and our family. I miss them. I miss our home. Then you will be pleased to learn that when this is over, you are returning with us. <sighs> Do you mean it? Honestly and truly mean it? Sefo, after we destroy the National Security Agency, we will be the most wanted men on the planet. The Americans and their allies will stop at nothing to seek us out. We will recall all our brothers and go deep into hiding. I do not like the idea of cowering from our enemies. It is common sense, Rakin, nothing more. Would you have us suffer the same fate as the Taliban? You overestimate these Americans. They are not the gods of technology they pretend to be. Are you an idiot? They have dogged us every step of the way. Have you forgotten about Pakistan, Greece, the ship not 24 hours ago? Still your tongue before I remove it for you. Abbas loathed having his decisions questioned. He particularly didn't like being challenged in front of his brother. But he swallowed his pride for the time being since he had need of the renegade Saudi's deep purse. I did not join your organization to serve as its treasury. I do not mind funding the Al Jabbar as long as my money is put to use destroying those who would strip Muslims of their rightful religion. How can you find fault with our leader? Rakin, look at all the great work he has accomplished. The destruction of the Echelon site. 
the many assassinations, and now he is about to do what no others have ever done, to strike at the very heart of the great Satan in such a manner, the whole world will marvel. We have yet to learn exactly how we are to achieve our mission. It is not as if we can walk into NSA headquarters unchallenged. They are bound to be a multitude of guards, security cameras, and more. In war, as in any endeavor, the simplest approach is the best. I have done my research, as always. Yes, the NSA buildings are extremely well protected. But did you know that they, like the FBI and the CIA, allow visitors inside? Not into sensitive areas, to be sure, but politicians, journalists, even school children are given limited run of certain floors. Is that how you plan to get us in? Posing as journalists? We would not get ten meters in the door. Do not insult my intelligence. I intend to exploit another flaw in their security, one ideally suited for what I have in mind. It would also solve the other problem he had. The thought of disposing of Jamila troubled him deeply. It wasn't her fault he couldn't control his baser urges. Abbas stared out the window. It wasn't too late to reconsider. Maybe the others wouldn't think less of him if they learned of his dalliance. For a moment he wavered. But only a moment. He couldn't bear to have the image he had worked so hard to achieve tarnished. He could not bear to have his followers think he was too weak-willed to resist the needs he had criticized in others. He was their leader, their teacher, their master. He should be above carnal temptations. A tiny voice at the back of Abbas's mind objected. It urged that the step he was contemplating was too drastic. He should banish Jamila from the Aljabar, not kill her. Yet that was bound to incite talk behind his back. The others might suspect and might think less of him, even as Sharik did now. Abbas steeled himself. He had to be true to his original purpose. Later, once the deed was done, he would ask God for forgiveness and get on with his life, and pray he was never tempted again. Traffic was heavy, but they made good time. They had left the Huntsman's Lodge at 4 a.m. in order to arrive in Philadelphia by 9, and pulled into Mukhtar's driveway 40 minutes earlier. His house was in an older neighborhood, set back from the street amid towering maple trees. Stretching, Abbas moved past a van to a concrete walk. The yard was freshly mowed, a flourishing garden. From a bronze post on the front porch hung a small American flag. Ah, Mukhtar is blending in, as he was instructed. Mukhtar was in his late sixties, much too old for the front ranks of the Holy War, but he was invaluable in other respects and as devoted to the cause as the rest. Oh, good morning, Master. Please come in. Would you care for some refreshment? I have some prepared. I would rather see the eye of God first, Mukhtar. Oh, of course, of course. I had the men who delivered it place the crate in the basement. Please, follow me. Were there any problems? None at all, Great One. The crate cleared customs without a hitch. The express delivery must have cost you a fortune for something that size. What is this eye of God? Why have I never heard of it? You will see shortly, Sappho. The men made their way downstairs to the crate Abbas had been anticipating. Open it. They soon had the top off and were piling the packing material to one side. When they saw the four large Etruscan-style vases, they looked at one another in bewilderment. Lift them out. One will be heavier than the others. Place that one before me. Everyone crowded around. The vase was waist-high, twice as broad at the bottom as at the top, and exquisitely detailed. Abbas tapped it a few times. It had been an expensive counterfeit. Thanks to the special alloy shielding, not even an X-ray machine could detect the false bottom or the cavity underneath. Break it. Carefully. It was the work of moments to reveal an oval object about the size of a football wrapped in heavy padding. Motioning for the others to move back, Abbas squatted and removed the padding himself. There it was, in all its gleaming majesty. He placed his hands on the cool metal. The Eye of God. What is it, Aban? Surely we can't destroy NSA headquarters with something so small. <laughs> we can, and we will. What you are looking at is the world's first tactical cobalt bomb. Rumors, rumors, and more rumors. They poured in every day, from every major country. Gleaning the valuable information was an ongoing chore. 
Most turned out to be nothing more than hearsay or misinformation. A few, a precious few, turned out to be genuine and more than made up for the many false leads. This latest bit of intel had Hal Brognola worried. Planted in his chair at Stony Man Farm, he reread the report from Interpol that was relayed to him less than an hour ago. An arms dealer had been arrested the day before, a Libyan operating out of Crete, with strong ties to the Arab nation. As part of a plea bargain, he had agreed to divulge information on his contacts. His greatest claim was to have brokered a deal with a terrorist organization for a newly developed cobalt nuke. The organization was the Al-Jabbar. Prognola had been inclined to dismiss it at first. Everyone knew Iraq had been trying to go nuclear for decades now, and the best intel suggested they had gotten nowhere. Nor had there ever been so much as a whisper they were working on a cobalt bomb. Dirty nukes, the devices were called, because cobalt bombs spewed radioactive particles into the atmosphere that stayed active far longer than those from other types of bombs, and consequently contaminated a much wider area. He shuddered to think what would happen if one ever fell into the hands of fanatics. But did they have one? Brognola doubted it until a second message from Interpol showed up minutes ago. The arms dealer had provided more details. He had dealt with Aban Abbas personally and had learned Abbas planned to have the device shipped quickly to the United States. How else could the arms dealer have known the Al-Jabbar was coming to America unless he had really talked to a member? Brognola had hoped the FBI raid would capture the whole Brotherhood in one fell swoop, but only four had been accounted for. Seven or eight remained at large. Time was running out. Time Brognola was afraid they didn't have. Every agency at the federal, state, and local level was being asked to go all out on this one, to expend every resource. The stakes had been high enough when the Al-Jabbar had conventional explosives. Now that they might have a cobalt bomb... As if all that weren't enough, there was another facet to consider. According to the arms merchant, the cobalt nuke wasn't a full-size model, but one no bigger than a football, a little bundle of thermonuclear horror that could be stashed anywhere and programmed to go off when the terrorists were miles away. At least Prognola had a few new angles to work on. First and foremost, every shipping company was being checked. If Abbas had sent the nuke to America through a legitimate carrier, there would be a record of it somewhere. Customs inspectors weren't quite as diligent about inspecting the shipments of major carriers. Come in. Good news, Chief. We haven't heard about the fingerprints or from the lab boys yet. But the phone company has come through with a list of all the phone calls to and from the Huntsman's Lodge since Sefu Abbas checked in under an assumed name. There weren't all that many. Seventeen, in fact. Except for three, they were all local calls most likely made by the owner, Carl Lester, whose body was found stuffed in a closet in the office. The other three? Placed to the same number in Philadelphia. A Mr. Jonas Periwinkle, age 68, a retired machinist. He resides at 137 Thorndike in Northwest Philly. He's lived there for 37 years. No criminal record that I could find. Not so much as a parking ticket in all that time. 37 years? Doesn't sound like your typical sleeper, does he? He didn't fit the profile, no. Then I did some digging. Mr. Periwinkle immigrated to the U.S. from Libya and changed his name. His name was Mukhtar al-Samusi. Where are Stryker and Jack now? Somewhere over southern Pennsylvania or northern New Jersey, depending on how long it took them to refuel. Have them divert. Tell Jack to land at Willow Grove Naval Air Station. I'll call and arrange special clearance. And give Stryker this Mukhtar's address. You want him to go in alone? After the fiasco and the Catskills, you bet I do. Fill Stryker in on the Cobalt Bomb. Advise him from this point on, all the stops are out. I want the Algebar taken down. Now! Mac Bolin cruised around the block twice in the rented car that had been waiting for him at Willow Grove Naval Air Station, courtesy of Brognola. He had changed into his civvies and his trench coat and was armed with the Beretta 93R and the Desert Eagle. In the back seat was his duffel. The neighborhood lay quiet under the midday sun. Most of the homes were Gothic style and well maintained. He pulled to the curb in front of 137 Thorndike and got out, making sure to lock the doors. Tall trees shaded him as he walked up a curved drive, past a van parked in front of the garage. 
An old man was puttering in a flower garden and quietly humming. Bolin had seen him from the street. One hand under his jacket, he stood close to the corner of the garage. Mr. Periwinkle, I'd like a word with you. Yes, young man, how can I be of service? Your friends, where are they? To whom do you refer? I'm afraid I don't have the foggiest notion what you're talking about. The men who were here earlier. Playing games will get you nowhere. If you don't tell me, you'll tell the federal agents when they take you into custody. Is it illegal to grow flowers now? There must be some mistake. Come inside. I'll treat you to a cup of coffee and we can sort this out. Bolin wanted to go in anyway. Drawing the Beretta, he held it under his jacket. Lead the way. These old legs of mine aren't what they used to be. Half an hour of gardening and I can barely walk. It's true what everyone says. Old age really is a bear. <laughs> Do they say that in Libya too, Mukhtar al Samusi? There's a similar saying, yes. But how in the world did you know my old name and where I'm from? I haven't thought about my early years and ages. Times were tough back then, young man. I wanted a new, better life for myself. So I scrimped and saved until I had enough money for passage to America. Never regretted my decision either. After you. You can have a seat if you'd like. It won't take me but a few minutes. Bolin kept on following. An air of stillness gripped the house, persuading him they were the only ones there. But he didn't relax his guard. What is the Aljabar up to, Mukhtar? Who? We know they've contacted you. Tell us what they're up to and the feds will go a lot easier on you. Son, if I had any idea what you were talking about, I'd gladly do as you've requested. <laughs> but for the life of me, I've never heard of any Al uh, what's this. They entered the kitchen, which was a mess. Dirty plates and saucers were heaped high in the sink, and used coffee cups had been left on the counter. An open loaf of bread was on the table, along with a butter dish and several butter knives. Ah, I had a bunch of my bowling buddies over this morning. Still got half a pot left. Or would you rather I make a fresh one? Sit down at the table so we can talk. Ignoring him, Periwinkle opened a cupboard. I don't know about you, but I can never get enough. Guess I'm a caffeine addict. My only other vice would be vanilla fudge. Bolin let the man prattle. Lowering the Beretta to his side, he waited for what was sure to come. Caffeine and sweets give you a little extra energy. And at my age, I can use all the energy I can get. We'll each need spoons for the cream and sugar. Bolin leveled his pistol. For someone his age, Periwinkle could move fast when he had to. His hand swept out of a drawer clutching a ten-inch steak knife, and whirling, he raised it overhead. He had only taken a couple of steps when he saw the Beretta, and stopped as abruptly as if he had run into an unseen wall. Drop it, or I drop you. For a moment, it appeared the old man would choose suicide. He elevated the knife another inch or two and took a step, then faltered. The knife. Periwinkle shuffled to the table and sank into a chair. Oh. The soldier unclipped his cell phone. A car full of federal agents and a cleanup crew consisting of Brognola's own people were awaiting word five blocks away. Periwinkle looked up, his eyes brimming with tears. I did it for the money, mostly. Before Al-Jabbar, I worked for some others. They paid extremely well. All I care about is where Abbas went from here. You've got to understand. I didn't know what was in that crate. I swear I didn't. When he told us what it was, I couldn't believe my ears. I mean, guns and plastique I could understand. But a nuclear bomb. It's true then? Abbas got his hands on a cobalt bomb? Shiny little thing. You'd never guess it to look at it. I asked him how powerful it was, and he said it had a blast radius of half a mile. I never guessed he'd take it this far, or I'd never have wanted any part of it. I don't want to go down in history as being party to the worst terrorist act in the history of the world. <gasps> What have I done? Snap out of it and tell me where they've gone. I'll tell everything I know. How much time do we have? I wish I knew. Abbas is playing this one pretty close to the vest. You must have some idea. All I can tell you is that he plans to set the bomb, then catch a freighter out of Baltimore. Whether that's tonight or tomorrow, I couldn't say. But I know the target he's picked, 
and how he plans to go about sneaking the bomb in. The SUV and sedan were traveling north out of Philadelphia on Interstate 95. Mm -hmm. Now that's what I call clam. Nobody makes a better chowder than clam big bomb. This is a WNEX special bulletin. WNEX News has learned that earlier today, agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation engaged as yet unidentified terrorists in a gun battle at a secluded hunting lodge in the Catskill Mountains of New York. Details are sketchy at this point, but it is known several agents lost their lives and several more were airlifted to a New York area hospital in critical condition. No! What of Mozafar and the rest? More information is being handed to me. Quiet! At least three terrorists were slain, and a fourth might have been airlifted to the same hospital and is now under guard. The FBI has called a news conference in an hour. WNEX will have more information as it becomes available. This has been a WNEX special... So, you outfoxed the FBI, did you, Sefo? Ah, but the blame is not entirely yours. I should never have left them behind. We owe it to ourselves as well as our fallen brothers to see it through to the end. We must reach a town near our target no later than 5.30. We can make it in time. Originally, Abbas had planned to place the cobalt bomb in close proximity to the NSA's headquarters early next morning, then race to Baltimore and be on a freighter leaving at noon. But if the news report was right and one of his followers had been taken prisoner, the man might be made to talk. It was well known that Americans used drugs and torture to loosen tongues. The Americans denied it naturally, but it was just another of their lies. Muzaffer and the others at the lodge hadn't known about the cobalt bomb, but they did know the target, which was why Abbas now felt he had to push up the timetable. Based on the information Mukhtar supplied, only one window of opportunity existed. Any other time would incite suspicion. As the two vehicles sped south, Abbas mulled over what to do. It became clear a diversion was called for. The only thing was, whoever took part stood little hope of making it out alive. He glanced at Sharik, then out the rear window at Jamila, and all the pieces fell into place. Little was said the rest of the ride. Occasionally, one of the others would glance at the bomb nestled in a blanket between Sharik and Rakim, but they kept their thoughts to themselves. The National Security Agency was headquartered at Fort George C. Meade in Maryland. Located some 18 miles southwest of Baltimore, the fort covered more than 14,000 acres and was the command site for various army units. Security, needless to say, was tight. From the outset, Abbas knew he faced two problems. First, how to get onto the base unnoticed. Second, finding a suitable spot to plant the bomb. Although it could be hidden anywhere within the fort's boundaries and it would still destroy the NSA when it detonated, for personal as well as practical reasons, Abbas wanted to plant the device as close to NSA headquarters as possible. Vehicles weren't allowed past a certain point, with one exception. It was no secret the National Security Agency employed thousands. The majority worked at two monolithic buildings within a quarter mile of each other. That many people generated a lot of paperwork and a lot of trash, tons daily. Much of it was classified and was disposed of by NSA personnel either by shredding or burning. The rest was hauled away by a private contractor. Mukhtar al samusi had spent several days last week watching the comings and goings at Fort Meade from a park near the north entrance. Abbas had instructed him to be on the lookout for utility and service vehicles that entered the base daily, and the giant orange sanitation trucks with the company name painted on them in big bold letters were hard to miss. At exactly 5.37 p.m., the SUV and the sedan pulled up in front of Premier Sanitation in Severn, Maryland, after making a circuit of the block. A single-story brick building housed the company offices. Behind it was a parking lot for the trucks, ringed by a seven-foot-high chain-link fence. A gate at the rear of the lot hung open. Abbas slid from the SUV and beckoned to Jamila and the others. Jamila, Rakeen, and I will go in the front. The rest of you are to go around back and in through the gate. Kill them all. Hide the bodies. We will meet by the trucks. Abbas approached the double glass doors bearing the company logo. His jacket concealed a Turkish-made 9mm curriculae. His had a stubby custom sound suppressor attached. A petite secretary in a small reception area greeted them with a friendly smile. Good afternoon and welcome to Premier Sanitation. How may I help you? 
Is anyone in? Our president, Mr. Peterson, is, but as a general rule, you can't see him without an appointment. I can. William Peterson was a portly man in his late forties. He was picking his teeth with a toothpick when a boss entered. Mr. Peterson? Yes? Who are you? How do you get past Deirdre? Uh, like this. A bullet through the eye ended Peterson's teeth-picking days, and Rakeen hauled the body to a closet and rolled it inside. A boss led them to the other door, which opened onto a long, narrow hall. The first room they came to was empty. The next was a kitchenette, in which sat three men in orange coveralls. They were drinking coffee and stopped in amazement when Jamila walked in. Whoa, baby! Am I ever glad you came into my life? I doubt that. <laughs> At the end of the hall was another door that led to a platform. Five orange trucks were backed up against it, with a space for a sixth. Jabel was out by the gate, looking nervous. Barak, Yassin, Malik, and Sefu saw a boss and climbed stairs to the platform. There's not a soul back here, brother. The rest of the workers must have gone home. A boss walked to the edge and nodded at the empty space. Not quite. One truck has yet to arrive. Sefu, stay out here with Jabel and Malik. When the last driver shows up, dispose of him, then join the rest of us in the President's office. The next pickup at the NSA is not until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Can we afford to wait that long? No. As soon as the missing truck arrives, we will put the last phase into operation. It's time. The Cobra streaked over the Maryland countryside at its top speed of 150 miles an hour. Perched in the front of the cockpit, the executioner watched another town flash by beneath them. Kids stopped what they were doing to gawk in awe. All were blissfully unaware the Grim Reaper was poised to wipe out tens of thousands, unless a band of hate-filled fanatics was stopped in time. Almost there, Sarge. Too bad these babies don't come with CD systems. We could crank up Flight of the Valkyrie and do this in style. A joke at a time like this? Who's joking? Didn't you ever see Apocalypse Now? That scene where the choppers go roaring in with Wagner blaring is the greatest. You could always hum it. A joke from you? <laughs> now I know the world is coming to an end. Despite himself, Poland grinned. His friend was only trying to loosen him up. Striker, Spragnola, what's your ETA? Any minute now. What's the latest on your end? I've cleared you with the military and the FAA. You're cleared to enter any and all restricted airspace and won't have an F-16 breathing down your neck. I've also talked to the commander at Fort Meade, and he's put the base on red alert. They're doubling the gate guards. No one will get in without an ID check and a vehicle search. That'll help. It was well to remember a little thing like that wouldn't stop someone as determined and resourceful as Avan Abbas. What about the NSA? I've spoken to the NSA chief, and they're evacuating all non-essential personnel from their buildings. Since we don't want to panic on our hands, the word's being spread that the buildings need to be checked for possible cockroach infestation. One other thing. We still can't get through to Premier Sanitation. We keep getting their answering machine. They close at 6, so it might mean nothing. By Boland's watch, it was 10 minutes past 7. This should be 7 below us. The Cobra was flying so low and so fast, to Bolin, every town and suburb looked pretty much the same. His friend had the benefit of being linked to the most sophisticated GPS equipment in the world, and seconds later, Grimaldi brought them in directly over Premier Sanitation and hovered. Three orange sanitation trucks were parked adjacent to a platform at the rear. A gate in the fence was shut and secured with a padlock. All the blinds in the windows had been drawn, and there was no sign of activity within. Romaldi swung the copter around, and Boland plainly saw a closed sign on the front door. Is there space enough around back for you to sit down? Is the bear Catholic? The Cobra flew over the building and out to the lot. From their new angle, Boland could see into the cabs of the trucks. All were empty. I want you to drop me off, then go back up and wait. While I'm inside, contact Hal and ask him if he can find out exactly how many trucks the company has. Those three vacant parking spaces worry me. The instant the canopy was open, Bolin removed his helmet, slung the MP5 over his shoulder, and slid out. Darting to the nearest truck, he waited until Grimaldi had taken the bird up before bounding up the steps. All seemed peaceful enough. Bolin stalked to the back door and tried the knob. It was locked as it should be.
All the lights in the building were off, and it was silent. Bolin warily advanced. The owner might have a fit about the door, but time was of the essence. Rognola could always apologize and offer to reimburse him. Something, a sense of movement, brought the soldier to a stop. Crouching, he strained his senses to their limit, but nothing out of the ordinary registered. He silently crept to a doorway. It was a break room filled with food machines, a long table, and chairs. Nothing seemed out of place, and he started to move on when he spied dark splotches near a chair. Drops of liquid of some kind. Spilled soda, he thought, but it wouldn't hurt to see. As Boland stepped into the doorway, a shadow grew from the side of a candy bar machine. <coughs> Boland flung himself into the hall a microsecond ahead of hammering auto fire. Simultaneously, another shadow appeared at the end of the hall and cut loose. The rounds missed by a whisker. Bolin returned fire, and the gunner down the hall disappeared. He flattened as the one in the break room fired through the wall. After that, silence. The hallway was too exposed. Past the break room on the left was another doorway. If Bolin could reach it, he would be in a perfect position to keep an eye on the break room doorway and the end of the hall without showing himself. He levered upright. The terrorist in the break room hastily fired, stitching the wall in his wake. Ducking into the room, Bolin squatted. A grenade would come in handy, but he had left them in his duffel in the chopper. Focused on the end of the hall, Bolin almost missed spotting a figure flick across the break room doorway. He pivoted, thinking the guy up front was trying to draw his attention so the other one could nail him. Minute followed slow minute, but neither of the terrorists made a move. Bolin began to wonder if they were deliberately trying to delay him, to keep him there so he couldn't go after the others. But that presupposed a boss expected him to show up, which seemed a bit far-fetched. If they expected him to play by their rules, they had another think coming. Palming the Desert Eagle, he tossed it well past the break room door. The big pistol smacked the floor with a loud crack and slid several feet. Yassin did exactly as the soldier wanted. He peered around the jam to see what had made the noise. Bolin squeezed the trigger. Bolin glued his gaze on the end of the hall, his finger wrapped around the trigger. All he needed was a glimpse, just a glimpse. A shaft of sunlight pierced the hallway. Comprehension dawned. The blood in Bolin's veins turned to ice. He sped down the hall, fearing what he would find when he reached the street. Only a few yards from the entrance, a middle-aged woman was sprawled in a spreading scarlet pool. At the far corner on the right was Barak. He smiled a cruel smile and ran up the next street. By the time he got there, the terrorist was nowhere to be seen. Son of a bitch. He came to the next door and beheld more grisly slaughter. Five bodies and a car that had crashed into the front of a jewelry store. He also saw Barack fly around yet another corner at the end of the block. The bastard was a two-legged antelope. His legs churning, Bolin desperately sought to overtake the fiend. It only took Bolin a few seconds to round the next intersection. He caught sight of his prey running through the gaping door of a bowling alley. A lump of raw anger formed in Bolin's throat. He pounded up a carpeted walkway and saw people fearfully huddled under tables and behind racks of bowling balls, anywhere they could find a place to hide. Bodies were all over the place. An exit door on the other side of the building cracked open, disgorging Barat. Bolin gave chase, and in his eagerness to end the carnage, he almost committed a fatal blunder. He almost burst outside without stopping to look. The exit door opened onto a parking lot. Barat was between two cars in the second aisle, waiting. Stinging shards pelted Bolin's cheek and arm as he jerked back. The instant the firing stopped, he tore on through, bent low behind a car so the bastard couldn't see him. Bolin peered over the trunk. Desperately, Barak had smashed in a car window and had opened the door. He was stealing the car. His attention divided for all of five seconds. It was all the opportunity Bolin needed. Jack. Right here. Call 911. Get medical personnel to the bowling alley. Then meet me in the street for immediate dust off. Done and done. Wanna live 
soldier! Head for Fort Meade. What have you heard from Hal about the trucks? He says the company owns six. Then three are missing. Any word from the base? That last report, the evacuation of NSA personnel is underway, but it's going slowly. Bumper to bumper is how Hal described it. Why three trucks, you reckon? The old pee in the shell game? That would be my guess. Bolin had played it as a kid. A pea was placed under one of three walnut shells. Then the shells were slid back and forth and around and around, changing places constantly to confuse the person who had to guess which shell hid the pea. A boss was playing a variation, using sanitation trucks and a thermonuclear device. Brignola also said the military police are out in force, and the civilian police in Laurel and other surrounding towns are establishing a cordon on all roads leading into the base. Between you, me, and the goalpost, buddy, I don't see how in hell these bozos are going to get that bomb anywhere near the NSA. Those garbage trucks will stick out like a sore thumb. I can't figure out how Abbas hopes to do it either. He's a lot of things, but stupid isn't one of them. Take us higher. One bird's eye view, coming up. Bolin leaned forward for a better view. They were fast approaching Fort Meade's perimeter, a high fence stretching as far as the eye could see. Exactly how big the base was became disturbingly apparent. To make matters worse, some of it was forested, with trees growing close to the fence at several points. There's no way the MPs can prevent a breach over turf that large. Patch into their communications net. If something happens, I want to know the second they do. It was exactly as the MP had described. Traffic was backed up both ways for more than half a mile. Inbound traffic because every vehicle had to be stopped and searched. Outbound traffic because of the thousands of National Security Agency employees being sent home. Well, we can rule out the terrorists getting in that way. Follow the fence. It would be simple for a boss to crash through with the stolen sanitation trucks. They were the best vehicles for choice this side of tanks. Once those huge monsters gained enough speed, they were virtually unstoppable. Maybe they'll wait until it's dark. That's what I do. Tactically, that makes sense. But I wouldn't put it past Abbas to do the unexpected and send the trucks in while it was still light. All that congestion is bound to delay the MP's response time. Hang on. Something coming in. Just got word from the big guy. The army is sending up some choppers of their own. It'll be a few minutes yet before they're in the air. There's also word the Air Force has scrambled a pair of F-16s. ETA, 22 minutes. A thick tract of trees bordered a section of fence just ahead. The fence itself bordered a lush park complete with bike trails, a playground, and a baseball field with a game in progress. A canopy of trees hid much of the rest. Boland peered intently through the foliage, but saw nothing unusual. He shifted to focus on the next section, then stiffened. For a brief instant, he thought he'd glimpsed a patch of orange near the park entrance. Take us lower and back over that park. Boland scanned the area where he had seen the orange, but all he saw now was a young woman on a bike. She had on a red windbreaker, and he wondered if that was what he had seen. Sarge, there! It came hurtling out of the trees, doing over 50 miles an hour. An orange behemoth that had jumped the curb and was making a beeline for the fence. The driver didn't care that the baseball diamond was in his way. Some of the kids saw or heard it and scrambled for safety, yelling to warn their friends. Those bastards! The cobra streaked toward the diamond, but the pilot didn't dare fire, not with so many civilians. The outfielders had scattered. The truck roared past, into more trees, and was only 25 yards from the fence. Can you take them out? Again, the cobra dipped, swooping toward the truck like a hawk. Tree limbs dissolved as the minigun ripped them to a pulp, but the truck never slowed, never changed course. It hit the fence dead on and flattened a 30-foot section like it was so much paper. Beyond were more trees and a road. Grimaldi banked for another strafing run. At the same moment, Boland's headset blared. Reports were coming in from military police on the west perimeter. Another sanitation truck had broken through, and the MPs were in pursuit. The chopper went into a dive. Grimaldi brought it in so low, Boland clearly saw the driver in the cab. It was a young man of 20 with dark curly hair, smiling serenely to himself as if he were out for a Sunday ride instead of engaged in a heinous act of wanton destruction. Thunderous death chugged from the M197 and clouds of dirt erupted like volcanoes. Jagged holes blossomed in the cab, but it rumbled on without swerving or slowing. I'm getting more coming in. They're dispatching MPs to the east fence. A third garbage truck's through. Shit. Where the hell are those army copters? 
something occurred to Bolin. Abbas wouldn't risk having the bomb neutralized. Odds were it would be detonated manually when the truck it was in was close enough to the NSA, which meant they had only minutes before Fort Meade was turned into a radioactive wasteland. The executioner looked up. 500 yards distant, across the tops of stately maples, reared the twin buildings that served as headquarters for the National Security Agency. Keep on them! Grimaldi was already doing just that. A burst of speed carried them shy of the trees where he swung the chopper around. The young terrorist leaned over the steering wheel to peer up at them but didn't try to veer aside. The whole copter vibrated to the blasts of the M197 as a barrage of 20 millimeter rounds bored into the hood, into the windshield, into the driver. Leaving the road, the truck plowed across a field and partway up a grassy knoll. Hardly had the Cobra landed than Bolin had the canopy open and was racing to the knoll. A ruddy hand appeared, smeared red, but the driver couldn't pull himself out. Clambering up, Bolin slid along the frame until he could see down into the cab. The young man was slumped against the dash and was struggling for breath. A pair of holes in his chest, bubbling blood, hinted he wasn't long for this world. Bolin didn't know what the cobalt device looked like, but he was sure he would recognize a bomb when he saw one, and it wasn't in the cab. He went to hop down, then saw the terrorist prying at a pistol. Game's over, asshole. Just talk to base security. Let them know the location of this one. What about the other two trucks? Still converging on the NSA. The one to the west has been shot to hell, but it just won't stop. The one east of us is in heavy traffic, and the army is reluctant to cut loose for fear of adding to the death toll. Get us there. Chaos had been unleashed on Fort Meade. Columns of smoke curled from a dozen spots. When the Cobra vectored in, Bolin saw the smoke came from a long line of crushed and crumpled vehicles. Off toward the NSA, a fireball burst into bloom. A gas tank, Bolin suspected, as Grimaldi tilted the copter on its rotors and zoomed in. Another sanitation truck was weaving in and out of the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. With reckless abandon, the driver rammed into vehicle after vehicle. Some flipped over. Others were smashed aside like bumper cars. MPs were trying to stop it, but they were handicapped by fleeing drivers who abandoned their cars and ran. In a frantic bid to stop the destruction, a military policeman in a jeep whipped it into the truck's path, then braked. Jumping out, he adopted a two-handed stance and popped rounds at the cab. Gaining speed, the sanitation truck slammed into the jeep like a great orange rhino. The MP tried to leap to safety, but the jeep rolled over him. The Cobra was armed with four tube-launched wire-guided anti-tank missiles. They had a range of over 4,000 yards and a flight speed in excess of 600 miles an hour. Use the tow! You want me to fire into all that crowd? God damn it, Jack, if that's the truck with the cobalt bomb! Say when... and hope the hell you're right. A junction had appeared, crammed with vehicles. Too many for even the sanitation truck to batter aside without backing up a few times. Bolin figured the driver would go around instead. On one side were parked cars and a concrete abutment that would stop a panzer. On the other, though, between the jammed cars and several buildings was a long, narrow open space that would let the truck gain a little on its pursuers. Bolin pointed to it. Grimaldi winged wide for a better angle. Auto fire from two jeeps was pelting the truck, the bright glint of ricochets sparkling like fire emeralds. None of the shots came near the cab. One of the jeeps fell behind when it had to brake for a pedestrian who blundered in front of it. The other narrowed the gap, but then had to swerve to avoid a car trying to escape the jam. That left the garbage truck unimpeded. If the tow missed, in ten more blocks the truck would reach the NSA. The driver might take it into his head to trigger the nuke any time. Then came the moment of truth. The truck reached the intersection, and rather than smash on through, the driver did exactly as Bolin hoped and swerved to the left. Not a heartbeat later, one of the Cobra's launch tubes disgorged a missile. The driver's door was flung open and the terrorist bailed out. Landing on his shoulder, he flipped into a crouch. Not until then did Bolin realize it wasn't a he at all, but the same raven-haired woman he had seen on the tanker. She had an SMG in her right hand, a rolled-up blanket under her left arm. 
The sanitation truck, now an inferno on only two wheels, crashed into a building, taking out most of the front wall. Fire, smoke, and dust mushroomed outward. The woman darted into the smoke, but Boland saw her reappear as the cobra was descending. By the time he climbed down, she had ducked into a three-story building midway along the block. He sprinted over. The door opened onto a paneled corridor awash in fluorescent light. Fully aware that any moment he might be obliterated, Boland moved swiftly from room to room. The sounds of her escape drifted down. It told him exactly where she had gone. The roof exit had a bar, not a doorknob. Boland pushed as gently as possible to minimize the noise. Inching the door far enough open to slip out, he spied his quarry. She was on her knees by the roof cresting, her back to him, firing down into the street. Beside her was the bundled blanket. Boland took precise aim. Somehow she sensed him because she suddenly sprang to her left and whirled, whipping up a scorpion. Boland fired a millisecond before she did, his rounds ripping her from thigh to shoulder. She lost her grip on the SMG and fell onto her side. Hate-filled eyes fixed on Bolin as he walked to the blanket. He unraveled it and frowned when he discovered it contained nothing. I had you fooled. Someone will be along to get you to a hospital if you live long enough. You cannot stop us, demon. We are God's soldiers and none can stand before him. No. Listen to those copters. They're strafing your last truck right now. It'll never reach the NSA. The Aljabar has failed. You think you are so smart. But our leader is smarter than all of you combined. Soon enough you will find that out for yourself. As the flesh burns from your body and your bones are reduced to dust, remember, demon, that I, Jamila, said it would be so. One of the Apaches let fly with a rocket and a fireball mushroomed high into the sky. For a moment, Bolin took his eyes off the woman to watch it, and when he looked back again, she was on her feet, swaying unsteadily. Don't try it! Jamila steadied herself and squared her slender shoulders. You are a formidable foe, demon. Truly Satan is strong in you, but God is stronger in me. And to him, I commit my soul! She wheeled and with surprising speed and vigor, leaped to the rim. Balanced on the brink, she glanced at him and smiled one last time. Death to the great Satan! All glory to God and his children everywhere! The army cop just blew the snot out of the third truck. MPs are on the scene and they just radioed in. There's no sign of the cobalt bomb anywhere. Did she have it? No. Then where the hell is it? Take us over there. I'd like to see what's left of the last truck for myself. There wasn't much. The rocket had turned the container into twisted scrap and split the cab like a melon. Amazingly, although the driver died in the blast, his body was still intact and had been dragged from the burning wreckage. Bolin had Grimaldi to send for a closer look and recognized the Palestinian he had chased halfway across the Mediterranean. An officer was on the scene, a major directing soldiers in search of nearby trees and high weeds. Do you think they'll find it? I don't know. Climb to 500, Jack. Three trucks, three dead members of the Al Jabbar, but no bomb. It was possible the device had been destroyed by one of the missiles. It was also possible it hadn't been in the trucks to begin with. Bolin thought back to the shell game he played as a boy. Sometimes the pea hadn't been under any of them. Sometimes the person moving the shells palmed the pea to trick the players. We've been tricked. The bomb was never in the trucks. They were decoys. Avan Abbas had sacrificed Jamila and the other two in order to keep security occupied while he or someone else snuck the bomb in right under the military's nose. Head for the NSA. Whatever we're looking for, we'll know it when we see it. Traffic was bumper to bumper clear into the parking lots that surrounded the NSA. A lot of people had tired of sitting there and climbed out to stretch their legs or talk. Heavily armed security was posted at the entrances and exits. More were on the roofs with sniper rifles. Boland twisted to scan adjoining parking areas. A boss wouldn't be foolish enough to try to get any closer to the NSA than was absolutely necessary. But there were so many cars. Spotting him would be like finding a needle in a haystack if he was there at all. Take us as low as you can go and circle. Too bad we don't have a Geiger counter. That puppy is bound to give off enough radiation to register. Boland shifted toward the other side of the chopper, scouring row after row. 
They came upon another parking lot. Bolin scoured it from end to end and was about to tell his friend to try a lot to the north when he noticed a dumpster garbage bin in the building's shadow. Parked beside it were the SUV and the sedan. Land this thing now. As soon as I'm out, dust off and inform the base commander. Have him throw a cordon around the area, but warn him not to move in or it might provoke these fanatics. What am I supposed to do while you're playing cat and mouse? Twiddle my rudders? No matter what, don't let that SUV or the sedan leave. From his duffel bag, Bolin retrieved a pair of grenades, slapped a fresh magazine into the MP5, and climbed out of the chopper. He rushed to the corner and around to the rear. A cautious peek assured him the two vehicles were still there. He also spotted three men on the near side of the garbage bin, crouched around a gleaming metallic object about the size of a football. One of the men was the other terrorist from Themis. The other two had to be Aban and Sefu Abbas. The older of the pair was pressing buttons on the bomb's control panel, setting it. The fate of untold thousands was in the warrior's hands. He took a bead on Aban Abbas, then saw him go rigid. A jeep full of MPs was conducting a sweep of the parking lot. There hadn't been time for the base commander to issue orders for everyone to stay away, so it was mere coincidence they had happened by just as the trio were arming the device. The MPs cruised past the trash bin, oblivious to the fact it hid the ones they were after. Abanabas and the others stood and turned to watch the jeep depart. Bolin sped across a grassy strip and was almost on top of them before they heard him. All three whirled, the terrorist from Thenus unlimbering a subgun from under his jacket. A burst from the MP5 chopped him down. Don't move! He would just as soon shoot them, but they might be of use. Sefu jerked his hands in the air, but Aban merely glared. So, face to face with the elusive demon at last. Back up and keep your hands where I can see them. Aban and Sefu swapped glances and nodded. Both obeyed, but Aban did so reluctantly. You can't disarm it, not unless you know the code, and I'm the only one who does. A rectangular digital timer at the center of the pad read zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. Bolin had stopped them in time. No need to disarm a bomb that hasn't been armed yet. It's over, Abbas. Is it? Two things happened at once. The downed terrorist sat up, sluggishly bringing the HK-53 into play, while Sefu sprang. Bolin took out the most immediate threat first. The dead terrorist was done for good. The executioner swiveled to offer the same to Sefu Abbas, but the younger brother was faster than he appeared. A double-edged knife struck the MP5, swatting the barrel aside, and Sefu clamped one hand on Bolin's throat and hiked the knife for a fatal thrust. Wrenching loose, Bolin slammed the SMG into Sefu's face, knocking him back. He leveled the MP5, but saw Aban Abbas dive toward the cobalt bomb, an arm outstretched, one finger stabbing toward a red button. Spinning, Bolin kicked Abbas in the head a microsecond before the button could be pushed. Then Sefu was on him. Grabbing the MP5, he slashed at Bolin's throat. The soldier jumped back, sparing his jugular, but Sefu held onto the SMG and stabbed low at his groin. Sidestepping, Bolin let go of the MP5 and slammed a palm heel strike against Sefu's nose that reduced it to grisly pulp. Aban was up and lunging at the bomb. Whirling, Bolin got hold of a wrist and a forearm and flipped him head over heels. He raised his foot to stomp on Aban's head, but Sefu closed in again, cutting and hacking, trying to force him back so Aban could reach the bomb. The soldier gripped the younger brother's wrist, snapped the arm as straight as a board, and drove his knee into the elbow. Before Bolin could capitalize, there was Aban trying for the bomb one more time, a crazed glint in his eyes. Bolin tackled him and they rolled to the ground. Aban rose first, swinging. A right cross clipped the executioner's chin. A left caught him across the cheek. Blocking another right, Bolin connected with a solid uppercut that flattened the mastermind. He raised his right hand for a killing stroke, only to have it seized by Sefu. God damn it! The soldier couldn't keep Abbas from the bomb indefinitely. He had to end it quickly. Arcing his left knee into Sefu's groin, he doubled him over, which freed him to leap at Aban, who fought back with a ferocity born of obsession. Both of Abbas's hands wrapped around Bolin's throat, but he didn't resist. The terrorist squeezed, seeking to strangle him, but still the soldier didn't try to break free. For in the meantime, 
He had drawn the Beretta and now jammed the muzzle against Daban's sternum. Sefu had the knife in his other hand now, and he hurled himself forward in berserk rage. Sefu catapulted against the trash bin, tried to right himself, and sprawled in a heap, dead. Sinking down next to the bomb, Boland checked the display. It still read zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. Catastrophe had been averted. He holstered the Beretta and leaned back, breathing deep. Grimaldi dashed around the corner holding a pistol. He stared at the bodies, then lowered the sidearm. So this is what you do when my back is turned? You sit around loafing? The executioner grinned. It felt good to be alive. <laughs>